Hi. Hi, good morning, Professor Harrison. Good morning, Sarah, nice to see you. You as well. Um, we're just getting everything set up here and we'll be starting in a few minutes. All right.
Welcome. My name is Henry Hale. I'm Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University, uh, including its Institute for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies at the Elliott School for International Affairs. I'm also director of the Petrock program on Ukraine, which has been based at GW for almost 30 years now, and co-director of the Ponars Eurasia project. Today marks the grim one-year anniversary of an event that will live on in infamy, Russia's all-out invasion of Ukraine. It is important to keep in mind, this was not the start of the war, as it seemed to many. Instead, the war started in 2014, when, after the uh, mass mobilization in Ukraine that threw out a dictatorship, um, Russia intervened in Ukrainian politics, seized its Crimean Peninsula, and fomented a insurgency in eastern Ukraine. What happened in 2022 was a major escalation and expansion initiated by Russia. One result has been the death of thousands of Ukrainians, the wounding and scarring of millions more, and the disruption of countless lives and the destabilization of Europe. And for all those who have died, and uh, for those who have lost loved ones, for those who have suffered through all kinds of other anguish, uh, we share their grief and we uh, think of them and have them in our hearts. Another result has been that Ukraine has demonstrated its resilience and strength, qualities rooted in the nature of Ukrainians themselves. We have seen this not only in the military's strong performance, but most importantly, we have seen it in the Ukrainian people's resolve, their ability to self-organize, and their commitment to their country and a better life for all within it. A better life, they're quite sure, uh, does not come from being ruled from Moscow. We have also seen Ukrainians' resilience in their will and ability, uh, indeed even their stubborn insistence to go on with their lives, not to let Russian forces tear them apart or disrupt their businesses, uh, despite shells exploding everywhere around them and the threat of death imminent. Art is created, music is performed, scholars, uh, including many who uh, I know personally, continue their research, um, continue contributing to internationally recognized scientific journals. All uh, while Ukrainians are also mobilized uh, wholeheartedly in defense of their country. So in marking the first anniversary of these events, we at IRIS, and um, in particular, it's a program on new approaches to research and security in Eurasia, uh, Ponaraj Eurasia, and its Petrok program on Ukraine, wanted to do something special something that focuses a little less on the war itself and the uh you know the military developments that kind of thing and more on ukraine and its resilience and and, and just uh amazing uh nature of its society and the result we landed on was ukraine 2023 as many of you know shortly after the war in march 2022 um, we decided to try and support ukraine and promote better understanding of it and what was going on uh, in, in the war uh, by holding a 24-hour uh, marathon of scholarship. We had nonstop um, presentations by scholars from Ukraine, from North America, from around the world, um, presenting uh, their own research that, that was relevant to understanding what's going on uh, at what was going on at the time. Um, so in some respects, the, the current ukraine -a is, a, is a continuation of that event. Um, but it has a slightly different focus this year, which is that uh, we are now trying more to spotlight Ukraine and Ukrainians in particular, as we uh, remember, uh, again, with, with sorrow and, and grieving uh, the events that have taken place over the past year, and, and indeed before that uh, as well. Um, and so, of course, we will uh, feature as well scholarship by Ukrainians and scholarship about Ukraine. Um, but we'll also be presenting panels to you today that focuses on Ukrainian art, uh, their music, their history, and their culture, um, Ukraine in all of its uh, beautiful uh, complexity. Uh, so while we grieve with Ukraine, uh, we also want to celebrate it here as well. And we look forward to sharing uh, this next 24 hours with you. And thank you for uh, joining us for it. Um, let me, uh, before passing along the, uh, the chairship, uh, to the, the first panel, uh, let me just note that this was very much a team effort. Um, it was led by uh, 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 Marlene Laruel, director of uh, our uh, institute, IRIS, um, but with the very active support uh, of, uh, of key people within uh, the institute, uh, the people that really make it tick, 
Um, so this is the IRIS team, as well as uh, Ukrainians themselves. Uh, IRIS has been very fortunate um, for many years to be hosting uh, visiting scholars from Ukraine through its Petrok program. And in particular, um, we have uh, uh, Petrok fellows who are currently in residence, and they've been uh, tremendously helpful in inspiring and uh, helping us organize and put together uh, the program that uh, is about to launch here. So uh, wanting to keep my remarks short, um, please let me pass on the uh, uh, chairship of the event to the sessions, uh, the first sessions chair, Professor Hope Harrison, who is a historian and political scientist who has authored two very important books, among other works, and uh, is an expert on the importance of history for contemporary politics. I think something that we all uh, see being super relevant right here, um, both true history and uh, efforts to falsify history to justify a lot of the crimes that are taking place. Um, so without further ado, let me turn things over to Hope. And uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Good morning. I hope you can open up my video um, so people can see me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, uh, on this really important uh, day. Um, yes. Uh, uh, it, it is my great pleasure to begin this important 24-hour event uh, with Eugene Fischel, who is absolutely and uh, one of the most widely respected experts on Ukraine in D.C., and has been for decades, in fact. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with him for a year when we were both at the National Security Council, um, his work has always inspired me uh, and his commitment to Ukraine. This winter, uh, Harvard U University Press published his book, The Moscow Factor, U.S. Policy Towards Sovereign Ukraine and the Kremlin. I commend that book to you all. Um, Eugene Fischel has had a 30-year career in public service where he's focused on the post-Soviet region. Uh, he has held positions, including Director for Russian, Ukrainian, and Eurasian Affairs at the National Security Council. He's been Special Advisor to the Vice President for National Security Affairs. He's been Assistant National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. Uh, and he is now an Adjunct Professor at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and a distinguished fellow at the Center for Security Policies of the Shah School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Jean, thank you so much for leading us off this morning. Thank you, Hope. It's wonderful to see you. I appreciate uh, the kind introduction. Uh, it's difficult to follow that and Henry's statement as well, which I thought was right right on, spot on in terms of uh, the balance between the acknowledging the tragedy, but also the hope and the inspiration provided by the people of Ukraine uh, to all of us. Thank you also for uh, including me in this uh, terrific event, very important uh, event. It's, a, it's an honor to be part of it. I'm cognizant of my role as, as the first uh, speaker, as a speaker on the first uh, panel, and I want to use it. Uh, I'll speak for a few minutes and then we'll entertain questions and comments, of course, and hopefully have a conversation. But I hope to use my role to set the stage for the speakers and the panels uh, that follow uh, after uh, after this one. And I'll do so by making some observations, if that's okay with uh, with everyone. Observations uh, over from uh, sort of made over the course of the past of the past year. So let me start with the following: what we're seeing. In the geographic center of Europe, and I underscore that uh, because uh, not everyone necessarily pictures Ukraine as being in the geographic center of Europe, but it is when we're speaking of the European uh, continent. Uh, it's a generational event that's taking place in the geographic center of Europe. It has global implications and global consequences, and I'll be happy to expand on that later. What we're seeing there uh, in practical terms is the largest armed clash uh, in Europe since World War II. Uh, much can be said about the state of play on the battlefields uh, today, and there are many battlefields and actually many fronts. It's a really long front uh, uh, that Russia is maintaining. 
in occupied Ukrainian uh, territories. So there, there are multiple fronts with multiple dynamics that are uh, particular to each individual area. Uh, I won't spend time on the uh, on the battlefield uh, update as much, although I'm happy to get into that during the Q&A, other than to say that uh, the Ukrainians are fighting bravely and well. Uh, there are significant losses, of course, on both sides. The Russian losses have been uh, much greater for a variety uh, of reasons. Uh, the Ukrainians seem to uh, be willing to sustain those losses because, frankly, they have no choice. They're fighting for their survival. Whereas uh, for Russia, no matter what President Putin says, it's a war, it's a war of choice. Uh, speaking of President Putin, uh, I'd like to highlight some miscalculations that he has clearly made, or at least from my perspective. Uh, we'll see what you think. Uh, it's, it's potentially a long list. I won't go over all of them, but let me highlight just a few. Uh, Putin clearly expected uh, uh, the Russian war machine to perform better than it has. Uh, again, there are multiple factors involved uh, in this, but it's, a, it's been a major miscalculation. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, con uh, what contributed to that is what has been reported up to President Putin in terms of the state of the Russian uh, military. Uh, one cannot talk about the Russian military just like one cannot talk about the energy sector or many other aspects as well without talking about corruption. Corruption uh, is a huge tax on almost anything that happens. Uh, in Russia, certainly under Putin, and it has had its negative effect on the Russian on the on the state of the Russian military as well. Another major Putin miscalculation is is the Ukrainian reaction to the large scale Russian invasion. Um, I'm not so sure that he necessarily expected Ukrainians to welcome uh, Russian troops with flowers. Maybe in some areas uh, more than others, uh, but the the reality is that it hasn't been about flowers at all or anything else. Uh, of the kind. The Ukrainians have fought back, have demonstrated they have the will to fight, the capacity to fight, they're, they're fighting for themselves and for their land, underscoring in the process that Ukrainians are indeed not Russians, uh, despite uh, the many times that Putin claims that they're, has made claims that they're one people. They're a distinct people with their own perception of themselves and a particular, particular role uh, in Europe and the world. Another miscalculation that Putin has made that's been quite serious is uh, the expectation that the West would fall apart, would fracture, would fragment. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, uh, unity is always perfect uh, within the, the, the Western alliance, the Western group of nations, uh, if you will, but it has, it has held together remarkably uh, in the year since the large scale invasion, not without challenges. It's a work in progress in many ways, but certainly uh, I'm, I'm proud to say uh, that the West with US leadership, by the way, lest we forget that aspect as well, uh, has held together and has helped Ukraine fight back against this unprovoked uh, Russian aggression. Overall, I would say uh, Moscow's key objectives in this war have not been reached. Have, most of them have not been reached at all, not even close. Uh, there's no doubt that Putin had expected a victory parade in Kiev within days, uh, if not days, maybe weeks. Uh, whatever information he gets from the front, he certainly knows that there's been no victory parade. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind uh, as well. Uh, in fact, no, has there not only been uh, no victory parade, there, he has tasted defeat on a number of fronts. Uh, in Kherson, uh, more recently in Kharkiv, previously the Kharkiv uh, uh, defeat was a, uh, especially quite telling in the way that the Russians retreated, leaving significant numbers of uh, material behind and losing uh, considerable numbers of personnel. Uh, in fact, speaking of Kherson and Kharkiv, at this point, Russia has been ejected from as many Ukrainian regions as it currently holds. Something to keep in mind as well on this, on this one year uh, anniversary. In fact, Crimea is the only Ukrainian region that the Russians occupy in full, uh, 366 days into this large scale, really all out war uh, by Russia against uh, Ukraine. Speaking of Crimea, Putin and his war really, uh, his decision to go uh, to shift gears into, uh, into this uh, large scale war, um, uh, by doing so Putin has put the peninsula, the Ukrainian peninsula back on the table, if you will. Of course, it was never off the table as far as Ukraine is concerned, the people of Ukraine, the international community, the US government, uh, other governments. But he has literally, literally removed whatever border, I'll put that in quotes because it wasn't a real border, on the isthmus between Ukrainian Crimea and Ukraine's Kherson Oblast by claiming territories further north uh, of the peninsula. At this point, there's really no difference 
given Russia's actions, there's no difference between occupied Crimea and occupied Kherson. And this is all Putin's, uh, Putin's doing. Uh, in general, I would argue that Russia today is less secure than it was a year ago. And again, it's not because of, any, of anything that anyone else has done. This has been based uh, on Putin's decision to launch this large scale uh, invasion. There's also a personal aspect here. Uh, the, these uh, kind of uh, struggles involve nations and armies, but they also come down to leadership and individuals. Uh, Putin at this point is arguably losing to someone who was denigrated as a comedian and even a clown uh, based on President Zelensky's uh, former career. Uh, speaking of President Zelensky, uh, uh, he has proven to be a top-notch wartime president exceeding anyone's expectations, most importantly, uh, those of the people uh, of Ukraine. In short, the war has not gone according to plan for Putin, no matter how many times uh, his spokesperson uh, states otherwise. Uh, mobilization, uh, so-called partial mobilization, uh, question mark over partial, uh, but mobilization, the use of convicts, the use of mercenaries in this war, I think underscore that things have not gone well uh, for the Russians. Uh, Moscow has had to adjust to a longer, much more costly war. Uh, the fact that we, we're marking this, this anniversary and Ukraine stands, Kiev stands, the people of Ukraine stand, uh, just underscores uh, how much Putin's effort has, has failed uh, so far. But this is obviously no time uh, to relax. Uh, Putin's overall objective remains the same. And no, it's not so-called denazification or, or demilitarization of Ukraine. These are all uh, uh, silly and ridiculous and dangerous uh, excuses. Putin's overall objective is the destruction of the Ukrainian state and of Ukrainian identity. We need to understand that that's, that's the full scope of what he's trying to do here with all of the consequences uh, that, that uh, by definition entails. He's not serious about negotiations. I underscore that because uh, there's much talk around town, this town and elsewhere. Um, about uh, bringing parties to the table or, or, or somehow uh, putting an end to this war, which is admirable as, as, a, as an objective, uh, but it also ignores the reality, including the fact that Putin is not interested in negotiating other than discussing the terms of Ukraine's surrender, which of course is uh, uh, even more removed from reality today than it was a year ago, something to keep in mind. Uh, if anything, Putin uh, has not re re uh, discovered or rediscovered his rear gear. Uh, he must have it somewhere, but he doesn't often use it. Apparently, he's, uh, he's doubling down on his efforts, uh, which will be quite costly for Russia uh, going forward. As you know, there's still fight, a lot of fighting along the front, especially in the east, uh, where the Russians are eking out small gains, but, but uh, uh, with huge losses. Uh, I should note, by the way, uh, especially... Uh, for those who are familiar with Ukraine's uh, human terrain, that Russia's war has been destroying some of the more traditionally Moscow-friendly areas of the country and killing people who, uh, under normal circumstances, would be more open to Russia's narratives uh, than today. Uh, there have also been multiple unintended consequences for Moscow, and I'll let's just list a few for the sake of starting this conversation. Uh, among these, uh, there's a more, much more unified Ukraine, uh, survey after survey shows that uh, not, not only how unified the Ukrainians are in terms of their willingness to fight uh, and not to make concessions to Russia, including territorial concessions, uh, but also the extent to which uh, these sentiments uh, hold across Ukraine's regions, across, across regions, across age categories, across uh, various aspects of background, education, and other aspects as well. There's also now a reinvigorated NATO that is expected to grow soon. Uh, this is a particularly important point, I think, because Putin uh, early on justified his invasion, large-scale invasion, in geopolitical terms. Today, he simply talks about territorial aggrandizement, which is, uh, which means he's a little closer to to the reality of what he's doing. But it started off with his discussion of geopolitics, various narratives about NATO expansion, and what it was designed uh, to achieve. <clears throat> in effect, <clears throat> excuse me. In effect, Putin has has given NATO new life, uh, including uh, the, the distinct possibility of, of Sweden and Finland joining soon. And I want to underscore Finland especially, for those who know the history of Finland, <clears throat> excuse me, since World War II. Two other uh, aspects I want to mention. 
uh, it's a it's a I think a rather clear loss of influence, uh, Russian influence not only in Ukraine but the broader post-Soviet uh, region. Frankly, uh, Putin's rhetoric alone, never mind other uh, aspects, um, is bound to scare leaders and elites in other neighboring countries, especially when Putin launches into his ahistorical uh, narratives about uh, uh, historical Russian lands. And there's also a, a growing dependence on China, China uh, that Russia seems to be okay, Russia under Putin, I should underscore, seems to be okay with at this point, but it's bound to have long-term implications for Russia moving uh, forward, just given the, uh, the long border, uh, the history of the two uh, different views on uh, perhaps Central Asia, Northern Sea Route, and other aspects uh, that are bound to create uh, uh, friction and uh, more friction in the future. <clears throat> uh, now, in terms of Putin's calculation at this point, he has his own logic, by the way, which is not our logic. Uh, I never get tired of underscoring that. Um, Putin is clearly hoping that the Ukraine and the West will blink first. And indeed, the West is a critical variable in all of this. We know that Ukrainians uh, have the will to fight. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, that's not likely to change. I would argue that's a constant, more or less. The critical variable is uh, what the West is willing to do, whether it's it, it will continue over time to support Ukraine in this justified struggle against unprovoked aggression. And I would say in my observation, and I'm beginning to wrap up here, uh, there's a growing realization in Western capitals of what's at stake in this war. Uh, let me just list a, a few items. Um, first of all, Ukraine by itself is important. It's the largest country entirely in Europe, largest country by definition between institutional Europe and aggressive Russia, uh, largest country between the Baltic and the Black Seas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that, that by itself is important. Uh, but also I would say Russia's war is a direct challenge to the uh, international rules-based order for obvious reasons. It's also a challenge to the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, the sort of the UN uh, order where Russia, by the way, is a member of the P5, which is uh, not insignificant. Uh, the outcome of this war, I have no doubt, will, co uh, will color whether others undertake territorial aggression elsewhere. Uh, governments, uh, uh, potential aggressors and potential victims are watching how this plays out. Ukraine's security is Europe's security, and Europe's security is part of, of transatlantic security, uh, one of our more vital interests uh, as Americans. Uh, Ukraine's victory would put a stop to Putin's uh, imperial project. I think that's very important as well, including for other countries in the region. Uh, the Putin re uh, regime's future potentially, I want to underscore potentially because it's, uh, it's a question mark, but potentially hangs in the balance. Putin is increasingly staking the credibility of his regime on this unjustified war. So there, there, there quite likely will be some effects. Uh, not not if, I would say, but when Russia loses. And there are also issues of broader regional transformation, the uh, emergence of the new Eastern Europe. When I talk about Eastern Europe, I talk about countries like Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine, not the countries to the West, which uh, we generally consider at this point, uh, Central Europe. So impact on Moldova, Ukraine's victory by definition, given the 800 kilometers or so of Ukrainian territory between Moldova and Russia, uh, very important. Moldova could be a success story. Uh, there's the aspect of Transnistria, the Eastern districts of the Republic of Moldova, uh, which I'm not sure could be sustained as a Russian outpost in the context of Russia's defeat. And I wanna say Russia's defeat in Ukraine. We're not talking about Russia's defeat overall. That's a, uh, that's a taller order. And that's not really what we're talking about. Belarus also uh, uh, could be transformed uh, as a result of Russia's defeat in Ukraine. The people of Belarus are clearly at odds with the dictator there, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, and they increasingly look to Europe, to Belarus's return to Europe as a sort of a model of their future. And then finally, I would say the USSR's collapse is arguably still ongoing in view of all of these things that, that uh, uh, I just mentioned. Technically, the USSR ceased to exist on, I believe, 25 December 1991. But a lot of these processes are still underway. And this is the, the framing, the context in which we should see all of this, including the, the former imperial center's effort to strike back. And finally, finally, I want to underscore the, the, the terminology matters. Uh, not telling others how to describe things, of course, but I want to underscore that war in the, the phrase war in Ukraine 
has a slightly different meaning than uh, war against Ukraine. Uh, war in Ukraine suggests it's, it's just a, it's a, Ukraine is a place where things are happening. Putin clearly is trying to destroy Ukraine and Ukrainians, and so it's really against Ukraine, just to underscore the sort of the three or maybe even four dimensions, if you want to include time uh, in that. Um, and as, as Henry uh, put it earlier, the war started in 2014 and arguably even sooner, but we're not gonna uh, go in, uh, too deeply into, into the unhealthy relationship between Russia and Ukraine uh, over time. It's, this war is part of a broader historical arc and part of a broader effort by the people of Ukraine to return uh, to Europe. Ukrainians are fighting for their country, their freedom, their families, their identity. They're also fighting for all of us, uh, I would argue. What they're doing is inspirational, and they're also reminding us that freedom indeed is not free. And I think I'll stop there and happy to take questions, comments, and have a conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jean. Uh, we have only three minutes before I have to hand this over to the next. Um, so a couple of people asked you about a likely Russian offensive in the spring and whether you expect uh, that might enlarge the war to Moldova yeah. and perhaps Belarus, but. Yeah, no, but just very quickly, and I apologize, I clearly took longer than, than I had hoped. Um, the, the Russian, of, the expanded Russian offensive is arguably already ongoing. It's having problems and therefore it doesn't look like it's taking place. Other than for those who are fighting, of course, the Russians, for them, it's pretty clear uh, that's, that, it's, that it's ongoing. But the Russians are having difficulty generating uh, enough of an offensive punch at this point, especially across such a broad front, uh, to make a significant uh, difference. They will keep trying. Uh, Putin seems to be happy to throw uh, uh, away thousands of Russian lives. Uh, but it's difficult to imagine a situation in which the character of the war changes drastically as part of that offensive. Not only that, but of course, Ukrainians have uh, ideas and plans of their own. Uh, arguably, the Ukrainians are better positioned than the Russians take advantage of maneuver warfare. And again, they're fighting for their land, so they don't need to. They don't need to wonder why they're fighting. It was on the Russian side. It's very much a question. Whether it expands to Moldova, uh, it has, there are multiple dimensions uh, there. There's no doubt that the Russians had hoped, when, as part of their plan to capture most of not all of Ukraine. There was no doubt that there was a connection to Transnistria, you know, Moldova's Transnistria region uh, as well. The Moldovan government has stepped on, uh, up under President Maya Sandu to support Ukraine more and more, and it's been noticed in, in the Kremlin, uh, no doubt. Uh, but it's a dangerous game for Russia because Transnist the, the forces in Transnistria are isolated. Uh, at this point, we will see. I think there's more a bluff and bluster than anything else, uh, uh, but this war has the potential to expand. Belarus is a particular case. I think Lukashenko, his, his room for maneuver has been limited, but he's doing his best not to involve Belarus directly. Belarus is already a party to the conflict because the Russians have been using it to launch attacks against, uh, uh, against Ukraine. Uh, but I don't see any imminent expansion of the war in, to involve Belarus. Last very quick question. Um, will the West hold together or will it blink and pull back from this solid support? A key question uh, in many ways, uh, based on the trend lines that I see and the ones that I mentioned uh, in the presentation, I think uh, the West is more united than ever before. Uh, there are challenges, uh, of course, but I expect with significant leadership from our country here, from the United States, but also other leaders, leaders in Europe, who increasingly, including Germany, uh, which has come, I don't need to tell you, uh, it's obviously one of your specialty areas, uh, hope, but uh, uh, have really stepped up in underscoring the importance of this the, 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 that goes well beyond Ukraine. So my expectation is that the unity will hold. All right. Thank you, Jean, so much for getting our ukraine -thon started off. Um, I am now happy to turn over the screen to Alexandra Koidel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Harrison. Welcome to the next panel, which is uh, the contribution of Ukrainian self-government to resilience in war-related crisis. So relating to what Henry Hale said in his welcome speech and uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Fischel said, there has been quite some uh, local mobilization in Ukraine for the victory. And um, it is 
not surprising because the war that Russia wages against Ukraine has actually is happening at the local level in the local municipalities. And uh, as you may know that there are blackouts due to Russia shelling energy infrastructure, destruction of schools, hospitals. There is also massive displacement and um, all of this happens at the local level. The panel today will talk about how Ukrainian local authorities cope with this crisis and what makes them resilient and what they need to stay strong. Uh, we will have an hour together and uh, there will be um, inputs first from the speakers and then we will move to the uh, questions and answers. So today we are talking about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to put the slides on right. So we are talking about resilience and what we mean by it is the uh, ability to adapt uh, when um, changing or making new practices or policies in response to a shock but also to resist uh, to continue sustainable functioning despite an external shock and um, much of the research about resilience is uh, focusing on the combine uh, on how to get to resilience is some sort of a combination of resources and governance. So today we will have speakers who will cover these topics and we will have a practitioner, mayor uh, of one of the Ukrainian cities who will tell uh, hands uh, on experience. And um, uh, my name, uh, uh, I am, uh, by the way, also one of the Ukrainian uh, scholars at the Petrach uh, program and I'm also uh, the, working at the Kiev School of Economics. And I would like to pass the word to our first speaker, Miroslava Savisko. Uh, she's a senior researcher and project manager at the Center for Sociological Research, Decentralization and Regional Development at Kiev School of Economics. And she will share the results on the, uh, resil on the resources and resilience from the latest study. Miroslava, I hope you can uh, turn on your camera now. Uh, I will try, but I'm also uh, a bit afraid uh, that the connection might be uh, a bit worse if I'm with my camera on. But please let me know if uh, uh, the audio is bad when, when the camera is on. Um, will do. Uh, once again, uh, the the focus of um, of the research uh, in our center was uh, to see what predictors are there to the resilience of the local self governments, uh, and uh, to um, to approach this this question, we at first uh, conducted uh, several interviews with local authorities to understand in general. Uh, how what shocks they uh, they faced and how they adapted to them because uh, in the literature what we we saw that uh, resilience is uh, is mainly covered uh, as uh, as a topic to national uh, disasters uh, natural disasters but not as the as to such shocks as war uh, and within these interviews uh, we found uh, um, interesting uh, actions that. Uh, local authorities uh, conducted in order to prepare to the war. And this is what we called in the later part of our research, the index of preparation. And on the slide, you can see some of the actions uh, that both the um, um, heads of local authorities that we interviewed and also the experts in the field of um, uh, resilience to the war shocks mentioned uh, in the order of their uh, prioritization. So uh, the expert mentioned that the form stocks uh, or the uh, checking uh, the sirens and the form stocks of fuel were the most crucial uh, at the first days and weeks um, of war. Uh, but also the, the other measures were uh, not least important. Uh, for example, you can see that there are a lot of um, meetings or plans that uh, both the experts and local authorities mentioned as uh, uh, important to quickly react to the uh, uh, shocks of war. And uh, what I find, uh, uh, what I found striking and um, here on the slide, uh, uh, I presented the um, the results of our survey conducted in October, November, 2022. Uh, and the sample is 10.3% uh, 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 of all Hamadas uh, that were not under occupation or military actions as of November, uh, 2022. 
Uh, and uh, what, uh, what is interesting here, that the first part uh, is showing what actions uh, Romadas conducted, uh, the local authorities conducted prior to the February 24th when the full scale invasion started. And the second part shows uh, what actions they conducted uh, as of October uh, 2022. And here, for example, if you look at the form stocks, so only 14% of surveyed Ramadas had uh, formed uh, water, food, uh, and medicine uh, prior to the 24th of October. And 73% uh, more uh, conducted this measure uh, after uh, the uh, February 24th. And here, I would also like to point out to some other interesting actions. So for example, we can see that local national resistance plan uh, approved, was approved only uh, by 6% of uh, uh, local authorities um, and uh, um, 42 more uh, have uh, them uh, been adopted uh, as of October. Uh, and these local national resistance plans uh, are those that uh, helped to formulate the voluntary uh, defense forces. And um, this shows that um, a lot of Ramadas still, uh, still is in the process of adapting to the shock. Um, and uh, the, the last point that I would also like to point here is, uh, for example, that um, the, the biggest uh, growth uh, yeah, since February to October is uh, uh, for the meetings with uh, uh, utility companies. Uh, it, it, uh, and then also uh, as of the uh, list published uh, online, uh, it grew by 68%. Uh, um, I, I think here I would like to go to the next slide to show another approach how we encourage uh, resilience. So uh, one of the approach was to have the survey uh, of local authorities representatives uh, and the other approach to have the data from all Ramadas uh, that uh, from all uh, local cell governments that we have in Ukraine, uh, we used uh, open data uh, and particularly their uh, own revenue data from uh, open budget. And we compared uh, the uh, year uh, on year um, changes uh, of own revenues uh, from um, March uh, to uh, August 2022 uh, compared to uh, March, August 2022. Uh, I'm sorry, 2021 to uh, uh, March, um, August 2022. And what you can see here, it's with adjustments to inflation and uh, with um, uh, with non include uh, with non involvement of military income tax, that even here uh, different local uh, self governments reacted differently to the uh, to the shocks of war. Some of them had a significant drop in uh, of the percent of the points, uh, uh, while some others even have uh, uh, some growth. Uh, but so here you can see that. that uh, the obvious reaction would be that uh, the decline is closer to the borders uh, with Belarus and Russia and to where the military actions are in place. Uh, but also even in the rear communities uh, in, the, in the center, there is also a decline in, in the own revenues of local governments. And this is uh, these two slides uh, um, were to present you how we operationalize resilience. And uh, I would ask to go to the next slide. And um, uh, they, this is how we then um, approach the question of predictors. So we used uh, uh, this index of preparedness um, as our um, dependent variable and tested it with the various number of predictors that we use uh, both from the literature and uh, the expert interviews. And we also uh, uh, had a, a separate analysis of resilience as resistance where we use the uh, revenue change year on year uh, and tested it also with the uh, similar uh, list of uh, predictors. And what you can see here that in this uh, linear regression analysis, we found uh, some positive correlation uh, in both cases with the type of mothers. So urban um, uh, self-governments uh, usually 
uh, yeah, uh, they, they had a higher index of preparedness or they uh, had a yeah, lower revenue year on year. Uh, then for the resilience as, a, as adaptation, we saw as an important uh, predictor uh, the share of own revenue. So the um, lower was trans the number of transfers uh, from the state government. Uh, the uh, more actions from the list that I showed on the first slide, Hromadas were able to uh, uh, to prepare uh, prior to the uh, both prior to the uh, full scale invasion and also as of October two thousand twenty two. Uh, and uh, um, also the, the second part uh, where we uh, looked at the resilience as a resistance, uh, uh, it's interesting to see that a lot of social capital predictors, uh, the number of OSB, uh, which are condominiums in Ukraine, uh, had a positive uh, correlation uh, with it, uh, also the presence of uh, SME support centers. And here I also want to point out that uh, we also tested the number of relocated businesses to uh, local self governments, uh, to local hermanas, and uh, there is bigger number of uh, um, um, relocated businesses uh, to the Hramadas um, where they had SME support centers. Also positive correlation with youth and youth centers, uh, as a positive correlation with electronic instruments uh, uh, of participation, uh, and uh, at least the interesting fact about geographical predictors. So um, the closer uh, um, local uh, ramadas uh, are to the uh, centers, to the economic sort of say um, um, centers of development, uh, the um, the closer they are, it's actually better for uh, for their. Uh, lower revenue change uh, but uh, yeah what also we see that uh, the region also affected uh, the um, the revenue change and this is quite obvious uh, due to the uh, military actions that are currently going on. Um, I probably will end here uh, with the the last word that uh, all of these are just the uh, yeah, sort of resources uh, that might be or uh, might not be um, implemented uh, if not the uh, the governance that is there in the in place. And here, I would like to pass the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Maroslava, for these really incredible findings. As you you have shown us that on the one hand, the Ukrainian municipalities are showing quite some resistance in terms of financial stability. On the other hand, they also have shown the ability to adapt in changing their practices. And what is interesting from your findings is that um, Romadas that were able to use the decentralization to become more financially autonomous, they were also better in uh, uh, attracting uh, local uh, relocated businesses, for example, and uh, in showing financial stability. Uh, and on and on this note, uh, what Romadas are doing, how do they govern their resources? I would like to pass to the next speaker. Uh, this is Oksana Hus. Uh, she's a researcher at Bologna University in Italy, and she will highlight findings of the study on the governance mechanisms that support resilience of Ukrainian municipalities. You are welcome, Oksana. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I will present several snapshots of a survey that Alexandra and I we conducted for the Council uh, of Europe, uh, specifically Congress of Local and Regional Authorities, in cooperation with the Association of Ukrainian Cities. And we were looking at the resilience of uh, local self-government institutions. Um, and also looking at the uh, anticipatory governance and collaborative governance as possible factors that influence uh, or bring about this uh, resilience of local self-governance. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to focus only on the collaboration with citizens 
um, the aspect that also strengthens uh, democratic resilience of local self-governance and the state as such, because with the reform of decentralization, citizens, they got uh, partners from the government who are much closer than the national government on the local level, and the local governments uh, in 2015, they got uh, in this, uh, in cause of decentralization reform, they got much more political influence, for example, on uh, education, uh, healthcare, uh, social services, uh, but also they got more financial resources to govern those. So uh, our findings were very surprising that uh, three quarter of uh, all uh, respondents that we had, and this were 16%, our sample was 16% of all um, communities in Ukraine, 75% said that they never halted their uh, operations within of two weeks of the invasion. So if you imagine this um, uh, bomb shellings and nevertheless they were working and providing uh, administrative services. And they also halted the meetings, uh, held meetings of the uh, councils, local councils, uh, offline. So that was the sign of very high uh, resilience. We expected that, but not in this extent. Uh, how did they do with that and which mechanisms did they use? So one of those mechanisms was collaborating with citizens. And here you see the question that we had for uh, what was the purpose with which local authorities in your community introduced initiatives of informing and engaging citizens and businesses. Um, and they used mainly for pragmatic reasons, for example, to coordinate supply and demand, attract external resources, coordinate volunteers. And here you see in the white boxes numbers with pluses, this is the comparison to the same question in 2021, one year uh, or half year before the uh, invasion. And as you see that um, on the pragmatic side, for example, attracting external resources got much more um, prioritized in comparison to the previous year. But also in terms of governance, we see some increase uh, of the prioritizing anti-corruption um, as uh, the reason for engagement of citizens. When we looked whom do authorities engage, um, the next slide, please. We see that uh, regular residents, they are the main uh, target audience. And again, in these boxes, you see the comparison of the results to the previous years. Uh, what was surprising that the entrepreneurs, they were engaged much more um, intensively. And we measured also uh, not only, uh, we measured like different mechanisms of engagement. So informing, consultation, but also dialogue and partnership, uh, which we mean the depth of the engagement. And we see that especially for entrepreneurs, um, there is a huge increase in engagement in terms of dialogue and partnership in comparison to the previous years. And also on the side of regular citizens that uh, authorities became not only open to inform citizens and businesses, but also to see them as a partner in the collaboration. We also see that IDPs have a fair share in the engagement, uh, and we see some decline in the engagement of experts, which goes in line with the literature uh, on democratization of knowledge. But I will not stop here uh, anymore, maybe just if you have questions on that. Um, so, what were the mechanisms of this engagement? Uh, we saw in our survey that uh, local authorities, they profited from the previous experiences and tools that they had from open government and uh, citizen collaboration practices. The main tool it was, of course, digitalization and established public information channels. So 81% uh, they mentioned that it was critical for them and super useful to manage the crisis to have those channels. And every fifth community even, they said that they created during the war uh, a digital tool to either inform or engage citizens. So you should imagine that under all the stress, if the priority is set um, for these tasks to develop the channels of communication, obviously they are very uh, important. Uh, implementation of open data was important for 52%. Uh, 
Uh, maybe what was interesting create, uh, that uh, some communities they had platforms for dialogue and practices of participatory budget. Only 50% of communities had those around roughly, but uh, every third community said who had those practices. Uh, so 30% said that they, these practices were critical. Um, again, why is it important? Because for example, practice of participatory budget where citizens, they uh, can decide over a certain share of the local budget what to do with it. So they vote whether they do uh, a playground or a festival. All these practices, they didn't take place under conditions of war, but nevertheless, uh, local authorities said that they were important. Why were they important? And this is what we learned from the interviews and uh, focus groups that were before the survey uh, to construct the survey. Uh, these practices, they were critical to establish networks and to learn to communicate with each other so that uh, local authorities and different groups of stakeholders that are not from government, they learn to define uh, common goals and to define how to get there, how to produce jointly public goods. So all these practices, they were critical and we need to keep that in mind when we're building Ukraine, not only uh, materially, but when also supporting institutions. Uh, I would like to end uh, this uh, input that, that was crucial uh, we see to have the, uh, the structural setting that decentralization brought about and to have this practice and experience that grew up in this decentralization setting uh, in between the uh, communities and authorities in uh, collaboration and also in a dialogue. So um, our point is uh, with that, that this is critical also to consider engagement of local authorities when thinking of rebuilding Ukraine, that they have the representation and institutional uh, place uh, in this uh, dialogue. And uh, over to Alexandra. Thank you. Th thank you, Oksana. A very important point about how local authorities communicate with their uh, hermadas or communities. And on this note, I really am honored to give a word uh, to Bogdan Kelichavi. He is the mayor of uh, Kupychinsi. It's an urban municipality located in the Chernobyl region of Ukraine. It's in the Western Ukraine, has about 13,000 residents. And um, Bogdan will share the, the local authorities and Hromada's practices of coping firsthand with, with the crisis of the war. I hope Bogdan can make his video on if it's possible or just feel free. Okay, we see you now. Okay, hello. Can you hear me? Well, welcome, Bogdan. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, so, um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Bogdan. I'm a mayor of Kupechinsi. Uh, as was said previously, the population of my municipality was uh, slightly more than 13,000 people before the full scale invasion by Russian Federation. Um, now uh, we have about 1,000 of internally displaced people that we are hosting here locally. Uh, and um, also, um, can we get my slides? Uh, maybe. Yeah, so um, first slide I would like to, th this was like uh, the photo I made uh, exactly one year ago. Uh, exactly the same time as we are speaking to you right now. This was the first. Uh, uh, bus of our uh, conscripted soldiers uh, that we sent to the front lines. Uh, uh, as for now, we have uh, from our municipality about 200 people that are serving uh, in Ukrainian armed forces. Unfortunately, uh, seven, seven of them passed away already and two officially are declared as missing. So this is the uh, price that our little municipality is paying for um, our world, world's freedom. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned uh, just uh, now, uh, we have about 1,000 of internally displaced people. Uh, we had um, much more of them before um, when uh, the war actions were more intense and we had to react. We had to establish different uh, collective centers, uh, organize, uh, food supply, uh, organize uh, just comfort uh, uh, conditions for them. And 
now at this moment we have about, about 1000 people and um, um, we are thinking a lot how to integrate internal, internally displaced people to our municipality and we're working a lot on, on of that on that because naturally a local population even though uh, internal displaced people are still ukrainians they have different uh, differences in uh, their language in their dialects in their culture just this tiny different di differences on the local level they are making um uh, local population uh, more uh, suspicious and cautious and we are trying to integrate them as much as possible so we started to communicate from day one uh we started making a lot of producing a lot of stories about uh, our internally displaced people who they are so they're not just shadows they are personalities with their skills with their um, um education with uh, some contributions to their community to to our community as well as volunteers and uh as of now uh, we have a lot of internally displaced people that are working here uh, we also hired uh, as a city hall, as our public institutions, we hired a lot of internally displaced people. So our head of the hospital now is from Volnovakha near Mariupol. Uh, our head of the educational department is from uh, Kherson region, from the occupied area. Um, head of accountants is from Kharkiv area. Um, we have a lot of volunteers, a lot of project managers. We also relocated a charity fund from Zaporizhia. They are also working here and they uh, open uh, an office here as well. Uh, we also have a, a relocated factory. Uh, this is the next slide uh, from Kharkiv region um, that is also hiring uh, uh, both internally displaced people and local people. So the relocated factory was uh, and relocation of businesses was a key factor for us um, in order to um, make uh, integration more successfully and uh, more successful um it's not enough just, just to cover first needs of people it's not enough only just to comfort them to provide them with the uh, psychological uh support it's also important when they are um feeling more productive to give them some uh, more work opportunities. So we're uh, doing that a lot as well. Uh, this uh, factory, this was the beginning of the relocation of the furniture production factory that uh, was uh, bombed in Kharkiv region just near the border with Russia and was occupied. Uh, so whatever they could rescue, they took it here. They bought uh, new buildings here, new premises and uh, as of now i just came back from them because they're setting up some new equipment they bought some laser equipment and they are very happy that they can uh, produce uh, more things so um, in our municipality from the humanitarian point of view we're trying to uh, see internally displaced people and uh, not as a crisis not as a challenge it's our resource and i'm trying to project this vision uh, to everybody else uh, and also to our international partners and donors um, that um, as many uh, Ukrainians from affected areas, we can host here locally still in Ukraine, within the Ukrainian jurisdiction where the skills and education is val are valid. Um, um, it's more like a, it's better contribution to our um, economic resistance, to our social resistance, to our resiliency generally, and it will make uh, maybe uh, a little bit less of crisis in other countries when people are going as foreigners and trying to um uh, to survive basically uh so that's uh, what we are doing uh, next slide please um also uh, we're trying to work a lot on uh, international stage uh, so uh, we are quite aware that actually from day one uh, that uh, Ukraine now in the center of media and a lot of everybody is paying attention on what's going on in Ukraine uh, it's really I'm really glad that uh, we have an even event like this today uh, that Ukraine is still in the agenda and uh, we're also trying to use this opportunity to make as many partnerships as possible with different municipalities um, to have um, part official partnership agreements, maybe not official partnership agreements, but different kind of cooperation. Uh, so this is the photo. Um, this week we became uh, partner cities with the city of uh, Bruges uh, in Belgium. And I'm very glad uh, to have a chance to uh, work with these people. Also this summer, we uh, 
became partners with the city of Hör in uh, Western Sweden. And also uh, we have a uh, not official uh, partnership, but we have really a lot of cooperation uh, with the city of Bozeman in Montana in the United States. Uh, we have a lot of projects with them. And for this, uh, especially, um, I would like to uh, pass this floor to my colleague and my friend for now, our volunteer, uh, Michael, who is currently residing in our town, Kupechins. Thank you oh, very yeah. much. Bo uh, maybe last you slide, to... I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah I just forgot to... about the last slide because we also survived the blackouts and uh, now everybody is so happy that we have uh, uh, street lights and this is like uh, like hope for us. Um, so I just wanted to show you <laughs> piece of the town. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing this this story of dedication, you know, commitment, flexibility, and and creativity. We really ha have a lot to learn from your municipality, Bogdan. Thank you so much. And um, now I'm really happy to um, to pass this word to uh, Michael Bem. He is from Bozeman, Montana, and uh, he's also um, uh, on the organic. So, sorry, I forgot the name of your organization. You will introduce yourself. And yeah. uh, we are really delighted that, especially for the American audience here, you will be able to share some experiences of being in Ukraine and uh, helping Ukraine. Yes. Um, so I am um, part of a organization that was formed um, at the outset of the war called Ukraine Relief Effort. We are a US-based nonprofit organization. Uh, we are now 501c3 uh, registered. Um, so we're official with the IRS. Um, and I think, you know, just to be quick, uh, we, we formed with a, a mutual disliking of the idea of just throwing money at problems, hoping that they'll go away. So uh, we decided to step up and start taking action. <clears throat> uh, initially, we started collecting medical supplies and then shipping them over to Poland. We developed a relationship here with Bogdan and uh, the city of Kupicinci, and we started shipping medical supplies here. Uh, we wanted to meet real-time needs, uh, meaning that we wanted to be doing things. We wanted to be taking action, but then also learning from our mistakes. Uh, so we want to develop trust with uh, municipalities so that they'll give us positive or negative feedback. Um, and I think negative feedback is actually the more important one, even though it hurts our feelings sometimes. So um, I have a master's degree in architecture, and I wanted to do something good with it in the world. So um, having this opportunity, I decided and move here um, and start doing some good things. I enjoy making things happen. Um, so coming here, uh, just didn't want to be talking about the world's problems, but actually coming and doing something. Um, <clears throat> and uh, involved with that is kind of learning the culture, learning uh, what are the economies here, learning what are the people like, uh, so that the solutions that we provide are kind of custom fit for them. And we really wanted to latch on to uh, Bogdan's idea of uh, transitioning IDPs from these collective centers into uh, more permanent living solutions. So we wanted to help uh, get people into houses, something that's more comfortable. And um, so I'll give an example here, just a quick one. Uh, we are working uh, on a, we just started this project. Um, it's a very small house in Kopitchensee. Um, it's a grandmother and a granddaughter. Um, currently, they have one room heated by a wood stove and a bedroom. They have an electric stove, so they can't cook during blackouts. They have no hot water and no shower. And there's a muddy, uneven path up to the street. She has to call a taxi to go to the grocery store uh, once a week. Um, and we just found out that the sewage drains out to an open pit behind the house. So there's a lot of solutions that we need to integrate here. Um, and I've seen examples of uh, nonprofits and things uh, wanting to give one type of a solution. But if I could implore uh, people that want to give and want to help is to think about their solutions um, as ecosystems. So please, next slide. We are looking at, um, sorry, back one more. Yep, so we're looking at let's say with um, this house, we wanna make sure that gas heating that we're, or that the heating that we're putting in there um, is gas. And there are different types of gas systems and not all of them will 
even though they're gas, they won't work during blackout. So we want to make sure that they still have uh, heat while there's blackouts. We want to make sure that they can cook while there are blackouts. Um, we will be installing hot water and a handicap accessible shower. Uh, we're going to pour a concrete path that goes up to the road. Um, and we now have to install septic at this house. So um, we are overseeing a complete solution as opposed to trying to do a whole bunch of one layer of solutions over an area. Uh, so now next slide. So yes, again, I, if I can implore one lesson that has been learned, it's to think in ecosystems. Um, when we were giving medical supplies, you know, we had made the mistake of giving a portable defibrillator that um, now can't be reused because it required special pads from the U.S. Lesson learned, we won't do that. So we bought an Italian brand recently that we're going to give to the town here that doesn't need that, uh, those replacement parts. Uh, we were giving disposable surgical gowns. That's not how they operate here. So lessons learned. Um, I've had to learn about building solutions. Uh, putting new windows in old buildings causes mold to grow on the inside. That's bad for air quality, that's bad for people's health. So good intentions can have bad results. Um, how can we um, manage wastewater now? And then how can those, these immediate solutions integrate with future solutions? These are things that we have to consider now uh, again, thinking in ecosystems. I started working with the School of Architecture at the Montana State University with two senior level design studios that are working, that have uh, about 20, 22 students working on developing the ideas of new construction here in Copitancy that take into account things like the, uh, the complexity in urban fabric of the town the country, both social and political and historical uh, context, plus the natural environment, and then material resourcing. We build dif buildings differently in the US, um, and that has implications in the type of buildings that we make buildings out of, but then also the labor and skills uh, of the people in the area. And then also any way that we can include global precedents, not just uh, precedents from design, con design and construction in the United States, but what are good ideas uh, across the globe? So again, if I can implore anything to anybody today, it's to think about the uh, wide reaching um, effects of your of the solutions that you wanna do and don't provide you know, single one-off objects, but really think about how those things um, integrate into people's lives, how they change people, people's lives and think about unintended consequences of uh, the gifts that you give. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. This is a very important call also in the framework of the general discussions about recovery in Ukraine, how it has to be really contextualized and coming from the needs uh, on the ground. Thank you very much for, for all your contribution. I would like to also note that today during the Ukraineaton, we raise funds for the Kiev School of Economics. It's a, we are running a humanitarian aid campaign with food supplies to buy food supplies, transportation, refugee help, and also uh, protective and first aid kits for the emergency responders, such as firefighters and paramedics. And uh, organizers will post in chat the links to this, uh, to our uh, humanitarian aid campaign of the Kiev School of Economics. But also feel free to approach uh, Michael if you want uh, to do something uh, from the U US, from the Ukraine relief effort. Now I would like to open the floor uh, to, the to the questions from our audience, first of all. And I know that there was one question um, about, about the, importance and the role of decentralization in increasing the um, resilience of local governments. And I would like to invite our speakers to op answer this question from their perspective. So what I would like to know what Bogdan, for example, what does it mean to you the, as a mayor, decentralization? What, does, what opportunities does it give you? And, from Oksa and for Oksana and Miroslava, I would like to invite you to think right about the uh, what does your research say and of course Michael please feel f uh, free to jump in and I will give a word to Bogdan first. Uh, thanks for this question uh, actually 
Uh, I was living in Canada and when I saw the decentralization reform happening in Ukraine, I came back because development of cities was in my interest. And this was uh, actually one of the one of the um, key points and one of the like turning points when I decided I want to uh, go back to Ukraine and uh, invest uh, my time, my energy in uh, um, Ukrainian development. Um, so decentralization um, is a tool. It's not necessarily a bonus. It's not necessarily like a jackpot for the municipalities. It just gives the municipalities um, the opportunity to develop, um, allocate more resources. We, for instance, get income tax here locally. 64% of the income tax stays in the municipality. And uh, at the same time, we are responsible as a municipality for so many things. We are responsible for schools, responsible for, for hospitals, which is not very usual for uh, US, for example, uh, that a small town uh, like ours would be responsible for such a, a healthcare facility. Uh, but this gives us a lot of flexibility. And if we do um, right actions, we get better results. And most of the municipalities in Ukraine are very happy that we have the decentralization. I'm, I'm a part of the... Um, association of uh, municipalities in Ukraine and visiting and talking to a lot of mayors and uh, uh, we have some uh, budgets that we can uh, somewhat plan our development now during the war times maybe you cannot call it development but still resilience uh, resiliency you can still procure a lot of things that is needed for your uh, country for our soldiers for our humanitarian um reactions uh, to the events. So uh, I think this is one of the most successful reforms uh, in Ukraine, and I'm really glad to be part of it. Thank you very much for this reflection. Um, Oksana? I partially answered the, the question in the q and in, in written, but uh, what I would like to highlight here, uh, in addition, of course, to what Bogdan said from the ground, uh, the, this is a very peculiar situation if you think about the context historically, uh, about Ukraine as a post-communist state. So in post-communist states, centralization is the norm. So um, why is it? Because uh, under Soviet rule, it was uh, the purpose to keep citizens as far as possible from the nomenclatura, from the governments, from the elites. and. Uh, to separate these two worlds so that there is a population, not even citizens, and here is the elite, and uh, we decide and think about you, and you please do not engage. So uh, in this context, we see that citizens are getting some partners to speak to directly and to go to directly if they have any issues. This is the first point. And that this partner is there you can see, you can hold this neighbor or a person you know in the municipality uh, much better accountable. And also this partner has the resources and there are channels that are emerging constitutionally also, such as uh, public consultations to use to work together. So without decentralization, it wouldn't be possible to bring this dialogue to the place and to uh, make it possible. And from the literature on resilience, we know that these are critical points uh, that citizens, they can be used as a resource, as a, um, uh, yeah, to, to, to source uh, um, capacities to resolve the crisis. And also that there is the collaboration between national level and the ground uh, that the information circle uh, circles much better, that the national level knows, for example, what is on the ground, and this is impossible if uh, there are no authorities and everything is man managed far from the capital. Thank you very much, Oksana. So as you can see, we have efficiency, but also resiliency, but also change of social contract is happening all in the context of decentralization. So this is a really major shift in, in the governance in Ukraine. I would like to pass also to Miroslava to talk from uh, her research perspective. Yeah, uh, I, I would uh, uh, fully agree with uh, with the colleagues. Uh, the the fiscal decentralization uh, obviously is uh, is one of the most successful uh, 
predictors. And that's what I think we, we see in our research with the share of own revenue influencing the, um, the resilience. Um, and uh, uh, also, uh, I, I would like to point out that also the, the survey of the general population shows that uh, the trust to local authorities uh, has been growing throughout the years. And it pos it, I, I think it's uh, quite positively shows that the reform is positive. Uh, and another thing is when the, the people were asked to um, uh, to review uh, the, the reforms in general, uh, decentralization reform is always pointed out as one of the most successful ones in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, uh, just another thing to, to point out from the qualitative uh, part of our research and the interviews, what a lot of the heads of Hermada's uh, mentioned during our interviews were that throughout these years, even if it wasn't were not a lot of years, they learned how to manage uh, their resources themselves and how first to uh, get the decisions and then be responsible for them. So I think this is crucial uh, in the times of shocks uh, and of war that you are ready to uh, to make decisions and then also hold responsibility for them. So, um, and uh, just uh, maybe a, a short uh, a description of our uh, other project with the Territorial Defense Forces, where we uh, learned about the um, uh, this relation between different actors uh, locally and how this helps uh, the local resilience and military civilian uh, collaboration is that uh, the abilities of local authorities to communicate and coordinate uh, all of the different actors that are in play that is there in place uh, has been crucial for uh, for all of the Hromadas uh, and the both their military civilian cooperation, but also with just uh, coping with all these shocks that uh, have been in place uh, since uh, last February. Very important points about the responsibility. And we see, you see, this is like a mechanism how Ukrainian society is also coping. How do you take responsibility also through these kind of mechanisms? Michael, I would like to pass a word to you. Yes, and I, I'm not a Ukrainian, so I, I don't want to speak on absolute authority on this, uh, but just from a, an architectural design um, education, the more brains that you can get onto a problem, the better. So decentralizing allows a lot more people to think about one problem um, and one problem that shows up in a bunch of different ways. So it allows, um, again, going back to this idea of resilience, um, it allows more people, more smart people, um, more people with different experiences to try and solve problems. Again, going back, there's um, uh, a lot of communication between municipalities and their local governments um, all throughout Ukraine that these ideas can be spread much more easily so they don't have to go directly up a chain and then back down to be communicated. They can be communicated more laterally uh, from small municipalities to other small municipalities. Um, and I, I again, I think that's a, a fantastic idea because it allows iteration of ideas to happen much quicker and feedback of uh, positive and negative outcomes to um, be disseminated to more people more quickly as well. Really impressive note. You don't have to be Ukrainian to notice this. <laughs> so my next question will be now more looking into the future. So there is now a lot of discussions about recovery and reconstruction, how it has to be done. Oksana already partially spoke about this. I would like to extend this discussion so that each of our speakers from their maybe point of view um, reflected what, sh what shall we, what is needed for a sustainable recovery of municipalities, um, not just in terms of governance, what we already kind of inferred that it seems like people want decentralization to continue, uh, but also what other things you would like to be there to, to make decentralization more sustainable, for example, to support your work, both done and now here, I mean, from the pr practical perspective, what do we know from research? And maybe you, um, our speakers, uh, I know Oksana can also reflect a bit on foreign donors, how they should be, uh, how should be thinking about uh, Ukrainian recovery in the context of decentralization reform. 
And um, I think I'll I'll give a word first to Bogdan if if that's a if you're ready. Yep. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'll try to make it from my perspective. I was I'm talking daily to mayors because I'm head of the Association of Municipalities in the Northern Region. So I like just before I joined the Zoom, I just said goodbye to some of uh, uh, the mayors that visited me, and I also was in some other municipality today. And everybody is uh, at least in the regions that are far from front lines and trying to keep development. Uh, they're looking for sister cities, for partnership cities, and. Uh, um, as Michael mentioned at the beginning, that uh, a lot of uh, organizations, a lot of NGOs, they're helping us a lot internationally, um, but a lot of them um, are not that much focused on uh, the intricacies of our day-to-day -day life and our challenges. And uh, for the future, I hope that um, there'll be more and more programs that will be supporting partnerships between towns. So it's not only country's government is helping another country's government and all the people are just watching news. But if we get this uh, decentralization of helping Ukraine, you know, like decentralize it to the city level, to the town level, to the municipal level, and then match up different uh, municipalities throughout the world with uh, different uh, towns and municipalities in Ukraine and uh, support that, that would be really great because a lot of cities, a lot of towns, um, they can get this human uh, touch and they can get, um, uh, if they know people personally that they're helping, they will be helping them for a longer period of time. And this would be another part of our resistance. And um, if we could stimulate that somehow through, I don't know, uh, financing trips to each other uh, or uh, solving some log logistics issues instead of procuring uh, some uh, help, right? Like some items, just financing logistics uh, and the towns mm -hmm. between themselves who find the necessary items and resources. I think that would uh, scale up our um, our activities and will make them much more sustainable. And if we want Ukraine to be integrated partner of the European Union, of the free world, of uh, uh, the free society, we can start doing that now, um, integrated uh, by integrated, not the whole country, but the country as well but do it through the bottom up approach. So maybe this is something for the future that we're looking for. Thank you very much. Uh, would like to go. Uh, shall I? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah, so I can just add that uh, what Bohdan said, we see also in our survey that there is a lot of capacity for uh, self-care and through uh, this horizontal networks within Ukraine. Uh, this, this also uh, contributes to resilience for Western partners, it means that scaling up uh, these practices, this is critical, uh, but also thinking and realizing that there is uh, this importance of local self-government authorities uh, using the conditionality to also reinforce and support decentralization reform because there are some critical issues for example decentralization is not entrenched in the constitution and uh, still communities they do not have legal form uh, which are critical uh, or major actually uh, legal issues that need to be resolved and uh, under any crisis this is in general that a very natural uh, way is towards centralization. So this is a natural dynamic independently of a society. So understanding the strong side of local level in Ukraine uh, in combination for pushing and supporting re uh, reform of decentralization and the role of local authorities that will be critical. And if I may, I would briefly address the question on the resources. Oh, that's good. Okay. I also wanted to ask it to Bogdan, but go go ahead. Uh, yes, so there is this 60% uh, of uh, private income tax that goes to the local authorities uh, after the fiscal reform, but also the possibility for local authorities to directly speak to the uh, central authorities and negotiate 
um, the subsidiarity, uh, which was not possible before because everything was going uh, through the mediators uh, on the regional level. Um, that all increased uh, the uh, capacities and resources, but also what's important that in the amalgamation reform, so new administration division, uh, the number of communities in Ukraine decreased by 10 times. So before this were 14,000, now these are uh, 1,436, uh, which also increased the efficiency because many schools and hospitals were merging. And as Bohdan said, this is a very, uh, responsibility and a difficult, uh, tough thing to manage, but the, these resources, they are on the local level and they were uh, uh, combined more efficiently. Since we're already on the resources question, I just want to, if Bogdan, you would like to add anything to the question, is there enough public funds or is there a bigger reliance on private investment? Um, I mean, uh, at this moment, uh, like before the full-scale invasion, we were more relying on the state's assistance, financial assistance you know, with different projects because um, having like a decentralization and local budget, it's still not enough to build new roads and uh, to build uh, new buildings and things like that. So we still rely on project management skills. Um, doesn't matter, it should it be like a, redirected from state or directly through the donor organization. Um, but uh, the situation gives us uh, new challenges and we are trying to react on them. And again, like thanks to decentralization, we can hire different people. We can uh, be more competitive in hiring better specialists. So 64% um, uh, of income tax is a good thing, but at the same time, uh, we have a discussion, how should it be distributed? Should it be distributed by the registration uh, of the entity or by the business activities that are happening? Also, we have some um, difficulties, at least on our regional level, uh, uh, when we have some, uh, let's say, railway station company, uh, and we have local people working there, or emergency room, emergency ambulances, we have people working there. But the income tax from these people are not coming to us. It goes to um, um, to the another city, to the central city, and there is still a lot of things that we have to fix and we have to discuss in terms of resources, in terms of um, our municipalities become more attractive, more motivated to get more resources. Uh, but generally, since we have only like a few minutes. I would say uh, that generally the direction of the decentralization uh, in terms of resources is selected uh, quite well in our country. Thank you very much, Bohdan. I would like to direct now two questions to Miroslav, or right? one about the future, if you would like to add something, and another about whether the urgency of adapting to war actually deepened the effect implementation or understanding of the decentralization reform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, with the question on, on the urgency, uh, I think uh, just on the personal level of a regular citizens, uh, citizen, I think it definitely has different because uh, as we talked before, the this network networks and linkages, uh, they really um, happened to uh, to make a change within the first months of war and and uh, and now of the full scale war, uh, and uh, um, with uh, the number of uh, volunteers that uh, I know that approached uh, local city councils in the first days of war, and also with the number of different neighborhood uh, communities uh, initiatives, I think that generally now people are more into the the process of you know um collaborating more and this in my opinion also uh has this effect on the uh on asking for more decentralization and more um capacities on the local decision making uh if to answer this question in terms of the of the national perspective, uh, I think it has a, a bit different view because uh, the um, as you know on the oblast level now we have the military uh, oblast administrations and uh, they give the um, uh, they are the main. Uh, 
representatives of the uh, of Hrvatas to the national level. And uh, this might be uh, an issue uh, in the future when um, posing the uh, interests and uh, um, needs of uh, uh, local communities to the national level. Uh, and just to to finish it on the on the positive note about the the future of uh, uh, Ukrainian communities, and uh, I want to say that uh, I uh, was communicating a lot with uh, Ramadas. I see their um, eyes sparking uh, with the opportunities that uh, there is uh, there are uh, ahead, and that they are devoted to the uh, rebuilding and uh, to the recovery process. And what they need uh, in our conversation, what they mention is that they need uh, more skills, uh, management, crisis planning, etc., uh, and also uh, the um, uh, another thing is the. Uh, the support uh, from the international community that uh, I hope will continue to be so. Thank you, thank you very, much, very much, Maroslava. I could not summarize this better. I would like to thank you, Bogdan, Maroslava, Oksana, Michael, for taking this time. Special thanks to Maroslava and Bogdan and Michael who came to us from Ukraine, uh, despite how knowing how busy you are with uh, responding to everyday crises uh, because of the war. But you show us example of true resilience and we, we will learn from you a lot. At this point, I would like to uh, pass the, the, next, the panel to Judith Twig from the Virginia Commonwealth University to talk about the health impacts of the war. Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, it's my pleasure to appear on this segment of the Ukrainathon, and uh, I'm a member of Ponar's Eurasia, as Alexandra mentioned. I'm on the faculty at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, and my role here today is to moderate a discussion with Pablo Kovtanyuk, um, who is on the call. Um, there he is. Hi, Pablo. It's good to see you. Um, Hi, and Julia. we'll be talking about the health consequences of the war and specifically about uh, Russia's direct assault on Ukraine's healthcare infrastructure. So Pablo is a former deputy minister of health of Ukraine. A couple of years ago, he founded the Ukrainian Healthcare Center, which has been uh, really ground zero for much of what we know and understand about the health impacts of the war and especially about Russia's deliberate attacks on healthcare facilities. So, Pavel, I'll just start um, by asking you to talk about your process of founding the Ukrainian Healthcare Center, about its activities, and how the war has changed the priorities of your work. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hi, Judy. Uh, Ukrainian Healthcare Center was created as a health policy organization, analytical center slash think tank whatever you like. Um, the team was the descendants from the large scale health reform in Ukraine, uh, which happened in 2016 to 2019. I was a part of it and most of the team was a part of it. So we decided to promote and, and to push uh, the, the changes in healthcare system uh, by different means now as a, a intellectual um, professionals. Uh, but uh, yeah, the war changed our, our plans quite significantly. And uh, as uh, the invasion started in 2022, one year ago, um, we uh, shifted to uh, war-related things to do. And one, one of which was that, that we began to document attacks on hospitals and healthcare professionals. First, it was more kind of intuitive uh thing we did uh but later it grew into large large work uh, which now in a year was uh, ended uh, in a uh, with a uh, large report uh, uh within a coalition of of uh, ukrainian and international organizations which had a quite a quite an impact in the in in the world so let's follow up on that and talk about that report that just came out yesterday, obviously timed with the first anniversary of Russia's escalated war on Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit about the international partners with whom you worked on that report and what some of the report's major findings and conclusions were? 
Yeah. Uh, over the course of our work on documentation of war crimes against healthcare, we got to know other organizations who did same thing in, in, in other wars. Um, one of them is Physicians for Human Rights, the, uh, the organization with the history. It started its work in 1980s um, with a mission to protect healthcare in war. So they witnessed a lot of conflict, starting from war in Chechnya, uh, where Russia also took place, then going all the way to Syria, the recent conflict, and, and, and now Ukraine. So they are very experienced in how to do it right. Um, uh, and also they have a quite strong legal background and network of, of, of people all around the world. Uh, later, we were joined also by the uh, uh, similar organization in Security Insight from Switzerland. They also have a quite a well-known brand in the in the field of, of healthcare and conflict. Then, uh, Eyewitness to Atrocities, a new organization which developed a, a special app. Uh, this is an app on the phone which allows witnesses to document what they see if they see a war crime so they, they can make pictures in a way that the data will be stored internationally on a special server protected so uh, so that it can be used in the litigation as evidence and and, and this is extremely important in documenting war crimes because if you don't, don't document document it in the right way you know all your materials are just they mean nothing to legal people and uh, the actually the main help and main role from our international partners was actually this how to do it right so that it's not only talking about what happened but also documented it properly so later it will be the um, thoroughly um, organized and documented evidence in the litigation. So can I push a little bit on that? Because it's one of the things that's most extraordinary about this report is the extent to which, um, as you say, it's done right. There, there's a meticulous process of documentation and verification that makes this evidence adequate for future prosecution in a variety of venues. Can you talk in a little more granular detail about that documentation and verification process? Uh, yes, uh, it involves uh, a lot of sources and the variety of sources is critical. So we not only use open source data, uh, we use the direct evidence by witnesses. Uh, we also use uh, the um, our own uh, material, which we gather by ourselves by visiting most of the places we should document. So we visited almost all sites we could reach physically, uh, taking into account security concerns and gathered firsthand evidence. Also in places where we couldn't get it, we, we used uh, open source data, but also satellite images, right? And witness um, testimony. And then by combining um, all these four uh, types of, 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 of evidence, we could do the most important thing, which is to verify, right? So we, uh, the verification is, is, is critical. And uh, we verified quite a lot, of, a lot of cases, which we all um, uh, piled together in the report, featuring some of them. Most importantly, and the, uh, this is the, the core thing we want to convey by our report, is that it's not only the pile of cases. Uh, those are patterns, patterns of crimes, meaning that those were deliberate, pre-planned, pre-thought policies, uh, 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 atrocious criminal policies. And that's our main idea we want to, to, to share with the readers of the report. And it, it's extraordinary. We've heard United States President Biden, Vice President Harris, recently refer to Russians' actions in the war as crimes against humanity, which is yes. a very specific choice of language, very yes. a, a very deliberate decision on the part of the United States yes. administration to, to use that language. Could you help us understand why that language is important and more broadly, what steps you see uh, the Ukrainian judicial system, the United States, the international community taking toward getting us ready 
to prosecute these war crimes in judicial settings. Yeah, and, and saying that this is a crime against humanity is, is also a very strong wording. Because to accuse someone in crimes against humanity is a big deal, right? So if you remember people who were accused and, and, and uh, prosecuted uh, and convicted for crimes against humanity, you remember names like uh, Saddam Hussein or Slobodan Milosevic, right? So those are big things. And in order to make this accusation by the uh, top level officials like the president of the United States means that you need uh, to have uh, strong grounds for that. And I can tell you that there are grounds for that. And we found also it in healthcare. Um, there are two notions uh, here. One is a war crime and the other is crime against humanity. A war crime is a violation of international law in conducting war. Like attacking a hospital is a war crime during war because the Geneva Conventions prohibits to do it, right? But what makes uh, um, the crime, the crime against humanity is this policy of doing that is that that it, you did it not by occasion or it, it was not coincidence or collateral thing right or you had one uh, whatever commander who was uh, you know uh, kind of the evil guy and he ordered to do that but crimes against humanity it, it, it is when you do it en masse right against the uh, large territories or uh, large groups of people and you pre-plan it on the highest level and this is exactly what we found in also in, in our investigation. We found that uh, in Ukraine, Russians did, first of all, what they did before in Syria, right? Which is not a coincidence. And second, that the, the scale of their crimes was so massive and, and, and the, their um, uh, behavior was uh, to such extent repetitive that it couldn't be coincidence. I will give you one example, which uh, may be familiar to, to our listeners. I think a lot of people remember that in March last year, March uh, 9, there was all of these uh, pictures of Mariupol uh, when the uh, air bomb f fell on the maternity hospital and all these pictures of a uh, pregnant woman, right, uh, moving um, on the, uh, by, by the rescuers, right? And, and, and that was a huge thing, definitely a war crime, right? But during the same week, the same kind of attacks, dropping a bomb from the airplane on the civilian area in the center of the city and, and hitting a hospital happened in Chernihiv on March 3 in the north of the country, completely different direction. The same thing happened in Izum in the east of the country. Also hospital um, was uh, involved. And then two attacks actually happened in Mariupol. So, three different directions, three different uh, armed uh, units, or I would say even three different armies, advancing from three different directions, committed the exactly similar uh, war crimes, which makes us think that it was not a coincidence, right? And, and the level of this policymaking was much higher than local commanders, right? So this makes crimes against humanity, and I can tell you that Joe Biden was right to say this strong words of, uh, of uh, condemnation. So what can Russia possibly be hoping to achieve by committing this level of crime in a systematic way? Yeah, I, I think that th this, uh, um, we see all, uh, we don't see also on only our sector, healthcare, right? If, if we look at the broader context, we see that the crimes against healthcare were embedded into the wider patterns of, of, of all sorts of crimes, violating all so, sorts of international laws, right? And that means that Russian just neglected the existence of the international laws regulating the conduct of war. And that means that the policy of Russia was to merge the civilian and military aspect of war which is the violation of the very, very core principle of the uh, international regulations of, of conducting war uh, adopted back in 19th century in Geneva, right? So they just neglected and they decided to change the rules. They decided to use civilian livelihoods, civilian objects, civilian people as a means of war, right? 
So making people suffer for them is a means to achieve military aims. By the way, they admitted it. In December, in his speech, Vladimir Putin uh, was addressing uh, the, he, he was referring to the this strikes at energy infrastructure. And he said, yes, we are doing that. Meaning that, yeah, we are using attacks against civilians as a means of warfare. So this is the very uh, substance uh, of, the, um, of their uh, atrocious behavior. And, and, and this is the core of their criminal, criminal behavior. And, and this should be prosecuted and then later go into, into, the, into courts. So thinking about how the global health community is handling Russia's behavior for Ukraine's health sector in the war, it, it seems to me that throughout the war, especially in its early stages, the World Health Organization was quite reluctant to use direct language and direct ang action in criticizing Russia for its behavior and holding it accountable. And to this day, Russia continues to sit on the World Health Organization's executive board. How can we interpret the WHO's stance in this area? Yeah, WHO uh, had a, a, a choice, right? Whether to take harsher stance and defend um, the area of their expertise, that is healthcare, um, and, and, to, and to stand strong against involving healthcare in warfare so overtly, so openly as Russia did, uh, or uh, uh, WHO could try to be neutral and uh, behave uh, similar to, for example, like Red Cross would behave in saying our mission is to be neutral and we don't take sides and, and, and so on and so forth. I honestly, uh, and WHO chose the second option. They decided to stay away from strong statements and from you know po pointing fingers and calling names, I think that was a big mistake of, uh, by WHO. It was probably not a mistake by Red Cross, but that was definitely a mistake by WHO because WHO is 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 a collective body, and it's a political body. So WHO consists of member states, and WHO speaks on behalf of member states. So saying nothing about what happened or closing their eyes on what is happening means that the member states of the WHO say to the perpetrator, to Russia in our case, they say that it's okay. We are ready to tolerate using healthcare system and destruction of healthcare system as a means to conduct war. WHO also neglected this back in 2015, 2016 in Syria. When Russia entered the war in Syria in 2015, the scale of destruction of hospitals immensely grew. It skyrocketed. WHO also said nothing about that. And by the way, Syria is also in the executive committee of WHO together with, with, with Russia. Of course, WHO says that uh, they are not investigative organization. They are not political organization. Which I strongly disagree. They are political organization. But the problem, and they say they don't have means and tools to act. I, except for, you know, calling for not attacking hospitals. I disagree because they can do symbolic action at least, right? For example, exclude Russian Minister of Health from the Executive Committee or suspend voting rights. This is all written in the WHO Constitution. And if they wanted to do that, they could do that, but they chose not to. So, for example, my organizations, we don't work much with WHO on our cause. We work very closely with the uh, commission, uh, with the UN Human Rights Council, which took a very strong stance on in April when uh, the events in Bucha happened. So the Human Rights uh, Council of the UN immediately expelled Russia and suspended its voting rights. So that was a strong move. We, we understand that this organization is, is a better partner for us. And so we partner much more with, with them than with WHO. Yet we have a WHO office in Kyiv that's been quite active in participating in uh, coordinating the international response to the health 
aspects of the, the war. Can you talk a little bit about that international response? There's been all the official agencies, WHO, the World Bank, UN agencies, uh, USAID, all the other bilateral partners, and then just a flood of um, NGO civil society support coming in. How well coordinated has that been? Um, how much of a difference has it made? Yes, World Heart Organization was very active at humanitarian relief, part of their job, and they really did a great job in that. I, uh, I honor that, I respect that, and I give the full credit. Uh, I can also say that the uh, amount and, and the scale of, of aid, of, of, of uh, assistance to Ukraine was immense. In, in the very beginning, of course, it was quite discoordinated. And not only for the reason of, you know, operational, organizational reasons, but also uh, for the reasons of the receiving side, right? So Ukraine also uh, couldn't come up with the agenda, right, of what we need in the very beginning. So very often uh, international partners or other countries uh, or volunteer organizations would provide what they had, which was not uh, always what we needed or not in the place we needed and so on and so forth, which is natural in the beginning. So now it's much uh, well coordinated. I think there are also a lot of lessons learned. Uh, a lot of international organizations in Ukraine acted but in a very similar way as they acted in the previous conflicts, like in Ethiopia, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Iraq, right? And that showed uh, uh, that it was not the proper way to do, to, to act. Uh, why? Because the Ukrainian situation di differed a lot in terms of government ability and capacity also to, uh, to react and, and, um, and, and to operate. Uh, unlike other wars that mainly were civil wars, right? In Ukraine, our government was together with people and it was fully operational. So later, the um, nature of aid changed a lot, and it was not direct uh, aid to people. It was more through the government, which was a very right thing to do. Uh, either central governments or local governments, they all were operational, and most of the at least larger organizations began to work through them. And, and things uh, got really much better coordinated at that time. And talking about the government, let's let's go back to the, uh, the earlier focus of your work, which was, of course, uh, as one of the main architects of the major um, health system and health financing reform in Ukraine back in 2015, 2016, 2017. Um, then, you know, we get to 2019, there's a change in government, then the pandemic hits, and then we have the war. Can you tell us about how those reforms prepared the Ukrainian healthcare system to deal with the pandemic and then with the war and where the course of that reform stands right now. It helped a lot. And the very best comparison is, is to compare healthcare system to Ukrainian military. The reforms in Ukrainian military uh, were the very of the very same nature as the uh, reforms in healthcare and also in the digitalization, the previous topic of, of, of this meeting. Uh, and the idea of the reform was kind of democratization, uh, decentralization, empowering of people uh, at the grassroots, empowering local communities, empowering hospital hospitals and their heads, individual doctors, uh, giving them a lot of authority, right? And when the war began and when the situation was messy, that authority helped a lot to take a lot of lo decisions locally not waiting for the contact from, from, from above or from some orders or from, from some instructions. Uh, uh, actually, yesterday I talked to the head of one of the hospitals in Vaznesiensk, which is in Mykolaiv Oblast. The town was half occupied by Russians. And as the Russians were advancing, they used this means to uh, you know, cut the uh, mobile connection. So the city was for two weeks without any connection. And the head of the hospitals couldn't reach anyone from health department at the municipal oblast or national level. So he should have been acting on himself, whether to evacuate or not evacuate, what to do, how to organize humanitarian aid, and so on and so forth. And he did it alone, and not you know, looking um, about his shoulder 
thinking of responsibility for his actions because he had authority and he got used to the authority as a result of the reform. So that was only one, one illustration uh, and very similar to what our military did, right? When it was a mess, the local military units could act on themselves and that helped to stop this large scale invasion because our commanders didn't wait for higher level commanders to, to say to them what to do. Unlike Russian commanders who were stay, sitting and waiting until Moscow will say them whether to advance or not advance. Meanwhile, Ukrainians were attacking them, right? So that 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 is an illustration of, of what happened. And a big part of the reforms uh, back in 2017, 2018 were institutional in terms of yes. changing how people access healthcare and how it was paid for. I'm thinking of the National Health Service of Ukraine, which is the major contracting agency now for uh, providers of health services are all of those institutional structures and processes still intact? People still getting health care the way, uh, you know, with the obvious exception of the, the occupied areas and the places where there's been infrastructure damage and, and loss of personnel, you know, given all of those crises, has that basic institutional structure continued to function? Yes, they do. They do. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that everything is perfect. And uh, uh, there is a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges we will face in the post-war period. The post-war period would be no less complicated and complex and difficult for our country than the war period, right? But what, uh, what Ukrainian healthcare, what is the big, big victory of Ukrainian healthcare is that this, it survived as a system and it remained to work as a system. So we have the healthcare system in all its entirety including the, the reformed part of it and the, and, and the reformed institutions. So that's a big thing. I know we have just a couple of minutes left and I want to go to the Q&A and the chat. There are a couple of questions that have come up. Um, one is from Mikhail Filipov who asks, if we think that the Russian side is a rational actor, actor which is a big assumption, anticipating that the strikes against civilians will unite the Ukrainians and provoke an international reaction, then why would Russians continue to commit war crimes? Basically, wh where is the rationality in the strategy? Because it doesn't seem like there is any. Uh, that's a very long uh, conversation. We, we don't have time for that. My conviction is that Russia is an irrational actor but in the completely different types of uh, rationing, right? They have their, their own worldview, their own values. Uh, luckily, those values uh, help them to lose the first uh, phase of war. They, they were very wrong um, in, in, in their rational thinking. But if you look, if, if you uh, go uh, and, and try to study their perver perverted worldview, their wicked a worldview, uh, you will see that within that worldview, they're perfectly rational, right? And uh, I think that uh, the using uh, uh, um, civilian targets as a means of warfare was a perfectly fine with the, with the rationale. And the second reason they did it, uh, uh, and again, they were rational in that, is that before they used this tactic and it worked, and there was no accountability. So they did it in Chechnya, then they did it in Syria, nothing happened, you know, it was quite, to the, their point of view, it was successful, why not use it again? And they used it again. Uh, you are muted, Judy. Yep, thanks, mm -hmm. Pablo. Um, one last question from Violeta uh, Kabibulina, um, whom I know well from, uh, previous collaborative uh, work, and she's observing that medical and health professionals in Russia, by and large, have not been active in trying to prevent or stop the military aggression. And she's asking whether in Ukraine, health professionals have, have been in contact with Russian health professionals and what level of engagement would be reasonable at this point with professional contacts in Russia. I think most of the Ukrainian professional cut their ties with, with, with Russian counterparts for the obvious reasons. And also we were advocating for international organizations to cut also their ties. Uh, why we did that? You know, I, I don't believe in, sorry, maybe I'm cynical, but I don't believe in this um, uh, idea that the Russian civil society will make this war end. 
I think Russia has no civil society. It has a very strong state, but almost absent civil society. If you study Russian history, you will understand why, um, including the recent history. But the civil society is something that Russia really lacks. So I don't think it will, it will definitely help. Um, the only thing we can do is to pressure, whether symbolically or practically, you know, and, and, and showing the firm stance, which the Russian society at all levels will understand. And once the cost for this society will overwhelm the benefits, you know, for, of the war, then they will act. But uh, honestly, I don't think that practically speaking, whatever doctors will unite and do something, no, we'll, we'll, they will not. Unfortunately, let, I think we should not lose our time you know, doing that. Thank you very much, Pablo. We've covered a lot of ground in, in just 30 minutes, and I really appreciate your willingness to share your expertise and your experiences uh, with us. So thank you. And I now, at 11 o'clock, turn the program over to Volodymyr Duvoyk uh, for a next conversation about the U.S. Move On Ukraine team. So thank you all very much. Yes, uh, hi. It's my very special pleasure to be able to join the Ukrainaton. That's already, of course, uh, not the first one, Ukrainaton, but Ponors uh, Eurasia and the Institute uh, 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 at the Elliott School is doing. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to be able to take part in activities. Uh, I think it's quite unprecedented. There are many institutions uh, around the US and other countries, of course, that now commemorate somehow with their events, uh, the first anniversary of the massive invasion by Russia. But it's only one which is capable of really doing this uh, major magic, magic feat, if you like, of doing a 24 hour event non-stop marathon on everything related to Ukraine. So that's quite uh, commendable, you know, it's quite impressive, frankly, and it's a great honor for me to be part of this and uh, in the role of moderator for the for the ne next uh, hour and 45 minutes, actually. So the next three sections, segments of our program will be moderated by me. Uh, by the way, I can see that most people here probably know me, uh, and, but maybe not you can, you're about <laughs> to speak. Uh, I'm Volodymyr Dubovic. I'm a, Associate Professor at the Department of International Relations in Odessa, Ukraine. Uh, but currently I'm actually in the United States. Uh, I'm a visiting professor and scholar at risk at Tufts University, so in Greater Boston. So that's a little bit about myself, uh, but uh, we've heard about your organization so much, uh, Ken, and we're looking forward to hearing more about what you do, why you do it, and uh, what's uh, what are your impressions and what are your conclusions after doing this for some time now? So floor is yours, please. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that very much. Um, let's see how we can put up the presentation. All right, it's on. Okay, can everybody see? Yeah, I can. I hope everyone can. All right. So um, thanks very much for the opportunity to present. This is uh, a, a real honor uh, to meet with people both in Ukraine uh, and around the world who have such an interest in, in what is going on and how do we help the people of Ukraine. So um, when the war broke out, uh, you'll see a picture on this front page of John Schmorn and his wife Tusha, along um, with the mayor of uh, one of the communities that we've built a new project in. Um, our effort is really aimed at providing homes and um, a positive living experience for the IDPs who have lost their homes. And we know that over a million and a half homes have been destroyed. There are six, seven, or eight million IDPs who have decided to remain in Ukraine. It is their home. And, and uh, I don't think we fully understand in the United States and 
around the world what it's like for somebody to take away your home. And I think that really drives the passion uh, and the resilience that we've talked about already this morning. So um, these are the three founders. Um, what's interesting about these three, John, Tusha, and Andy Kuzich uh, on the right, is that they all had the opportunity to leave Ukraine when the war broke out um, and be it a safer, healthy, warm home place, they've decided to stay because they believe it's their country. And they are, have lived in Ukraine for over 20 years each. Um, they are, are well known in the country. They have connections and the mission is really to actively refurbish and repurpose disused buildings um, in a way that provides a home, not just a shelter. And recognizing that a, an additional portion of that mission is around uh, rebuilding communities. So yes, the home is important, but the environment that they live in is important and giving dignity to people who have lost everything. I, I have to tell you one of the most enduring videos that I have seen from our team is a gentleman who lost his home to the bombs uh, and missiles and was taking shelter in his chicken coop because that's the only way he could stay dry. And so that, that image in my mind and in many's minds is really what drives us every day. Um, we do this through the local municipalities. So I was very interested this morning to hear uh, of the gentleman talking about how they worked at the local level all of our projects involve working with the local community. And what enables us to do what we do is we're very well connected. We have people on the ground. We're just not a group from the US. It's really uh, a charity that started in Ukraine. Uh, John Schmorn is a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy. Um, when I heard what he was doing and I had just recently retired, I couldn't help but personally get involved and tell John I would help do development and marketing to drive things forward. Here's a list of the things we do. We're gonna go through this presentation very quickly. Everybody will have access to a copy of it. And, uh, and my email is at the end of the presentation. So if we don't get to all the questions, I wanna be very respectful of uh, the time. Um, this is a list of the projects that we did in 2022. And again, Put this into context, we started the charity last May. So we've been ongoing for less than nine full months. Uh, the picture that you saw earlier uh, with the mayor was from Mostasha. Um, but you see uh, three, five, uh, eight different projects that are identified, all of which have been completed except two, which will be done next month. Uh, and we're very efficient. Nobody on the in the charity, including the three founders, are taking any money. We're all completely 100% volunteers. And I have to tell you that John, Tusha, and Andy are three of the hardest working people that I've ever met in my life. Um, they go nonstop. They've uh, lived in three different temporary homes in Ukraine as the war has progressed uh, and some became unsafe. We have calls every two weeks and sometimes they're in the dark only on a Zoom call as long as the battery on their cell phone will last. So they're uh, hands on the ground really doing things in a powerful way. This is a picture of the progress of the Mostasher School. Um, the grand opening. And this particular project was funded by um, a, a donor from Switzerland. Um, Tusha's family uh, foundation has been very instrumental in in supporting us from uh, Switzerland. Here's some more projects that we've got going in STRI. This is housing that's being redone for 160 IDPs. Um, this is in Kalush, and we've been very active with the municipal leadership in Kalush to take on this project and several others. But you can see we're, we're trying to build out not just a place that's a shelter, but knowing that the war may have longer legs than we hope for, that they can have a place that they can help not only have a roof over their head, but start to rebuild their lives. The other thing I would note is that uh, all of the contractors and volunteers that we work with are local. 
So we recognize that having outside the country entities provide a lot of goods, either manufactured or just materials is great, but it does nothing for the economy of Ukraine. So we are trying to embrace all of the local businesses in order that we can take the money that we raise, whether it's in Europe or in the US or elsewhere, um, to continue to not only rebuild homes, but we can rebuild businesses as well and create a sense of community. Uh, this is in Stri, uh, as we're rebuilding uh, what used to be a children's hospital uh, to again provide um, housing for 75 IDPs. This is just an example of the quality of the work. So we've got a local furniture provider, uh, again, a local business that is building furniture um, again, so that their business starts to thrive again. And we provide a, a really a place people can take pride in and, and with real dignity. This is a new project that was initiated about six months ago. We've got some people on the US team that have been done, have been doing humanitarian disaster relief for years. And we came up with a concept of this modular home that can be built in the space of a couple of weeks and handle two to three to four people uh, per nest unit. And we're using um, manufacturers to, to prefab components so that that can be done very quickly. Uh, and you see one of the two initial pilot uh, units being built. And why this is so important is we've got people who have lot, you can see the destructed home in the upper left picture, um, but they have the land. So we can put this, this unit up on their land. They can stay in their home uh, city or community. And again, building community uh, is really important to our, our uh, message. Uh, we've worked to provide uh, partnerships um, and, and non-building projects. So local manufacturing, I mentioned the furniture manufacturer. We've developed uh, with the help of one of our volunteers, a Kids Connect Ukraine, where we're connecting children from the schools in Ukraine to their counterparts in US schools to build some rapport and understanding cross-culturally so that we can um, build that digital bridge. We delivered hospital beds, um, food boxes, uh, opportunities for dental treatment, and literally down to uh, pizza day events. John Schmorn didn't realize he was such a pizza chef until the first day that there needed to be food to provide for one of the grand openings. As you can see, we're the focus of our efforts in terms of uh, building um, the map of Ukraine, where we're spending a lot of time in Stri and Kalush, um, along with some of the other communities there. One of the questions we get in the US most often is, if the Russians are continuing to attack, how do we know that what we rebuild doesn't get destroyed the next week? Well, there are no guarantees, certainly, but we are working to build them in places that have tended to be uh, more safe. This is what we have for 2023 projects. So one of my tasks along with John is to raise the, the $4 million in funds just to take care of these projects. We're frankly only restricted by how much money we can raise because we, because of our networks in country, um, we have uh, the ability to build wherever we've got the funds. We're also working with a lot of international organizations so that there are many of these that are co-funded projects. And um, we've worked with the UN we had Tusha and one of our other volunteers go to a, an event at the, um, uh, in Rome at the Vatican, uh, talking about um, what it's like to deal with uh, thriving um, cultures in a world of a war and very on the ground and, and got that message out in a big way. These are some of the pictures of the, the starting point so for some of these projects, uh, we've got a list of needs that is greater than the list of locations and, and the funding that we have yet. But as soon as we get uh, funding, we're working and signing agreements with the local municipalities to get a commitment for these properties 
for the longer term. It's just not a year and then suddenly it wants to be repurposed. This is the Kids Connect where we've had uh, Zoom meetings between uh, the two groups. And I think eyes have been opened not only from the children in Ukraine, but the children in the US of what each other are dealing with. One of the questions that one of the Ukrainian students asked was, what do the US students know about the war? And oh, by the way, what's in it for you? Why are you helping? And so this conversation about us being a, a global entity where we're all in partnership together and helping each other to live a, a more vibrant life, I think is valuable all the way down to the 10 and 12 and 14 year olds um, that we have a responsibility to from our world. These are some of the organizations that we work with. Um, in the US, Applied Hope uh, is the umbrella organization our 501c3 is chartered under. Um, uh, you, you can recognize some of the names here uh, and all of them have taken a part uh, in either individual projects or overall strategy. So um, we love the opportunity to present about what we're doing. Obviously uh, the donations and the money we're trying to raise for this will make a huge difference. You can see my email at the bottom of this slide. What I'd like to do next is um, pop up a video by one of our founders, Tusha, that was just filmed um, last week. And okay, looks like we've got it right here. Doesn't sound like we have sound. No. Hi. Um, oh, we do. It's the 17th of February. I'm in the city of Kadush. We rented a safe house uh, on the outskirts of Kadush. We must go to for ourselves and our staff. There's a fireplace. So here I'm at the right across the road is the cemetery. Road to road to road. So now that as long as this fallen soldiers we're here this uh, gives me strength and uh determination more than ever to help the families of these uh, heroes of the war that Russia has declared on Ukraine so thank you for supporting us um moveukraine.org so the the audio was a little difficult on that um we can try to share that with everybody they can watch that video um when they have the opportunity um i think what i've seen is um and what i've experienced personally as i've gotten involved is this is the most important thing i've done in 67 years and I've had a great career, I retired, I served my country in the military, et cetera. But making a difference in the people's lives of Ukraine is the most uh, important mission that we have right now. And it's as it's been said earlier, it's a mission not only for the people of Ukraine, but for Europe and the world to stand up um, against the, the crimes. And, uh, we're going to try to help. Our mission is to try to help the people of Ukraine uh, rebuild lives, rebuild communities one home at a time. And uh, so we welcome your support. Um, I've tried to do this quickly so that we have time for questions, if any come up. Um, and so I'll just open the, the floor to anybody to ask questions or Vladimir, maybe you have a question. Yeah, yeah I do. I do. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't see anything in a few questions uh, uh, in our box, but uh, let's see. Yeah, this is chat, so it's not questions. Of course, I actually have several, and maybe others who are listening right now would join us later. But uh, first, first of all, how do you spread the information about what you do in Ukraine? What are the main uh, 
channels and the methods that you make people know about what you're doing and uh, disseminate information about it? Yeah, so um, there's local on the ground efforts and then there's a pretty significant um, uh, social media uh, activity going on. So we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, uh, YouTube videos. So really trying to get people to understand uh, the depth and breadth of what we're doing. Uh, we're also working very diligently with a lot of those organizations you saw on the one slide, specifically the United Nations um, organization on, um, I, I'll call it disaster relief, but it's much more the hum humanitarian crisis that we're dealing with. So one of the nice things about John, Tusha and Andy living in Ukraine for 20 plus years is they have a very strong and wide network. So the ability to make connections with the mayors of places like Mostasha or Stri or Kalush and having lived there, they see firsthand what's going on. Um, their kids were raised uh, part of the time in Ukraine. Uh, they're, they're older now, obviously. Um, but I think that's the big issue is where we're trying to do networks um, from a social standpoint. And being just nine months old, it's just now starting to um, kind of build a, a groundswell of people understanding. And, and we send a note to one person, they send it to their network. It's just the law of big numbers and, and how that, that happens. But I could give you lots of stories of one, vol or one volunteer had a friend and a friend got interested and they sent it to their network, et cetera. It's slow in building, right. uh, but people, when they see the practicality of the work, and the passion of the people, it's very strong. Are you, are you seeing any dynamics at all within this last year? Because some people begin to worry, uh, I'm now in the US and also people in Ukraine that maybe people will have enough over a year, they'll be having some fatigue. Uh, they would be ready to sustain, to, to provide sustained uh, support to Ukraine. Are you seeing any dynamics, any drop in number of donations that you're receiving? Well, we, we did see a little bit of a drop when the earthquake yeah. happened in Turkey. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, one thing about the U.S. Um, public yeah. is we have very short memories. And so, you know, whatever the latest news takes our attention, it's, it's the plus and minus of social media. It's the plus of uh, minus of the media in general. All right. I think that this is such an enduring uh, mission and as we're able to really focus on the humanitarian side of things, right. the, the war and, you know, who's giving tanks and where the bombs have dropped yeah. and what yeah. Putin is doing, that gets a lot of the headlines. So we're really trying to focus on the humanitarian piece, yes. show how people um, lives are being turned around. There were 150 orphans uh, in the southern part of the country that needed a home. And people started to get excited about that. Our, our nest concept, we believe that local churches and local communities can sponsor a single nest at a very reasonable number. We think we can completely outfit one of those units for, you know, seven or eight or nine thousand dollars. And suddenly somebody has a home that didn't and they can feel a personal connection to that family. We're working very hard to build that personal connection. So are you thinking in terms of providing uh, these children and other people who need housing in Ukraine uh, with temporary arrangement, or maybe some of those things that you provide them with might become ultimately their permanent uh, housing? Yeah, so part of the uh, arrangement with the local communities when we start the building project is to get a commitment for five years so that it's not they're in for a year and then they have to find something new. And it's, and it's why, I mean, a little practical thing about people asked us why we wanted to have curtains in our homes. And then when you realize that that's just a, a sense of privacy and what you would have in your home, even though it seems in some way like a frill on one hand, on the other hand, you're building something that's more permanent. Absolutely. And uh, it, it does feel like a home instead of a temporary shelter. Right, right, great. Well, I'm still looking at maybe other questions out there. Um, I wonder, maybe the last question, if I may, uh, Ken, for you. Uh, 
when you receive the donation, do you see where it's coming from? Can you comment on like geography of where in the US? And yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I, um, yeah. I write, um, not handwritten, but I write a personal email for every donation okay. that comes in. Okay. Right. And one of the questions I ask every donor is, first of all, how did they find out about Move Ukraine? Yeah. Um, and what I'm finding is people that were personal connections or I heard about it on Instagram or my cousin got involved and he shared with me. It's pretty widespread across the US okay. with, with uh, John and Tusha's connection to Switzerland. Wow. Uh, a lot of people from Switzerland have been very, very generous with us. Um, actually, the, the gentleman that, that funded that first effort um, was a Swiss uh, businessman. Um, so, and when they see, we've had several visit, when they see people come uh, and see what is being done on the ground and realize we're there for the long haul, then it encourages them to give more. Right, right. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, we still have five minutes uh, till next presentation, but we, I think we're exhausted. Yeah, uh, I think we, we got so, the questions. Again, yeah. www.moveukraine.org. Thank you. Keep on doing the good work. Really appreciate it. I mean, for us Ukrainians, it's really meaning mean, means a lot. Means a lot. Like we're not alone. We're not abandoned. We're not forgotten. You know, we're we are in hearts and minds of some good people around the world, including this country, the United States. So it means a lot. Thank you, Ken. We we love what we're doing and we're passionate about it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, should we make a little recess between the two sessions? So should we go straight to the next speaker? What do you think? Uh, I can see that Katerina is here. She's ready to, to go, but maybe one of our administrators who's listening to us would let us know, should we start Katerina's presentation right away or should we rather keep going, please? Okay, good, fine. Then the next presentation is but Katerina Yakovlenko, who is uh, of course a well-known Ukrainian uh, scholar and uh, uh, also a journalist, I must say. She's a, a chief, uh, uh, you know, editor-in-chief of Suspilne Kultura and has many other interesting positions in her background and in the past. And, and uh, currently, this is absolutely fascinating, absolutely fascinating uh, topic of her presentation. That is how Ukrainian contemporary art has been affected by the war. We're all seeing a lot of it. But of course, I'm seeing it and then I'm turning the page and I'm moving on with what I do professionally. But Katrina is actually collecting these examples of this a contemporary art of Ukraine and how it is affected by the war. And it's a fascinating topic. Uh, we're only going to have half an hour, but I think you can actually, you can probably, you know, dedicate the entire day to talking about this subject because even in one year of this terrible, massive war, there's been so much done already. Yes. So, Katrina, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, Vladimir, and may I share the screen uh, if yeah. it's possible? Yeah. Super. Um, every time when I'm starting to talk about Ukrainian art, I also want to thank uh, Ukrainian armed forces, uh, medic combats, and also all volunteers who are involved in this um war and who are, who are now fighting for the ukrainian independence for ukrainian independence and who also uh trying to do the best in uh, the front line and also in different cities so i'm really thankful to them and among all of these people are also people who are artists illustrators um cultural managers, uh, critics, and many, many more. So it's not only people who had this professional education in um, different military uh, professions, but also people who uh, choose to fight and who uh, make this choice, um, especially on the 24th of February a year ago, um, so I would start to talk about the Ukrainian art um, and the war and influences uh, uh, of the war, how it's shaped, uh, how the aesthetics changed was a huge topic, uh, which is very important. It's a topic of materiality and also education. And this is the portrait of a student of uh, art school in Mariupol. His name is Igor Zakharov. 
he was a second year uh, student in local uh, art school in university, uh, and he spent almost almost a month in um, a dormitory on 11th floor uh, watching all the um, um, air, uh, aircraft, the explosions, and uh, all Russians' attacks in Mariupol uh, from his uh, window and from his balcony. Uh, he spent, uh, as I said, almost a month, and since the twenty fourth February, he have no opportunity to produce any kind of work, and especially he didn't think even about art at that time. And this is also the huge questions: what kind of art should be produced during the war? Uh, are we also uh, expect to see something very static, uh, like documentary photography or artistic photography or any kind of installation, uh, paintings or graphic series. So uh, I assume that many of us uh, impressed by this uh, huge uh, movement of Ukrainian artists who also try to be involved in the process of defense and who wants to resist the Russian oppression. But still, we also have to ask um, what kind of conditions uh, do other artists have? Do they have this opportunity to continue the education? Do they have the opportunity to produce their works? And many, many other questions that's um, completely influenced by the war situation, and especially if it's uh, occupied cities, if it's cities uh, which are very close to the gray zones onto the front line. So this is a very huge um, topic that I want to face and I want to speak about. And speaking about Igor Zakharov, I also have to add that he is a son of Sergei Zakharov, who is a political prisoner. Uh, Sergei Zakharov uh, was just uh, an ordinary citizen in Donetsk before 2014. He was working um, for some uh, design studios and producing design works. So he didn't uh, um, he didn't have an, any uh, artistic background, like being present in uh, galleries or museums. And I would say that he spent uh, just an ordinary, an ordinary life. But of course, he makes made some um, uh, art production for himself and never been especially as a political um, a writer and a very political uh, artist. But since uh, 2014 and uh, Donetsk was occupied by um, uh, pro-Russian and Russian uh, activists, politicians and militants, he decides that this is a time to be uh, Donetsk Vansi and started doing uh, street art in the city, uh, especially at night um, when he felt himself safe in this case. So he started uh, doing uh, cartoons um, and put them in uh, public spaces in the city with uh, public militant figures who uh, supported um, the Donetsk People's Republic and who uh, was a part of a uh, Russian movement at that time in Donetsk. So one day he was um, captured by the local uh, so-called police and also he was captured to the prison. And this is also interesting that this prison before was a center for contemporary art. It's called Izalatse. It has a huge history of uh, um, working with local communities, especially with uh, local communities uh, who are ar architects and artists itself. They had uh, before um, amazing uh, educational program and also exhibitional program um, by involving international artists and, and local artists they created um, a new image for Donetsk itself but also for the place that was before a factory for isolational uh, for producing isolational materials but since uh, Donetsk was occupied and this this space is a was captured by DPR activists. 
uh, this place become a prison. And um, perhaps, you know, uh, Stanislav Vasiev, who wrote a book about this place, it's called On Isolation. Uh, he uh, explain in uh, very detail uh, how it's uh, to be a political prisoner in this uh, space. And also he explained uh, um, the situation in the city itself, how the violence become an everyday life uh, part. Uh, so uh, Serhiy Zakharov was also uh, presented in, uh, was uh, captured in this um, uh, camp. And then uh, it happened that he was uh, liberated. And after uh, liberation, he immediately moved to Kyiv and created a, a graphic story, a graphic novel about his um, life in this um, concentration camp. And I guess that we can all uh, use this word uh, uh, to this uh, prison. So this prison is uh, created for political prisoners, uh, first and foremost, and especially for um, intellectuals, for uh, journalists, for people who are involved in the um, different kind of intellectual work. And Sergei Zakharov, as I said, and also Stanislav Isaev was there as well. But what is also interesting that all this revision of um, uh, art and society was also um, very public uh, and uh, just uh, in a very few days when the DPR people come to the Zedat says they started this revision of what is a contemporary art and uh, what actually art have to be in this space and that everything is uh, just sort of propaganda or just low quality art. So they start uh, recording video um, when they trying to describe what uh, is exactly uh, is situated in this space. Like for example, reading books and making revision of arts because a lot of um, arts was still present in this territory and the contemporary art center uh, just haven't any possibilities to took them to Kyiv when they escaped. Uh, so you see on uh, your left the image of uh, huge lipsticks. Uh, lipstick. This is uh, an artwork by Martin Pascal Tayou. He is an international uh, star uh, and he created uh, this artwork uh, dedicated to the woman who was involved who were involved in the second uh, the second world war and especially those women who were reconstructing uh, industry in the Donetsk and Luhansk uh, oblast because at that time the whole industry was just broken and uh, women um did an amazing job to reconstruct these uh, facilities and this industry. So he decided that uh, because there is a, a huge lack in uh, um, um, among the literature, like research books and uh, like in general knowledge about those women, he decided to make this monument uh, to them. But one day, uh, DPR um, activists and the uh, Russian activists uh, just blew it up and record video with this destruction. And you can still find it in the website of Izolatsa and also on the YouTube channel of Izolatsa uh, Foundation. So you, you can find this uh, evidences of crime. Uh, and what is also interesting that for them, all the history, this is not just a uh, context, this is also uh, the fight for uh, ideology, and they like really believe that this uh, monument to women could change the situation, and I honestly believe too, but in my case, I just see uh, in this uh, monument to the woman of Donbass, uh, also my face, for example, and face of my uh, parents and face of my grandparents, uh, who were involved in this reconstruction because uh, every uh, person um, was um, participating in a huge uh, process of uh, rebuilding the region and rebuilding the um, industry itself. 
Uh, I would also um, add that it's not the only one work that was destroyed. As I said, I collected all the materials about the destruction and also uh, artworks that have been stolen since that time. And still, uh, for example, um, after they escape to Kiev, they decide that they still need to um, work with the region. And uh, some of the projects was realized in Mariupol, uh, for example, and some project was realized in Sol Solidar. And for example, last two years, they had an office in Solidar and this office was completely destroyed uh, just recently. Uh, some propagandistic channels were posting the images from this office, and uh, we can uh, recognize that a um, couple of works were saved, but still they have no opportunities to um, come to the Solidar and to save other works. So lots of um, artworks have been stolen, have been uh, destroyed. And uh, not only artworks, but also libraries that they had in the Netsk and also libraries that they had in uh, Solidaris. Uh, among all of these works, not only international artists, but also local artists, like you see uh, Jana Kadyrova and Hamdi Zinkovsky, but uh, also uh, they had um, they had uh, a project made by workers of this factory in Donetsk, and this is a metal deer that uh, situated on top of the so-called uh, Jerikon, which is um, the mount self-created mount mountain from the um, uh, isolation materials. So they also have no uh, facilities and opportunities to take it uh, and to save it. Uh, what is also interesting in this uh, case is that um, you cannot find a lot of information about Ezelatse in Russian Wikipedia, for example, because um, um, because this is information shows the real um, uh, war crimes in Donetsk, and especially because this is a concentration camp. Uh, so uh, lots of Russian activists or pro-Russian activists uh, or people who have supported this regime, they uh, claiming to delete all information uh, about this uh, camp and this prisons from Wikipedia. So we cannot uh, find um, any cases there. And also uh, it's quite difficult to find something in Russian internet. Uh, so I uh, need to highlight this, that it's really uh, important to um, reflect in which language and in which sources you're trying to find information and what kind of uh, um, sentence you put in this search uh, space. So this is like also can explain uh, what kind of information you got uh, for this search. Uh, but again, speaking about this loss um, and the void, uh, I need to add that since February 24, we finally decide to collect all of these cases and uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine uh, decide to create a website where they uh, collected destroyed objects, museums, religions, objects, ancient objects, and also um cases like stolen art and many many more so you can find it in internet in english uh, and also ukrainian language uh, so now uh, this uh, become more uh, visible for international audience of course this is, was our huge mistake not to make it since february um, 2014 uh, but uh, finally, we did it, and I'm very thankful to people who are doing this calculation because all of this will help us uh, after the victory, I hope, uh, to bring back all of these art objects and uh, to bring back our heritage. Um, and again, speaking about materiality of art, I want to show you a couple of examples of uh, artworks, and this is uh, Syria of uh, Katya Buchatska, who is a Kyiv artist, and she uh, a multidisciplinary artist, mostly working with uh, images. 
uh, and moving images like uh, photography, video, film, also installation. But uh, since twenty, uh, uh, since February uh, twenty four, she felt like she um, speechless, less. She cannot uh, find her own. Uh, voice and also she cannot understand how to speak about this uh, crime and this uh, um, violence and after a long conversation with herself and uh, she decided that um, she could start and she had a couple of uh, projects before like for example one project is about the language that she find um, objects it was a, a tape uh, machine and she started taping on the beach and each time when the new wave of ocean come uh, the sentences and words was destroyed so this is how she started playing with this but this exact series of uh, paintings uh, are very important for me and for ukrainian art history because uh, you can see three uh, different abstract paintings, one black, one brown, and one yellow. And uh, all of these paintings are made um, from the self-made oil paint, uh, which she created from the soil, from uh, Hostomil, Moshun, and uh, um, uh, Ukrainian small cities from Kyiv region that was completely destroyed and um, violated by the Russian army uh, in spring this year, uh, last year. And uh, what is important in here is not only that she created this uh, oil paint by herself from this uh, dramatic soil, but also uh, the way how she starts thinking about this. Uh, for example, she at the time was um, in Lviv and uh, um, just one day she came to the uh, artistic shop uh, for the materials and she recognized that uh, there is no materials of, uh, made in Ukraine uh, because two of the factory was damaged uh, by the Russian army at that time and the third one also didn't produce because of war materials. So she haven't any opportunities to by the Ukrainian production, um, uh, the Ukrainian products. Uh, and then uh, she also understood that she cannot use the Russian product that still was uh, in the shops at the time. Uh, so after a long process of thinking, she found out that she can do this uh, oil paint by herself just uh, from the soil. And of course, uh, it's, it shouldn't be just a soil. Um, every land in Ukraine is very traumatic, but uh, being in motion and being in Hostomel, she recognized that this is, this is exactly that land that she could use for this artwork. And that fact that you cannot see any um, topics in this uh, oil paints, it's just uh, abstract, uh, black, brown, and yellow, but still you feel this uh, texture, uh, texture, and also you can feel this um, vibe of soil, of, uh, of trauma, and you can um, speak about it, and you can also think how uh, the trauma uh, present in uh, not only contemporary art, but also how trauma present in our life that you cannot simply recognize it as something very figurative, but also it has some abstract uh, meanings. It has, it could be explained but by abstract words and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, the very important to say that um, for Ukrainian history, this is a huge uh, question, how we can uh, speak about our art history right now and how we can um, receive uh, the objects, the paintings, and also biographies of people. And for example, here you can see two images. Uh, one on your left, it's um, uh, drawings by Mark Chagall, uh, who uh, did illustration for uh, Kievan painter in the beginning of 20th century. 
uh, and this book uh, were dedicated to Jewish pogroms uh, in Kyiv. So his illustration also has this um, emotional moment of uh, loss. Uh, and I would say that for Mark Chagall, who was a part of this uh, Kievan avant-garde uh, movement, for him was uh, important to reflect this Jewish history and also to um, highlight these uh, problems in art. Um, I would also add that he was a part of a um, uh, community of Jewish artists, and this community uh, uh, was uh, working as official organizations. They supported theaters, they supported uh, Jewish uh, painters and also literatures, and also they produced books. And this book was produced uh, in the support of this uh, local Kyiv uh, Jewish organization um, and these drawings especially. Uh, so this is the context of uh, this uh, work on your left. And the second one, it's um, a Yuri Bolsa, um, uh, painting uh, and he reflects current situation and the war in uh, full-scale invasion in um, 2022 and being himself as a, a displaced person and here I also uh, how to uh, highlight that I'm not using a refugee I'm using the word of uh, displaced person because uh, it's it be different uh, terms uh, so he is a displaced person. He um, reflects this loss of home. And now he's still um, abroad and he work a lot um, um, in like talking about the um, problem of displacement, also ideology and also some historical issue like uh, Holodomor, for example. Uh, and all of these uh, historical topics uh, become fresh and sensitive, and many artists feel like they have to uh, speak about the past uh, again, and also how to uh, try to find answers about the future uh, by looking to the past. And it's also very interesting that before uh, 2022, we had a couple of discussion about what kind of um, archive art uh, do we have? What kind of documentary art do we have? And we had this movement of documentary art and uh, archival art and art that somehow reflects the historical topics. And this has happened um, especially uh, after the Yevromaidan, but also years before. Uh, but now this is completely different because uh, by speaking about the past, people trying to explain and trying to imagine their own future after the war. And this futuristic vision, this is something new and something fresh in uh, Ukrainian uh, contemporary art right now. Uh, and also uh, one more example, this is my insight in the beginning of full-scale invasion, how we try uh, to explain the previous art. And this is example of Ilya and Emilia Kabakova, the man who flew into the space from the apartment made in 1982. And this is an, an iconic work um, marked as a Russian uh, cosmist. Uh, work, but now we have to like speaking by the art in uh, uh, art historical perspective. We have to also somehow discuss this all issues. What does it mean, Russian like avant-garde, Russian cosmism, all of these people who did these movements and why they did this? And Ilya Kabakov was born in uh, Dnipropetrovsk at that time. Now the city of Dnipro. And uh, this is, was the closed city that uh, were produced the uh, cosmic industry, like uh, some elements uh, for production or weapons or like many, many more. And the city was closed for foreigners especially. And he felt uh, himself in this city um, very bad and he had a huge uh, problem with his uh, like for example childhood because he like really hate this um, situation when he uh, was raised in such um, uh, germanistic um, uh, conditions and then he moved to Moscow and he become uh, 
uh, star and uh, he become reflect this uh, childhood in his work. So in this exact work, the man who flew in uh, from uh, into the space from his apartment, this is about his ability to uh, broke these walls and to escape from the uh, situation of totality. And uh, now I have to say that we have completely different situation. When we see the images from a destroyed apartment from Odessa, from Kiev, from Kharkiv, from Dnipro as well, we see that this opportunity to flee, uh, to flew into the space from their own apartment, this is exactly how the war uh, influenced the um, society and the art and the everyday life of any people. And that sometimes um, no one choose this um, way to escape. And sometimes the uh, um, invader choose for you uh, to make this uh, hole in your wall or uh, to make the hole in your roof uh, for yourself. And in my case, it happened as well. Uh, uh, for example, you can see exhibition that was made in uh, my uh, apartment that also was destroyed uh, last year uh, by uh, Russian militants and by Russian army. And uh, this insight of like being uh, to having this hole and this portal to something else, I feel like a violent act that it's not. It wasn't my choice, you know. This is was the choice of the um, state that have a power, that have military infrastructure, that have um, lots of resources, especially money, and so on and so forth. And then when I escaped to the uh, Europe and uh, being in uh, Vienna in the beginning, and then in London. I feel like uh, this totality is about Russian presence as well, not only the art history, but also in academia, in intellectual space. Uh, so they trying to, they still trying to continue their agenda, and they still trying to save uh, narratives like, uh, as I said, uh, very problematic. Uh, Russian cosmism and uh, Russian avant-garde, which uh, extremely I disagree with such kind of terms. And uh, as I have just a three minutes, I maybe will um, finish with this slide. Uh, this is exactly what have happened a year ago, uh, especially the day before full-scale invasion. Uh, me, with my colleagues, we presented uh, an archive, a Ukrainian edition of Secondary Archive. It's an uh, initi initiative made by Katarzyna Kozira uh, Foundation in Poland. They uh, created this website and project for um, uh, women artists uh, from the East and uh, East European countries. And uh, last year we presented 15, uh, 15 manifestos and statements uh, by Ukrainian artists. And some of them at that time still had uh, the presence of war because uh, some of them was born in Luhansk, for example. Some of them uh, lost uh, connection with home, like Katerina Yermolaeva. And in her uh, statement, he reflects a lot this and how in her personal case war uh, changed the situation and how she uh, tried to uh, deal with the trauma of war. So we had this presence, but of course, after full scale invasion, the situation had been completely, uh, extremely. Um, and a bit later, uh, we prepared the special project for Manifesta. This is uh, Biennale that uh, this year uh, happened in Pristina in Kosovo. And for this uh, presentation, we also prepared uh, an audio from uh, our selected artists. And uh, again, just comparing to these different uh, um, statements in the beginning, in uh, 23rd February, uh, last year, and also to compare it with the situation of summer, we understood that um, 
the war uh, influenced on different level, in personal level, in a level of uh, emotional, and also in uh, aesthetics as well, uh, in production, in materiality, and also its uh, influence on the presence itself. Like, for example, Valeria Trubin at that time was uh, in uh, occupied Luhansk because her mother lived there still. And uh, she come to the city just before full-scale invasion. And after that, she cannot flew because she has uh, a U.S. citizenship right now. So it was completely difficult for her. And we had these uh, records um, of statement uh, by Valeria Trubina. Uh, and what is also interesting that we have uh, Alla Horska, uh, we have amazing her statement that she wrote uh, to Opanas Zalewacha uh, in 60s, but uh, com just recently in spring, uh, in autumn, um, we saw that her mosaics in Mariupol uh, was destroyed and damaged be because of war. So my uh, conclusion uh, is that we still have ongoing war and it still influenced the artists, especially women artists. And we have to admit that huge resistance that we have right now, this is extremely important for, for artists and for Ukrainian art. But also, what do we need? We need a support from international community and also desire to like really rethink the international art history, how it was, and to try to uh, look at the Ukrainian examples um, uh, and try to look at the Ukrainian art uh, and speak about that uh, problems that uh, that raised before, uh, and maybe uh, in next time when we will have the same situation with uh, war and the violence and so on, we would be more prepared for this. Um, thank you so much, and uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Katerina. It was exciting, very interesting. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. So we need to move on with our program and go to the next presenter. But it was fascinating, absolutely. And I'm looking forward and wish you all the best with your research in this subject. And I hope that you'll be able to publish maybe something on this. And good luck. Good luck with that. Thank you so much. And my uh, greetings to Svetlana Bedareva, who is the next speaker. Yeah, uh, Svetlana no. is here already. And yeah. uh, yes, uh, the next, we're staying with the, the topic of Ukrainian art, contemporary Ukrainian art. The next presentation's uh, title is Contemporary Ukrainian Art, Decoloniality and the Cultural Impact of the War. And it's going to be presented by Svetlana Bedareva, who is uh, here, standing ready. And who is, I understand, now in Washington, D.C., being a fellow at the Institute of European Russian Eurasian Studies. Is that, is that correct? Um, hello. Uh, I'm, I'm in Mexico City right now. Oh, Mexico City. Okay, so yeah. not Washington, D.C., but another southern city. Okay, good. Great. Wonderful. So, Svetlana, the floor is yours, please. Ah, so thank you so much, Vladimir, for, for, for introducing me, and uh, thank you, Katerina, for the, the excellent presentation. And uh, today, the, the topic I would like to focus on is uh, uh, the relation between documentation and uh, decoloniality in uh, recent Ukrainian art after 2014. And I will present some notes uh, from uh, my recent lecture that I gave earlier this week at the Kansas University. And um, um, well, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm happy to present today this, this precise topic, and I would like to remind also that this is a, a fundraising event, so please donate for the initiative of Kiev School of Economics, and here, hereby I start. Uh, in, in, in this lecture, well, in no, in the, not in this lecture, in this talk, uh, I will focus on the transformations that Ukrainian art has experienced since the outbreak of war of Russia against Ukraine. And I will discuss the stages of development of uh, wartime and art in Ukraine between uh, 2014 and 2022. And uh, uh, in doing so, I will explore uh, the main topics which Ukrainian artists address as a challenge and dismantle of extending Russian colonial narratives uh, in their art. Uh, I aim to examine how artists' works uh, dispute Ukraine's belonging to the post-Soviet space and uh, how they address the ongoing trauma of war uh, 
to uh, uh, share the colonial perspective. I will also discuss uh, the place of politically and socially engaged art practice uh, as practices of resistance that follow the outbreak of violence brought about by uh, the full-scale invasion in February 2022. Uh, in order to create some kind of typology, a preliminary topo typology of methods and practices of resistance employed by artists in uh, their works. Uh, my premise is that over the last nine years, including the year 2022, which was, of course, traumatic and uh, horrible for all of us uh, in terms of uh, human losses, in terms of destruction. Uh, the narratives and the methods of addressing the reality uh, used by the artists exchanged each other and uh, very, very rapidly uh, as the war events were unfolding. I propose that this evolution of resistance through art can be classified into three dimensions that uh, permitted all the layers of living in Ukrainian society from the public sphere to the private level and uh, further to the intimate space. These three different stages of art production were reflected in the art I will be speaking about today. First, I will speak about a uh, public level. Um, uh, the rise uh, uh, in, in this public well level precisely is where occurred the rise of documentary practices after the beginning of the war in 2014 as what I call the emergence of documentary art as a unity between artistic practice and uh, documentary media, such as film, photography, reportage texts. And this also included archival work as uh, both the reinterpretation of existing historical archives and kind of revisions of uh, contested uh, history and contested memory and uh, uh, the creation of the archive of the war, which aimed at tra transforming the politics of memory. In 2014, the artistic practice evolved from a position of an artist as a detached or partly involved observer whose task was to be a messenger, reflecting the situation on the front line for the audience outside the war zone. And uh, in 2022, this uh, position uh, radically transformed to uh, the one of an active participant in the events because of the all involving character of the tragic events. The extensive development of documentation practices in art and film reflected uh, on the epistemological shift brought about by the war as a production of new knowledge and a further consideration of identity and memory by Ukrainian society. This shift then marked uh, the beginning of the final dismantling of entanglements with post-colonial narratives aiming instead for the full decolonial release. The second private level of interpretation uh, that I will be speaking about is interpretation of personal experience uh, that was marked by immersion of the artist into the war events after the beginning of uh, the full-scale invasion. The genre of reportage from the front line was uh, substituted with personal diaries and uh, depicting the uneasy reality that the artists in their closest circle were witnesses to. The reported speech as a report of the distant events proper for documentary practices uh, after 2014 and before 2022, turned to, turn to direct speech of immediate eyewitnesses uh, witnesses of the violence and uh, it permitted entry to their private spaces as well in this dialogue. In, and finally, the third intimate level included reflections on the trauma of violence, including sexual violence and the necessity to oppose the objectification of the human body brought about by the war atrocities. It prompted the creation of works addressing the topics of corporeality and the resistance to aggression brought through at the same time constituting its presence and denying its power of reduction of personality uh, through the lens of victimhood. The artist challenged objectification by violence by putting its dehumanizing qualities into their focus of attention and moving this topic from the periphery to the center. The methods uh, that in this third stage the artists use, although they are informed by documentary practice, such as photography and film, uh, they turn to more uh, symbolic expressive means, presenting a more advanced degree of interpretation of the events, in contrast to documentary practice as an initial process of knowledge production. So uh, uh, while documentary practice and documentary art created this epistemological basis, then uh, already uh, artistic, artistic reflections in 2022, especially in the second half of, uh, of the year, they created already some uh, elaboration uh, based on, on, on this knowledge that was accumulated in the preceding years. 
So now I will talk about the three levels uh, or layers of the colonial processes uh, that are ongoing in uh, Ukrainian art. And I will start my my presentation in PowerPoint. Okay, so the, the first stage is uh, the public space and the documentary term that uh, followed uh, the year 2014. Uh, in my research, I propose that there have been two stages of documentary term in Ukrainian art. The first was in 2014, and uh, I spoke uh, I spoke about the documentary turn in my text, uh, the documentary turn in Ukrainian art that was published in 2021, um, like some months before uh, the invasion began. And uh, the second that occurred in uh, 2022, and there is, uh, I propose that there is a third stage of uh, uh, the documentary turn uh, first coming uh, with the end of the war. And I will talk about this uh, further in this presentation. Uh, well, the documentation of the war between 2014 and 2021 aimed at bringing the reflections from the front line and the occupied territories to the rest of the country. The documentary method in 2022 experienced significant changes, switching the focus to the personal experiences of the artists as a reflection of the general condition of Ukrainian society affected by military violence. The understanding of the necessity of direct opposition to the colonial discourse pursued by Russia was one of the in intrinsic aims of this second stage. And uh, directly following the 2014 Euromaidan revolution and uh, Russia's occupation of the east of Ukraine and Crimea, the work by such artists as Evgenia Belarusias, Pyotr Armenovsky, Alevtina Kahidze, Andrei Dostlev and Lea Dostleva, <clears throat> Dana Kavelina, Mikola um, Rida, and many, many, many other artists uh, turn to engage with the effects of Russia's war on Ukraine and the production of memories through documentary, uh, photography, text, video, researching archives and creating new archives. The, their work explores post-colonial issues of hybridity and ambivalence for post-Soviet Ukrainian political identity and examined and reconsidered them <coughs> using the notions of displacement, violence and trauma brought about by the war. Several of these artists began to contribute to the fields of documentary production through art, mediating between audiences and ongoing political and social crises. Uh, this, uh, th this work that I present in, in this slide is Evgenia Belarusian series, Victories of the Defeated, that the artist created between 2014 and 2018, uh, which explores the harsh reality behind the everyday routine of working class people in the Donbass, in the towns of Dibaltseva, Lysychansk, Vlagirsk, Popasna, among others. The aim was to break the silence about uh, the living conditions of these people and the reasons for their marginalization in the context of the threat of Russian occupation of the town. While having a general interest in uh, everyday lives, uh, lives of uh, local miners uh, with the proximity of war, uh, the artist focused her main attention on the uh, social roles of women working in these mines. Uh, with unrestricted insights into their personal spaces, Belarus has depicted an unembellished reality of the conditions of poverty and hopelessness surrounding this women. The descriptive and involved approach that she assumed in uh, documenting people in their living conditions intersected with a seeming disinterest in the technical side of the documentary process. The artist didn't filter out uh, uh, the photograph's noise, uh, blurriness, slightly unbalanced perspectives in some photographs, pushing uh, it closer to uh, reportage photography. <laughs> The ambivalence represented uh, by the series refers to the postcolonial conditions of existence in the disputed space and the necessity to justify breaking with the space by looking at the actual faces of the protagonists of the series and challenging the central peripheral relation by turning the focus of attention to them. Another work that turns to reportage of the events to, to, bring, them to the, bring it to the audience that is not participating directly in these events. Uh, is uh, the work just went away by um, 
Ula Mikhailuk. I'm sorry. Okay, this work recreated the situation of the war in which the Donetsk and Lugansk regions were immersed at the beginning of hostilities along the Ukrainian Russian border in 2014. The artist helps us to trace, trace the tracks of the refugees from the Luhansk region, many of them are uh, women, many of them single mothers with children, who had to walk 40 kilometers in the snow, escaping the shelling of the cities. Mikhail then created a seminar as a kind of self-support group, uh, where the women could narrate their stories and write them on a board. The resulting installation after this uh, seminar included a two-channel video and a charcoal inscription on the museum wall, quoting some of the stories. And to the left, there is a photograph uh, from the exhibition uh, that I curated uh, in 2019 uh, in, in Mexico City at the National Museum of Cultures, where we presented this work by, by Ulla, uh, trying to establish these parallels between the notions of violence in uh, Ukrainian culture and in Latin American cultures. Uh, in, in this project, the artist appeared as a mediator between the viewers and uh, raw reality, and blurring the border between documentary and fiction, as she factually summarized and replaced the selected storyline formulated by direct witnesses. The transformation of the narrative fostered uh, that uh, these personal accounts were inscribed in the public memory, forming a new archive of the wartime stories of displacement and trauma. Resistance to the loss of such memory manifests a denial of oblivion constituted by the artist's performance that intended to blur the boundaries between being a witness and being a direct participant, as walking in the, for, for the same distance as this, this woman did. So once again, re reenacting uh, uh, the traumatic body, bodily experience in real life conditions. And, uh, uh, the, the, uh, with uh, the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the uh, work of the same artist evolved in a different manner. And uh, for here is the example of her new film, uh, Irpin, Chronicles of the Revival, that was presented just recently at the beginning of February. Uh, and this film features a similar method of facing direct witnesses and survivors of violent events in the town in uh, the spring of 2022. However, oh, Svetlana, okay, was well, some technical connection issue, but now you're back, right? Yes, I, I think I should share the screen again. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, good. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure at what, at what, uh, which part um, the connection dropped, but um, I was saying that the artist looks at the revival of the city uh, after uh, the destructions and numerous deaths in the city uh, through the lens of the connection between people and nature that surround these people and uh, making parallels between reconstruction and regeneration. The inhabitants of Philippines speak about their gardens, show the plants they take care of and share their losses of relatives and friends that occurred because of the Russian aggression. For example, in the episode Pani Tanya, which is uh, a still from the film uh, to the left. Uh, the interview begins her narration by sharing her memories of the forest that surrounded the town in the past and not anymore. And further talks about her garden from which she lives. At some moment in her monologue, <coughs> Pani Tanya tells about her grandson Dima, who died from shelling and was buried in her garden for several weeks during the Russian occupation of the area. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and and uh, he, 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 he died from shelling and he was buried in her garden. 
for several uh, for several weeks. The story continues when Fanny Tanya broadly uh, gives a detailed tour of uh, the same garden, uh, showing vegetables and flowers growing uh, in, in this garden, and even proposing to the artist to to try some of her cucumbers and other vegetables. Uh, the drama of the loss interweaves with the hope of revival uh, that her garden gives to her. Both nature and culture participate in this historical process of Ukraine society resistance to the invasion and overcoming its, its aftermath. As we speak about the end of a post-colonial situation and the beginning of the colonial reconstruction and recovery after the war. Uh, another work that uh, discusses uh, the uh, destiny of the city of Irpin is Jana Kadyrova's ready-made, uh, which is called uh, the Data Extraction Irpin from 2022. The work displays a cross-section of asphalt from the city of Irpin district, uh, Irpin's district, Irpinsky Lipke, uh, that shows the extent of damage that the city suffered during Russian atrocities in the, in the town. It shows this damage from, uh, from, from shelling. Initiated in 2011, uh, the series data extraction consists of extracted pieces of concrete and asphalt that changed its conceptual focus uh, and objectives over time. Uh, first, this series uh, aimed to map uh, the streets of Kiev to record renovation of the streets and roads in the city for Euro 2012 football championship. Uh, that served at, the, at that time, in 2000, back in 2011-2013, as criticism of exclusively superficial changes as a sign of corruption in the city reconstruction. And we see an example of this work uh, in, in, in the photo to the right. After 2014, the artist turned to the documentation of damage in various cities of Ukraine due to Russian military actions, including materials uh, from the occupied territories. After 2022, the work expanded due to the increased level of destruction which the artist aimed to document. The series represents a different kind of war documentation, where the physical proof of destruction is uh, preserved uh, in a, in a ready-made. The use of stone and asphalt as durable materials refer to the long-term effects of such destruction and its inscription into public memory. Uh, this project, uh, in its new version of 2022, uh, is uh, one of the early attempts of memorialization where the real life evidence of aggression is transported to a gallery space and displayed to the public. Moving from the critique of reconstruction to the documentation of uh, war caused destruction, this pro project changed its orientation from internal, focusing on uh, local political and social tensions to external, focusing on the dramatic effects of the ongoing war. And uh, the second stage or the second level uh, of uh, artistic reflection uh, to, the, to the ongoing war is uh, personal experience as uh, uh, an account uh, of uh, artists as eyewitnesses of, uh, of violence. Uh, post-2022, uh, uh, following the full-scale invasion, the artists turned from social documentation and archival investigation to uh, their own personal chronicles in which the different visions of the artist's diary, such as the work of Alevtina Kahidze, Yevgenia Belarusias, and Vlada Ralko, has become the emblematic form. With the direct impact of the war on Ukrainian society in its entirety, the meaning of documentation of the war events changed dramatically. As I mentioned before, since 2014, documentation and documentary art practices have been used as a kind of reported speech to convey the situation on the front line and uh, in the gray zone, uh, and in the occupied territories uh, to the rest of Ukraine. In 2022, nearly all Ukrainians turned into eyewitnesses of violence and crimes against civilians. The documentary dimension after the beginning of the invasion, therefore, also changed its, uh, its, its form. It aims not as much to transmit distant traumatic events to a wider public and to establish the dialogue with them uh, so, as, as, as if they are the external observers but to emp empathically reflect on the audience's own traumatic life experiences, including destructions and human losses. The question of historical memory, memory has also become secondary, with a strong decolonial shift that no more implies a reconsideration of the elements of the past, but the creation of new narratives that mark the full dismantling of the postcolonial perspective and its hybridity, including cultural, linguistic, and political. 
So uh, with the uh, Russian invasion uh, in February of the last year, Leftino Kahidze developed a diary and which reflected first on the artist's premonition of the near and violence, and then on her eyewitness account of the traumatizing events. Her criticism of the war is enacted through a personal lens with explicit anti-colonial statements and the reflection of violence and imminent danger that characterize life so many in, for so many in Ukraine. In the drawing self-portrait with Russian military hardware, which was made in March 2022, Kahidze depicts the trajectory of Russian invaders and their proximity to, to her home in the village of Muzice in the Kiev, uh, in the Kiev region, which is situated at the intersection of the movement of military equipment used for the destruction of Ukrainian cities and villages. At this time, the artist was forced to spend uh, most of her time in the basement of her house with air raid sirens repeatedly blaring. Uh, in uh, her other a uh, work, uh, Butch and Me, 47 Minutes by Car, uh, drawn a month later, the artist paradoxically depicts the impossibility of visually recording the extreme violence that occurred in Butch, a town uh, near Kiev that was heavily affected by Russian occupation. Her body is bent in sorrow, shown in front of a vast red blood, which marks the massacre of civilians and numerous rapes that Russian soldiers performed there. Uh, another series by Kahidze, uh, Invasions, was recently presented at Manifesto Biennial at Kosovo. Uh, and it reinterprets the notion of the invasion through the perspective of vegetative realm. The artist expresses her fascination with the world of plants, those that can have their own colonial uh, struggles, but uh, regenerate easier than humans. The invasive plants that the artist turns her close look to are also very less, than ag ag less aggressive than people. And uh, she presents her thoughts that the invasive plants, contrary to people, do not kill local species immediately. And she thinks that uh, standing in front of two, two graves in her village, one uh, of a person who was killed at the military outpost, another uh, of a person who exploded on the mine. Also, she found similarities between invasive plants plants and people, as she said in her cellar, where, where the while Russian army progressed towards uh, uh, Kiev. The invasive species easily move across space and time, and so do Russian tanks moving in the direction of her village. And uh, of course, she thinks about uh, uh, time in, in relative terms, comp comparing these two uh, movements. Kahidze's invasions is also a personal diary written in an epistolary form that depicts the artist's intimate relationship with her garden and projects a metaphor of invulnerability and resilience on the entire Ukrainian society. This project includes a collaboration with documentary filmmaker Pyotr Arminovsky uh, with uh, uh, a film uh, Invasions 1, 2, 3 of 360 degrees, uh, where the action begins next to the graveyard monument of Kahidze's mother, Strawberry Andreevna. The story of Strawberry Andreevna is rather well known and already described in, in many sources dedicated to Kahidze's work. Uh, her mother was a, a retired teacher, nicknamed by her pupils uh, Klubnika, or Strawberry Andreevna, uh, who lived in the town of Zdanivka, located in the Donetsk region, occupied by pro-Russian forces. From the very beginning of the war with Russia in 2014, until her untimely death, when crossing the border between occupied territory and Ukrainian land in 2019, uh, Kahidze's mother couldn't see her daughter in person. The artist took notes on their communication over the phone and later incorporated them into a series of drawings and handwritten notes under the general title at over, uh, Through the War with Strawberry Andreevna, representing an anxious but at the same time refreshing point of view of her mother on the military situation surrounding her home. The diary that the artist uses now presents uh, a significant difference from her earlier reportage series, Strawberry Andreevna. Uh, and I mean the diaries that uh, of these two previous examples that I, I discussed on the previous slides. Uh, while the artistic research of Kahidze on plant invasion, for example, relies on her own experience responding to those of her audiences, her diaries dedicated to her mother from 2014-2019 worked as an informational channel connecting Ukraine's occupied territories with the rest of the country. The second documentary stage I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation is constituted in this juxtaposition between direct speech and reported speech 
where the artist appears both eyewitnesses and active agents of the colonial release. We can interpret the reported speech of reportage practices as forming knowledge about the events, while the direct speech of the artist diaries manifest act active symbolic resistance against neocolonial attempts. And uh, another uh, example of uh, a diary uh, produced after the beginning of uh, the full-scale invasion is the Serious Lviv Diary by uh, Vlada Ralko, which presents yet a different type of a diary, the one that metaphorically documents the struggles since uh, the invasion began. Uh, Ralko, similarly to Kahidze, also created a dialogue with her earlier series. This is, in her case, is her 2013-2014 series, Kiev Diary. Uh, where she depicted political events of, uh, of the Euromaidan and uh, escalation of post-colonial confrontation with the government of the pro-Russian ex-president Viktor Yanukovych. And we can see how actually even the, the, the way uh, or the artist depicts her, 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 her reflections changes from all this kind of uh, very well uh, drawn, very quite well structured images in Kiev diary to this chaotic mix of lines uh, and more abstract uh, uh, presentation in, in Lviv Diary. So in a Lviv Diary named after the city, the artist found shelter after the uh, outburst of violence with the full-scale invasion. She explores the profound trauma of war by merging erotically charged uh, images with depictions of extreme violence. The drawings are excessive and grotesque in their manner, as the artist fills nearly the entire paper with sketches of male and female, and in some cases, cupid-like figures, who represent different stages of a struggle with a two-headed pigeon-like eagle. At times, it is only the decapitated head of this monster that appears in the drawings. At other times, we witness an epic fight as part of a heroic narrative. Uh, uh, informed by religious iconography and uh, pornographic imagery, uh, this project uh, draws on figurative reinterpretation of colonial entanglement between Russia and Ukraine. The Soviet symbols that occasionally re-emerge in the drawings imply the consideration of this fight as a final and irreversible battle that will dismantle not only the falsified pseudo-imperial narrative used by Russia, but the entire post-Soviet space, or at least Ukraine's uh, belonging to it. The decolonial perspective is incorporated in this work through the interplay of power positions that the sides repeatedly exchange as the military situation unfolds. And uh, returning to uh, the, um, the works of Evgenia Belarusis, uh, yet another type of uh, diary uh, that uh, presents in its totality an important movement from uh, documentation of the events to uh, their memorialization as a tendency that we can observe in the latest uh, months. Uh, in, in her series of texts, uh, The War Diary uh, from 2022, the artist presented her uh, dispatches from wartime Kiev, uh, forming her testimony to the ongoing donation in the form of, uh, of, of a personal diary, she, which was accompanied by a reportage photo series uh, that documented the situation of the first 42 days uh, of the invasion, uh, uh, of the invasion, uh, as she saw it in Kiev in February, April, uh, 2022. The series of photographs examines the challenges of everyday life uh, in Kiev uh, in the wartime. Uh, for example, uh, the work uh, to the right, uh, which is uh, the work from uh, 17th March uh, of 2022, shows a view of the city with violet gray smoke rising all over it. It is unclear whether this was a cloud or a trace of a rocket uh, hit by the anti-aerial defense and cooling of the city, as passers-by who claim to be witnesses of this event told to the artist. And uh, this ambiguity uh, was um, also uh, kind of supported by the fact that the official media uh, remained silent on this occasion. So uh, uh, the, the ambiguity and the subtle balance between uh, deadly threats and the peaceful everyday life of seeing thinking whether it was a, a rocket or just a cloud, uh, in this photograph create tension as an anxious expectation of the unknown. And so is also the photograph uh, to, the, to the left, which depicts a buggy uh, that was low, left in the park uh, following an uh, anti-aerial alarm. And uh, also, it, it produces this uh, tension of uh, 
uh, kind of the pressure of, of the unknown. What happened to these people? Why they left this buggy? And will they return for it? And uh, uh, on the background of this tra traumatic uh, threat from, uh, from 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 Ru from Russian uh, from Russian attacks. Uh, based on the text from the World Diary, Belarus has created an installation that uh, was originally shown at the Citizens' Garden in front of the European Parliament and featured the artist's account of shelling destruction and losses uh, during the days of the occupation of the Kiev uh, region. The text describing a day in the risk zone is etched into the metal of the table. According to the idea of the artist, with the time the surface will rust, but the text will remain inscribed there as the evidence of the crime seen and narrated by Belarusians and her closest circle. In Belarusian words, the installation helped her to ponder the weight of a single day in the war zone. However, it can paradoxically, uh, this uh, installation can also be seen as a symbol of dialogue, as an invitation of two or more sides to communicate over it as a table, which given the traumatic experience inscribed on its surface, converts into a sign of its impossibility. The text negates the very possibility of such a peaceful exchange, inverting the object's meaning to the opposite, and at the same time functioning as evidence of atrocities performed by a Russian army in Ukraine's territory. This work can constitute the final turn in the artistic documentation of Russia's war on Ukraine as a memorialization of it and the conclusive decolonial statement. Also, it might uh, as well be seen as coming prematurely while the historical inverse uh, events are still ongoing. Uh, we might as well link this process to a historiographic turn uh, because any memorialization implies that current events are already in the past. However, as the invasion continues, decolonization, documentation, and memorialization go hand in hand. And uh, here I go to the third level of uh, artistic resistance uh, uh, in art that addresses the topic of uh, intimate space and its uh, transgression and the bodily and gender dimensions of violence. Uh, the intimate space and its transgression became the main topic of artists' attention in the second half of 2022, as Ukrainian society attempted to comprehend the effects of the brutal invasion. The bodily and gender dimensions of violence as examples of the transgression of the personal and intimate space by the Russian war, uh, by the Russian war crimes against Ukrainians, and the questions of objectification and dehumanization brought about by violent deaths were addressed by many artists following the traumatizing events in the Kiev suburbs and the east and the south of the country following spring 2022. For example, uh, Katerina Lisovenko's works address the topics of extreme violence that mark the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Her painting explores the complex relationship between epic narratives of uh, the war drawn from classical mythology and the death and violence that occur in the real life, uh, her large scale works. Uh, instead of talking about her large scale works, I rather focus here on uh, her smaller size watercolors, uh, such as the watercolor uh, under, uh, being under knowledge, uh, in which uh, the inner organs of children depicted there are exposed as a commentary on the violent nature that touches everyone living in Ukraine, including children. The vulnerability of children figures and the violated bodily limits are also allusive to the violation of the state border of Ukraine, when the entire country became exposed to pain, trauma, atrocity, and ruination. Physical violence goes hand in hand with epistemic violence that permits all aspects of life and exposes its fragility. The artist often uses binary oppositions in her works in order to address the topic of the trauma of the war as expressed through bodily experience. In her work, A Woman and the Death, the woman embraces a double-headed uh, death in a kind of death, uh, in a kind of dance, sorry. In addition to its usual monstrous appearance, the death here has an emphasized regularity that highlights the grotesqueness and deformity. The parallels that can be done to the Russian state emblem and that are also used in the work of Vlad Ralko, for example, with the double-headed eagle uh, with uh, two skulls, depicts a deadly encounter with the evil, which takes a very concrete form. Danila Mavchan's works employ a similar water, uh, watercolor technique uh, to use transparency for exposing inner organs in the figures. 
showing their inner structure as a sign of absence of defensive limits or a testimony to physical violence and death. Mavchen, originally an icon painter, depicts stylized figures against the plain background, making references to religious iconography, and thus placing images uh, of victims of the war in a religious or mythological narrative. For example, the work Nitrogen, Nitrogen Explosion depicts the moment of death as it presents the body thrown upwards by an explosion wave, convulsing in an agony. The watercolor two bodies with the hidden faces depicts the bodies of men and women with their faces invisible and unrecognizable, reflecting in this way on the all unifying logic of the war, which depersonalizes its victims. And this topic of uh, depersonalization uh, of victims and the logic of the war were discussed also in, uh, in the earlier series of Dana Kavilena, which is an exception in, in this uh, in the selection that I did for, for this section, because this is a series of 2019, which worked as kind of a premonition of uh, brutal events of 2022. So uh, her work uh, from the series, Communications Exit to the Blind Sports, uh, which is called Woman Kills the Son of the Enemy, Woman Recreates the Logic of War, takes the viewer to the effect of rape as a consequence of war. An attempt of, an attempt of killing a child conceived by an enemy kills uh, the, the own child of the woman connected to her by a numeral cord, which becomes a murder tool. The artist reflects on how violence, not only physical but also epistemic, and the extreme transgression of intimate space procreate. In this work, Kavelina points out that the immersion into war and the hate produced by it often becomes a self-destructive mechanism. And at the same time, she points out the particular vulnerability of civilian women in the conditions of the war. The project that was made in 2019 worked as a comment on the rather general logic of war and in the context of the reported atrocities in the east of Ukraine after 2014 that well, many of them were almost fully omitted by uh, the, the society's attention. And she points out this uh, in injustice uh, in relation to the events uh, preceding 2022. The distance from the war and the Ukrainian society's indifference to its presence in the east of the country and the silence of victims of violence are also addressed in her drawing from the threat of silence a pullover for a soldier is here, which is uh, the image to the right. The red sweater for the Russian soldier, as a symbol of violence and atrocity he brings with him, is crafted from the silence of those who are afraid to speak about his crime, which negates the right uh, to corporeality, which negates uh, this crime that negates the right to corporeality to its victims. And uh, this topic was also addressed by uh, performance artist and sculptor Maria Kulikovska in a reflection that links physical violence with the destruction of cultural objects across the country. Uh, as, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, 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 in her work, uh, which was called The, the Forgotten, Homo Bula, uh, the artist uh, referred uh, to real events that occurred in Donetsk in 2014. Uh, a group of pro-Russian terrorists used soap sculptures modeled after the artist's own body uh, that were exhibited at the Isolatia Art Center that uh, Katerina uh, presented about in, in detail. Uh, so there were also works by the Maria Kulikovska there and they were used as targets for shooting. The art center was captured and looted by Russian militants uh, from the unrecognized Donetsk Popular Republic and it has become an illegal political prison. In 2019, in the reflection of this trauma, uh, the replicas of Kulikovska sculptures were shot by the artist during the performance, which the artist carried out for the Ukrainian Swiss film uh, the Forgotten by Daria Nishenko. This destruction of the artist's own image mirrors the killings that occurred widely in the east of Ukraine after 2014 and represents the artist's consideration of her being in the place of female victims as no more than another object of the atrocity. In her new work, The Table of Negotiations from 2022, uh, Kulikovska responds to this intention of objectification brought about by Russian crimes, as well as attempts to resist it by bringing the question of Dan back to the limits of perception. Okay, this is exaggerated. Uh, just a warning that you have two minutes left, please. Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm going to, 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 to the conclusion Good. already. Uh, this, this, so this exaggerated unpleasant work, the table of negotiations, 
uh, in a series of three-dimensional tiles presents a feast of death and a nightmarish collection of images that have been following Ukrainian society since they learned about crimes against civilians in Bucha, Mazum, Bucha Mariupol, Izum, and uh, other Ukrainian cities. Ceramics as a selected material of the work is testimony to the fragility of uh, human body. Kulikovska's aggressive work triggers the emotions of viewers and involves them in an elaborate game of apprehension or obsession with ongoing trauma. The previously taboo discussion on violence, as well as explicit corporeality in Ukrainian society, surfaces here as a method of resistance, as a demosologization and the synthesization of both topics in the face of a war. And uh, he, here I have uh, two more projects that uh, I would like to speak about, but I don't have time already. Uh, and uh, these both uh, projects by uh, Kinder Album and Nana uh, Kavelina, they um, reflect on the idea of a resurrection after, uh, after all the violence and after uh, all, all the atrocities. So to conclude, uh, the Ukrainian new art produced after the second half of 2022 calls for anti-objectification of those affected by the war, making a statement against the anonymity of violence and insist on seeing the scale of injustice. The recent art practices emphasize art's capacity for resilience and resistance in the face of a disaster and mark the decisive break with colonial narratives, creating instead all narratives drawing on the epistemological basis gathered in the first stages of artistic documentation of the war in 2014 2021. Ukrainian wartime art shows a profound transformation in the ways and methods of expression, from detached documentation preceding the full-scale invasion to the eyewitnesses' accounts of the first months of the invasion, and finally to the artist's interpretation of complex issues of bodily limits, survival and death, and the fundamental right to the human agency. This work shows ongoing to colonial transformation that guides Ukrainian culture and art and ensures its endurance and development as a resistance to the threat of the loss of cultural heritage and also uh, 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 human agency caused by the war. Thank you very much. Here I will finish my presentation. And uh, I, I think we don't have time already for questions. But... Yes, we don't indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Svetlana. Uh, unfortunately, yes, we don't have time for questions. and. Uh, uh, well, I'm actually giving moderation to you because you're going to be moderating the next presenter. So please, go ahead, Svetlana. Uh, you now have control. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. And uh, now I'm happy to present uh, the artist uh, Sasha Kurmas. Uh, who, uh, who, who who will talk about his uh, new project, uh, Alarming Symphony. And uh, Sasha Kurmas, hello. Uh, Sasha Kurmas is uh, a Kiev-based uh, Ukrainian artist who uh, works in the uh, impressive variety of uh, different uh, artistic mediums. And uh, he works with street art and photography. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, has a, uh, no? <laughs> no, no. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for a, a small introduction. Thank you, Svetlana, for this uh, short uh, presentation of myself. But actually, I don't work with street art. I start from graffiti. It's not a street art. It's a different kind of uh, genre, let's say. But anyway, um, my name is Sasha Kumas. Uh, hi, everybody who is... Um, in this webinar and thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, event. Um, I will start with a short introduction about myself, like really short, and then I will tell you a little bit about the project that I'm going to share with you as well. And then we will listen to this project and then if you have a question, we can talk about it. I think we have uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Yeah, so I think we it will be, we, we will have enough time. So uh, I will start with the presentation. So I'm interdisciplinary artist from Kyiv, uh, live and work in Kyiv. Um, I use different media and approaches for my artistic practice, like photography, video, performative studies, I like performative practice, public intervention, as well as diverse uh, strategies to engage audience 
through collaborative practice. Uh, quite often, I also collaborate with professionals uh, from other disciplines like uh, actors, uh, musicians, architects, uh, activists, and so on. The main focus of my work is uh, social and political issues and the global challenges that Ukrainian society has faced in recent years. As a part of my presentation, I would like to share with you um, sound work. It's a sound piece that was created in 2021. This, well, this work was uh, ahead of its time and became a very relevant for every citizen of Ukraine last year after the invasion of Russian troops and start of full-scale missile shelling throughout Ukraine. The work uh, called Alarming Symphony uh, and the idea, idea of this piece come to my mind in, in 2020. During the COVID pandemic, I spent a lot of time at home, probably like all of you, in the terrible year. It was a time when I thought a lot about death and all these dire things that come with it, as well as studying material uh, materials and some uh, studies related to the topic of the apocalypse. So, Sorry. Uh, so I started reading the Bible. Uh, more specifically, I was focused in the book uh, Revelation, or it's also known as um, Book Revelation of the Saint, no, no, Revelation of Saint John the Divine. So this is a book that describes uh, events that will happen before the second coming of Jesus Christ to earth, which will be accompanied by numerous of cataclysm, disasters, and catastrophes. So the story starts when seven angels begin to blow into seven trumpets, and the sound of each trumpet symbolizes a certain catastrophe that will come to Earth. I was really fascinated of this idea of the sound that warns in approaching some catastrophe or some disaster, and this magical number seven. So it became a kind of starting point for me to think about idea for the future work. And uh, it was also like, let's say conceptual frame for develop the sound project. So uh, I decided to create a like, sound piece. I want to create like symphony of alarm sounds, which uh, used by, like for warming, I mean, no, no, no. Okay, the sounds that warming uh, some signal of dangers, like, uh, emergency sirens or fire sirens or ambulance sirens or police sirens, all this kind of dangerous signals that we are all use for information about some, some something horrible, let's say. Uh, so I use wise recorder to record all the sound and um, it, was, it was not so big deal to find the way to record it, but one of the hardest part of this project, it was to make recording of the air raid sirens. The sound that, this sound that is now very well known to all Ukrainians and used today as a signal of this possible uh, treat of missiles strike. But in 2021, this sound could not be so easily to record. To, so to solve this problem, I went to Dnipro city. It's a city in the center part of Ukraine. And at that time, in 2021, um, the city built a new subway line. And construction workers, they use uh, dynamite. And before the explosion, they turn on this air raid alarm for like 30 seconds. So it was a way for me to make this recording of the sound. And when uh, all the sound were recorded, I asked um, my colleagues, also my friend, musician, his name is Oleksiy Petrov, to create a symphony, like to create like sound piece from all this recording sound. So I create like a um, conceptual structure for the symphony, like how it should work, but I need like help of a professional, like, like real musician who can do like real symphony from these uh, pieces. So we work together and as a result, we got uh, this piece that we're going to, that we're going to listen with you together. Also, we create a website. Uh, I can show you. I can. Uh, you can. You can find it easily by Google. It's uh, by address like www.alarmingsymphony.com. I will share also in the chat in this webinar. So please uh, 
check it when you have a time. And now we are going to listen to this work, this sound piece. And before we start, uh, one thing's important thing. So ideally, uh, this work was created for like real uh, listening in physical space with a really good sound system and really good uh, subwoofer with low frequency. So subwoofer that can play this low frequency because it's also part of the sound. So that you can physically feel this kind of sound. But if you have a good speakers or headphones, uh, this can be probably work as well. But anyway, uh, let's try. Plus, um, also technical part of the work. So the piece is four minutes long and the sound is quite traumatic and can cause an, an anxiety. So if there is anybody who is sensitive to such a sounds or people from Ukraine with this work experience, I would recommend it not listen to this work, just in case if you don't want to have this kind of trigger uh, for rest of audience like if you are here let's let's listen let's get started and then if you have any question we can talk about it yeah so uh yes how how we should make it i mean uh everybody click link and we're listening together or uh i have to play it from my computer i mean I just don't know the logic how we how we're gonna do that technically. Okay, play from my computer. Um, wait a minute.
Wow. Um, yes, uh, complicated work. Uh, I don't know, any question? Uh, I play from my computer. I don't know, like if you hear it, but for me, it was too much. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to play it second time. Uh, sorry, but you can easily like find it like uh, and play it from your computer like easy. Uh, not sure that they're gonna play it second time. Sorry, hey, Sasha, I, I'm not sure that we, we heard the complete piece, but so certainly uh, the, there was sound and we heard part of it. And uh, uh, I have just a comment that uh, for, for me is amazing how you combine this. Uh, uh, sounds that in everyday life, which is which doesn't imply the presence of war, it can produce some kind of anxiety. But these are uh, regular everyday life sounds, like uh, for example, police and uh, the fire brigade and all these alarms. But how this the sound of air raid alarm actually recontextualizes the sounds into a different type of anxiety? The anxiety that uh, implies this kind of very profound threat and. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think it's very interesting how how actually this combination into a symphony changes meaning of certain sounds. And uh, I would like to ask you, how have you where have you presented this work, and uh, have you have you had the chance to present it in Ukraine or uh, outside Ukraine, and how it was perceived? Well, thank you for comment comment, and thank you for the question. Um, the first time you. We present this work in in, uh, in the exhibition organized uh, by gallery uh, in Dnipro city, uh, Art Suite Gallery. Uh, it was an uh, exhibition that called, uh, I don't know the English translation, uh, in Ukrainian it's called Я підлежала до міста, якого ще не бачила, здається так. So it was a title of the exhibition and be present this work in a public space. And it was also present by like really good, like sound equipment. So people really can come physically and feel it. And actually this work, I mean, even for me now, like I, I when I hear it, like I, it's, it's triggering me a lot. Uh, and all this kind of black, uh, memories for the last year come to my mind but in 2021 it was absolutely different like intention so when i as i say before like so uh when i come to idea to make this work i was inspired by this christian bible and uh, this idea of making sound work about this kind of cat catastrophe that coming soon to earth i didn't even think that it will be like really really work uh things that will be like so relevant so for me it was also kind of shocked like when the war started i mean war started in 2014 but i mean big war this like uh, that we in ukraine called full scale invasion full scale invasion yes so yeah i don't know if i answer your question but that's it Thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you very much for presenting your work. Yeah, and you now we, we need to give uh, the word to the to, to next, uh, next presenters. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you for your presentation. Thank you. Ciao. So, hello. Um, let me just adjust my video. And can you see me? No. Yes, we can see you. You can see me? Okay. Hi, Timothy. How are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. See you. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm Jen Mertazashvili. I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and I run a center called the Center for Governance and Markets. Um, and my colleague, 
at the University of Pittsburgh, but also the president of the Kiev School of Economics is Timothy Milovanov, who is here with us today. And I, I don't think Timothy uh, needs an introduction to this audience, um, but I should just say that uh, we're, Timothy, we're just incredibly proud of the work that you've done at the Kiev School of Economics. And I just want to say that as your colleague at Pitt, as a professor, watching what you and your team have done at KSC over the past year has been truly inspiring. And when we use this word inspiring, you know, it's okay to, we, we, it's just unparalleled how you've brought higher education into this war as such a cause for good. I think you've reinstilled the faith that so much of us really need to have in higher education right now. So uh, I'm gonna let you do most of the talking. I know that you're back in, in Washington this week for some consultations. And I was just wondering, you know, we're looking one year on into this war. What surprised you most about the events of the past year? Mm. It's difficult to say. I think it would surprise me the most is that the war started. And right. we had we had that conversation, you know, in Pittsburgh right before you left about whether the war would stop start. I had not believed it would. I thought um, Russia would be crazy to do that. They will get stuck. They will get isolated. That will be a strategic mistake, which will be the beginning of the end of the Russia, as we know it. And I think that's what happened. They went to do it. Nonetheless, it's the amount of some people are attributed to them to in DC and elsewhere. They say, "Oh, you know, uh, it's a it's a comic intelligence failure, or it's a strategic intelligence failure on the part of um, Russia." And um, I don't like that answer. I think it's just the arrogance. Actually, it's this the very same imperialistic arrogance which thinks. And we know better, we can do it, we can do it easily. I'm pretty sure they had all the data uh, back saying that, listen, Ukrainians are going to resist. Ukrainians uh, are different. Uh, Ukrainians have agency. And I think they have chosen in the very standard Russian way to just simply ignore the fact that, um, that um, uh, Ukrainians are an independent nation. I have agency, and uh, we are not like Russians. We're not gonna, you know, but gonna resist. We're not gonna just surrender to the authority of the Kremlin. And um, it was a choice to invade, and the consequences uh, it's that it started the chain of events, which will be the demise of Russia as we know. Russia will probably survive in some form. It's just unfortunate um, that. Um, the price that uh, Ukrainians will pay for stopping Russia and preventing Russia from running other wars um, elsewhere in the future is so high and it's paid in lives. So what surprised me the most on, on Russia part is how arrogant they are. What surprised me the most on the Western part, on the free world part, is this... Um, ingrained thinking about the Russian greatness. Even now, a year ago, when I asked uh, some advisors of the government explicitly yesterday and the, today and this week, why, why do you think that uh, you know it went the way it went? The answer, the first answer that people give is not that Ukraine resisted. Or Ukraine is the, the first answer they give that Oh, Russia misunderstood Ukraine and they should have uh, attacked with more force Kiev on, on the first day of the war. So they, actually, these guys have not learned anything. And it's amazing. So that's what's surprising me about the free world, how these analysts and policymakers, in, in their mind, they still this, you know, that uh, this is Russia versus the West or Washington versus Russia uh, deciding on something. I mean, there are very different processes, uh, fundamental issues. Uh, which are being played out, the future of the world, or at least Europe is being played out in, in Ukraine, because there's a difference between the Ukrainian culture where the human life and freedom is above the state, above the authority, 
and the Russian state, where the state, the greater Russia, is above an individual freedom or even the right to live. So in Ukraine, people volunteer to defend the state. In Russia, people are so afraid of the state that they are willing to die in the front lines without even saying a word against it. So I think this is what surprised me, you know, the, how arrogant Russia is and how uh, arrogant uh, the West is. How has the West, especially, well, not just the West, but, you know, we, you talked about how people had underestimated Ukraine and Ukrainians. What aspects do you think were most underestimated? I think it's most aspects of every nation are underestimated. When people sit in high offices and think that they rule the world, they don't understand that it is not Putin or uh, Biden or whoever, you know, Chinese Communist Party deciding on the future of the world. It's decisions of the millions or tens of millions of people, daily decisions, you know, what they're going to do. You know, like these kids, I just made a post on Twitter yesterday about, and there's a video of young guys, you know, 18-year-olds or 20-year-olds in tanks driving, you know, to probably what was their death to defend Kiev on the first day of the war and they knew what what they were doing but they're just doing their job and the future of the world is determined by these decisions not by a disbursement of a, uh, order to military or a disbursement of a financial payment to someone in billions of dollars or millions of dollars or rubles or whatever it is determined by the decision of that kid that he is going to be willing to risk his life and likely to die because he's got a job to do. And it's a decision of a person who is a cashier at a supermarket on the first day of war, who has a family to save. And yet that cashier is selling water to people so that when they are evacuating, they have food and water in their cars or on their trains or something like that. I think that's what matters. And I think politicians uh, and managers, they tend to simplify, and, and then the public too, tend to simplify. It's so much information that people have to process. So they tend to simplify it by assigning names of leaders to it. But I think if something like that happened in other countries, people would rise, would rise to defend. And in that sense, I'm very, very optimistic about the future of the world. Because the model of the free world, where people value freedom and are willing to die for that freedom, is much more appealing to people than the model of the world where you are sent to die. It's not even your choice. You are sent to die in the name of party, in the name of the state. And unfortunately, we are leading, you know, we're heading towards a confrontation of these two models on the much greater scale between China and the United States. And what is happening in Europe right now is some kind of, you know, the first episode, I think. I, I'm not, I hopefully it's not going to be militarily confrontation, but it's truly a confrontation between different models of how we want to live, you know, in the future in on this planet. And so China and the U.S. are watching at how things are going to play out in Ukraine. And if Ukraine falls, China will be encouraged, and we will be facing much darker times. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you're talking about, I mean, I, I'm going to get back to this issue of the two different models, because I think that's a really important conversation for us to have. But one of the things I know you've written about, and I see really used so commonly in discourse here in the United States about this war, is they talk about ethnic Russians, ethnic Ukrainians, the surprise that ethnic Russians in Ukraine are fighting against Russia. And what, what seems to be so lost in this conversation is exactly what you've brought up uh, on the point of freedom, is that, you know, freedom knows no ethnicity. I agree with you. And I think uh, this ethnicity, it's like labeling. And uh, it's lazy intellectualism. Uh, we have been labeling countries or ethnicities we don't understand. And we always say, oh, you know, it must be a civil war. There must be a conflict. Why is there a conflict between people speaking Russian and Ukrainian in Ukraine? Why would there be a conflict? Oh, no, it's completely constructed by the Russian propaganda and the West is, is happy to buy into this. And, you know, people have not been there in the East or people have not been in, in, in the West of Ukraine and, you know, speak whatever language you want, even today. 
okay, I choose not to speak Russian, but I'm my native language is Russian. My U Ukrainian is actually my third language, with English being my second language. But I speak Ukrainian as my primary language uh, today. And I hope my children, which I don't have yet, but I hope I'll have them, and my children will speak Ukrainian. Now, it's a point I'm making today. But um, I think uh, it's a consequence. It's not the reason. The consequence of me willing to be different and valuing my right as a human and despising this idea of some kind of greater empire I just don't understand what's the function of empires i mean i don't understand what's the point of the great soviet union or the great what what, what is great about it and people then go and talk about great culture let's say of russia and um, you know i yesterday had a fantastically imperialistic question in um, in an audience in Chicago, a person asks me, but what about those Russians who immigrate from Russia during the war and they're being, um, being, you know, subjected to all kinds of criticism in the United States? It's very difficult for them to integrate. And I said, it's bizarre for me to talk about it because most likely, or many of these guys are not Russians. They could be from Yakutia, they could be from Tatarstan, they could be from Uzbekistan, they could be from, from Mordovia. You know, what is Russian? If you actually, you know, this is the empire which destroyed cultures of others. And of course, that's not how they see it. They think they uh, they civilized people from Yakutia or civilized people from Tatarstan. Then they 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 are not they are not willing to give agency to their own people. You know, they're extremely racist in that sense. And they're sending these people to die because they are procuring people for the military from these areas which they have made disadvantage. You know, Russia is great because it has gas, but gas is not being uh, explored or developed in Moscow. But somehow all the uh, funds from gas end up in Moscow and areas where gas is being uh, de developed or oil is being developed, in fact, are very, very poor areas with tons of climate and ecological consequences of this. So Russia, what Russia does, Russia destroys uh, populations and areas, and they take resources and en enrich themselves in the center. It is so awful, you know? You know, if we go into this discussion of what is Russian, we, it will, will be very difficult to define it, you know? Uh, and so I think, um, they are selling this story that, you know, oh, poor Russia is misunderstood or poor Russia is threatened. Um, but in fact, it's just the culture which has been, you know, which has been run by a small group of people in the center. And, you know, they call it the great Russia culture, great Russia and talking about journalists and movies and uh, uh, writers. But I think it's fair to also add to that culture everything they do uh, on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. You know, they killed up to 70,000 people in Mariupol out of 400,000 people. And that's industrial scale. It takes tens of thousands of soldiers and officers to give orders to kill that many civilians. I'm going to post pictures later today from the second and third war of the day of the war, where you see how many you know, mass graves uh, Ukrainians had to put people because people were being civilians were being killed, you know, in thousands by the Russian troops. That's a part of culture. Why are we not talking about this great culture? So, so in that sense, I think there is a, is, is a I, I think these labels are just simply misproductive or non-productive. I think the right way to think is that there is a human being and this human being values individual life or doesn't value individual life. And I think we do in Ukraine. And, you know, uh, I, I wanna, along those lines in terms of, uh, valuing lives, preserving lives, and thinking about the future. The issue, and, and also considering what you've said about very simplistic narratives coming out of uh, you know, the international community, and especially Washington sometimes, I want to talk a little bit about reconstruction efforts. And I know it's something that you've been very much involved in at the Kiev School of Economics. Um, and Natalia Shapoval, who can't be with us today because she's doing some very important high level uh, briefings there in Washington, uh, world class expert on, I think, the expert on, on issues of reconstruction in Ukraine. I, I'm very concerned about you know, some of the rhetoric that we hear coming out of Washington about reconstruction and all the aid. And yes, it's a lot of money. 
Uh, my concern after having spent many years working on these issues in other countries is that uh, donor funds that are intended to support Ukraine often don't get to Ukrainians. They're channeled through myriad U.S. contractors who often don't have very good knowledge or experience in these countries who make decisions about what should happen in Ukraine you know, using they have vast resources in front of them, um, yet they have budgets larger than municipalities, for example. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how reconstruction is working and practice in Ukraine. Um, are one of the strengths to me about what we've seen in this past year is the incredible resilience of not just you know, individuals, but also communities and communities working together and the reforms that you and KSE have been so involved in, in stewarding and monitoring over, you know, since 2014 have played such a huge role in this. Can you tell us a little bit about how this reconstruction aid is working with local institutions or existing Ukrainian institutions? It's... Um... It's very diverse. Of course, there is the IFIs, international financial institutions. There is the government support. There is international government, other governments, foreign governments uh, providing international support to Ukraine. Um, there are contractors coming out from outside of Ukraine. Um, some of it is very healthy. Some of this is disgusting in terms of overheads. You know, we can talk about some of the international, um, presumably. Um, humanitarian agencies, which basically are busy uh, not deploying funds. You know, I'll just give you one example in um, at the panel, and I did some time, it's like a fantastic uh, mechanism of matching to get, uh, you know, to raise basically 100 20 or 30 million dollars for schools and they were all the entire panel was about this innovation it was nine months into the war six months eight months into the war and i asked them how many dollars have they deployed so far and they said zero you know they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars and they deployed zero and you know i know of some other organizations which are you know when they ask what are you doing they say oh, we're observing there we, we, we have to document things for future we need to learn from this instead of helping people to survive and then i know another organization has been on the news you know very pr proud and very well um very reputable very well known organization they just bought a, a building you know and put a thousand clerks downtown kiev uh, but i'm not sure they have been deploying that much funding so these organizations you know um are not always very efficient I mean, uh, on the other hand, of course, grassroots company organizations have um, other problems. You know, they often simply don't have the business processes to deliver enough comfort or they have growth pains. You know, the way people are fighting with each other or there's some toxicity. We have been able to avoid this and we are very fortunate at the Kiev School of Economics. You know, we run audits. We, we have, uh, we are, you know, American parental company. We submit reports to the IRS. We get uh, uh, investigate verified and what was the right word you know basically try to be as transparent as uh, humanly possible uh, during the war time and we actually uh, did run half a year audit for the first six months of the war and everyone was looking at us and you're crazy you know during the war you're running an audit good luck finding paperwork you know some of people who we provided support to they have been killed you know how do you get the paperwork you know you do you do you record you have eyewitnesses you do things you have to do it you have to do it to to uh, give uh, donors the comfort. So that's one thing, governance, transparency, accountability, and uh, um, and both international organizations and domestic organizations have to learn to do it. You know, internationals, uh, they err more on the large overheads or inefficient uh, use of funds. So they have to be very clear about how they're using funds and how much of what they have collected has been deployed. Uh, domestic organizations, uh, they're deploying very quickly, but sometimes it's unclear um, you know, there is no record or something. So they have to learn to be very transparent and very formal about it. Uh, but going down, you know, to the future or down the road, I think it's very important to have the proper benchmarking. And that's the kind of broader point to the reconstruction. How are we going to know that reconstruction is done well? In some sense, it's not so important if it's, uh, it's uh, you know, money stolen or money overcharged. All of it is stolen, you know. 
as far as I'm concerned. It's just a difference between legally and illegally. You know, in fact, if you know if the square meter to rebuild costs one thousand dollars in Ukraine, but there is a fancy company which is very expensive and charges three thousand dollars for that, and two thousand goes to you know some consultants. That's not corruption, but that's a theft. You know. And so I think the key here is to have very proper benchmarking and have very clear audit about the cost per unit, per meter, per square, per something. This is known, this is public, and we need to move discussion away from being it political into very, very technical about how many square meters for this amount of dollars has been built and at which speed at which quality. And I think then if we move towards that, towards benchmarking approach and audits and public re reporting on it, things will be cleaner. And, and I, I just want to be clear about something because it's something I hear quite often in the media here. And I think it should be said very clearly. We see opposition to oversight in Ukraine coming from certain American politicians. But I have never heard any opposition for increased oversight of assistance, of reconstruction assistance coming from Ukrainians. The resistance is political in the United States. And I think, Timothy, what you have just told us is the importance of this for the people of Ukraine. Because I very much worry, from what I've seen in other places, is that Americans will not hold themselves to account for the things that they've done, and Ukrainians will be blamed for a lot of these misdeeds. So Ukraine understands that accountability and everything that you've just talked about, transparency, is something Ukraine wants for its own future. It wants for these reconstruction efforts. It's very important for the battle that it's fighting. So it's not Ukrainians at all that are fighting against this. It is absolutely correct. Uh, we have been open at the level of private companies, at the level of the government. Every time we're accused of something, uh, there is an investigation. We we invite other uh, people, other parties involved. Um, we, are, mm, we are most interested in, in being open about it. Now, you are correct that we have worried that we will be you know perceived. There's a difference between the reality and perception and uh, blame shifting. Now, um, is there corruption? Is there deep state? Is there vested interest? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it more than in Hungary or less? Well, absolutely less. Things which are happening in Hungary are unimaginable. Is corruption um, 10 times less than it was several years ago? Yes, absolutely. But do we have to do more structural reforms uh, to eradicate corruption? Absolutely. For example, we have to do judicial. We have to continue with the uh, political finance reform. We have to legalize lobbying. We have to do a lot of things so to make sure that the political system is transparent and accountable about how you know, financing happens. Now, um, do we take a preemptive, uh, proactive approach? Absolutely. Are the people resistant to it? Yes. We have much people who are much worse than corrupt officials. We have people who are infiltrators and traitors. So there are all kinds of people, and some of them are Ukrainians, like in every war. We catch them, we prosecute them. So essentially, we are fighting two wars. One is uh, with Russia directly in the open war theory, and the other one is domestically. Mm -hmm. with people who have you know been trained or who have become so cynical that they are like Russians. They don't believe in democracy, and they think everything is for sale. And they, they just believe that the world is like them. So unfortunately, these people, um, you know, there's no reasoning with these people. You They have to be arrested and they have to be prosecuted. Are they, uh, you know, are they very, very kind of uh, smart and sneaky about it? Absolutely. But I think they are on defense. And the, the recent two scandals show that um, people get arrested, get prosecuted on just perception of imp impropriety. Because the last two scandals, which were in the news on the Ministry of Defense, on the infrastructure, um, on original development, the money has not been changed uh, hands. There has been attempt to sign certain contracts. These contracts were perceived to be unfair, and people got fired immediately, and some of them got prosecuted in no time. Um, and uh, um, this is very different from, let's say, 10 years ago or eight years ago in 2014, when um, the uh, that pr Russian proxy, President Yanukovych, 
um, essentially after he fled Ukraine, he sh- it became known to people how much luxury he had. He had this crazy zoo. He had this uh, crazy um, golden bread. Uh, and so at that point, people were really uh, upset because it was so unjust. But today, people are not upset. People are furious, and it's very instrumental. People understand that every dollar or every Ukrainian hryvna, which doesn't get to the budget or doesn't get to, to you know, it gets to in someone's pocket, this is hryvna which is stolen from the defense effort. It means fewer, you know, less muni- uh, munitions, less weapons, means more people die. So people today understand the value of institutions very, very uh, pragmatically, very, very instrumentally. Uh, and um, there's very le- little tolerance for corruption today. Great. So on that note, uh, Timothy, we our time is up, believe it or not. It's wonderful to see you. Um, for those who don't know, Timothy and I went to graduate school together like more than 20 years ago. We serendipitously both ended up as faculty members at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, you, I'm going to cry. You and, and Natalia are like family to me. Um, our kids, they say hello to you. They miss you very much. You're like family. Um, we just can't wait till all of this is over and we can see each other in peace again. Thank you, Timothy. Just Thank an you. honor to have you here. Um, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. And so now that uh, we finish this conversation with Professor Milovanov, it is a huge honor to introduce to you uh, Ambassador William Taylor, who is the Vice President of Europe and Russia at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, in 2019, he was chargé at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev and was the ambassador to Ukraine from 2006 to 2009. Uh, he's overseen a lot of uh, U.S. foreign assistance, so that perhaps that last comment I made on foreign aid, he could say something about. And Ambassador Taylor, you may not remember this, but sometime in the 1990s, we schlepped in a car across the Fergana Valley for about a week when I was with USAID. Uh, it was a long time ago, and no reason to remember that. So uh, without further ado, the floor is yours. Well, Jennifer, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for for having me. This is a great thing you all are doing. Um, uh, this is an important day. It's a grim day, but it uh, it, it can be a hopeful day. Um, it's a day to re- reaffirm our determination and to listen to the determination of the Ukrainians. Um, as you've just heard from the minister, um, uh, the Ukrainians more than anyone want peace. The Ukrainians want, more than anyone want to be sure that the assistance goes to the right place. The Ukrainians want more than anyone for the weapons to get into the hands of their soldiers. Um, so this is, a, this is a day of determination, um, a day looking forward. Um, my message, Jennifer, is one of, uh, of possibility. Um, I firmly believe, um, as do as every Ukrainian who I'm whom I've talked to uh, has reaffirmed, that Ukraine will win this war. Um, Ukraine will win this war. There, and I believe Ukraine will win this war this year. Um, I think there is a real chance um, that the preparations that are now underway, well underway, um, to to form new Ukrainian military units, army units, with some of this equipment uh, that has been long time coming, uh, but is now arriving, in particular, these uh, Leopard tanks from from Europeans, the the American tanks will be later, uh, but the European tanks are there, the the other weapons from, from the United States and other NATO nations are enabling these new units, these new Ukrainian units, to prepare to break through. And I, I do believe that this breakthrough will happen, can happen and, and will happen in the next several months. Um, and that could do exactly what President Zelensky is talking about. And that is end this war this year. Um, uh, the Russians are, are fragile. The Russian military is fragile. Um, and the Ukrainians are determined. The Ukrainians will not will never stop fighting. It's up to us here in the West. It's up to us at NATO. It's up to us in the United States. It's up to us in Europe um, to support them. 
um, with the finance, with the reconstruction assistance when that comes, but in the first instance right now with the military assistance. So I, I am uh, uh, in awe of the, of the Ukrainian determination. Um, I believe in them. Um, I think the United States government believes in them. Um, and I am sure this year that, that they will win. And Jeff, I'd be glad to have a conversation with you or our other friends of ours that are on, the, on this call. Um, but I remember that trek across the, uh, the Pagano Valley. Uh, that was, you know, uh, that was an interesting time that we had there. Uh, who, who could have thought that we'd, we'd be here? Yeah, right. and so along those lines, you've spent so much of your career uh, as, you know, coordinating U.S. assistance. And I'm wondering, uh, so your, your expertise in this is unparalleled. And you've seen some of the great successes the United States has had in this area, but you've also seen some of the challenges. And uh, you know, I've I've spent most of my career working on Central Asia, Afghanistan. You know, also have done uh, some work in Ukraine. But I'm very very concerned about the reconstruction effort, not because of uh, Ukrainian capabilities. I'm very worried about us, the United States, and the the ability of the United States to police itself, to um, develop develop uh, to deliver this aid effectively without actually blaming the Ukrainians for our misdeeds. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more, tell us something, uh, how you think this is different, how the United States might be managing this different, um, might, managing this differently. What lessons has the United States learned from its past missteps? So two things. Um, on the reconstruction, which is a going to be a major challenge, uh, but a major opportunity uh, to, to build a, a Ukraine that is, uh, that is uh, more modern than, than it was when, when this war started. Uh, so there's an opportunity, to, always an opportunity to build. Um, first question is, where's the money gonna come from? Um, estimates we've seen go from what, 300 million, 500 million, a trillion dollars over time to, for this reconstruction. Um, in, in my view, one of the things that we all need to be focused on um, is, Russian central bank reserves. Um, there are $300 billion um, frozen. Russian dollars, Russian rubles, Russian gold, Russian assets, uh, central bank assets, Russian that are frozen in G7 banks. They're not even in Russia. They're in G7 banks um, and they're frozen. The question is how to move that frozen asset uh, from the banks into some kind of a fund, some kind of internationally administered fund uh, that will allow firms and governments, uh, in particular the Ukrainian government, to move forward on reconstruction. Uh, so uh, each nation, the United States has, uh, there's a, uh, roughly $440 billion of that 300 is in the United States. And there's another 60 billion in, I don't know, France um, and Germany. Um, uh, each nation is, has got to figure out uh, the legal mechanism for getting that money from the, that's frozen in their own banks um, and get them into this international fund. And then Jennifer, that gets to your second question about how to, how to organize um, that, that reconstruction effort. Um, if there is this, this fund of 300 billion to start of Russian money that goes, that should go to, by, by all rights, the Russians owe reparations um, uh, to the Ukrainians uh, to, to reconstruct. Um, so building on that $300 billion, $300 billion um, where's the rest of the money going to come from? Well, it's going to come from international development banks, it's going to come from bilateral, it's going to come from uh, around the world. That, that's going to come. And then how, your question, how is it organized? What we learned, uh, you and I have learned, we've, a lot of people who have done good and bad assistance, um, we've learned that in this case, Ukrainians know best how to use those funds. Um, it's not gonna be the Americans that are coming in and tell the Ukrainians what to do or how to build or how to reconstruct. Um, it's, it's not gonna be the Europeans, it's gonna be the Ukrainians that have the lead. They know their country best. Uh, they know what needs to be done. Uh, they know what kinds of things are gonna work, what they need to rebuild, what they need not to rebuild. Well, how can they move forward? That, was a lesson we should have learned a long time ago. It seems obvious, 
um, it apparently wasn't so obvious. We thought we knew better um, and we don't, and we didn't. Um, so, so the question then is how to organize that international organization um, that is gonna oversee and coordinate and direct and allocate those that 300 billion in the first instance and more after that, um, how to organize that. And if it's uh, one of the co-chairs of the leaders of that organization has to be Ukraine. It has to be the prime minister or it has to be uh, Minister uh, Milovanov um, or, or it has to be a senior Ukrainian um, who, who can guide that fund in the in the right direction, and then on the other side, uh, another the other co-chair, if it's a if it's kind of dual chaired, uh, could be the could be the European Union, it could be the World Bank, um, it it could be so, the Americans could do it, um, but it needs to be co-chaired by the Ukrainians in the first instance. That's the big lesson, Jennifer. It seems to me from the mistakes we've made in the past. Great. So uh, a question here. Um... Uh, here from the audience. And of course, as soon as I touch my screen, it goes away. A question from Hillary. Uh, do you have any concerns about the broader longer term consequences in terms of the credibility of the West or Western financial infrastructure if central, aid, uh, central bank reserves are confiscated? So international law um, and all domestic law um, around the world um, uh, gives great credence, great protection to individual property rights. You know, that's the basic of uh, a, a fundamental aspect of, uh, of a market economy. Mar uh, property rights are, are important and, and can be defended, should be defended. So that's why I emphasize the central bank reserves. And I'll come, I think I'll come to Hillary, if I understand Hillary's question, I'm gonna to come to that. But we're not talking about money. We're not talking about a lot of money that comes from oligarchs. I mean, yeah, we could go after oligarch money, um, but the oligarchs, you know, it's, it, it, it is their money. We're gonna go after it. It's their yachts. We're gonna go after them. Um, but they've got lawyers, and there are there are these protections for for property rights, and which we should respect. But there are reasons to take that take that money from them, take those those yachts from them if they if they are criminal, um, and if they've supported this war, uh, then they've given up their rights to that. But it's going to take a, it's going to take a, a legal effort to get that money. And it turns out that the oligarch money, the, all the yachts that are out there, not that much. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. That's real money. But the big money, the big money is in the central bank, the Russian central bank reserve that I just mentioned. That's the 300 billion. Um, and that doesn't belong to any oligarch. It doesn't belong to any person. It belongs to the regime. It belongs to the Russian government. And the Russian government is, is, is the entity responsible for this war. It's President Putin who's responsible for this war. It's the Russian government that owes reparations to the Ukrainians. And so that is much easier to, and legally um, to be able to move that money from its frozen status into seized status and then into this, into this fund. Now, if I understand Hillary's question, I've heard this concern uh, that if we were to un, if we were to take that frozen money, central bank reserves, um, seize it, legally seize it, and then put it into this international fund managed by the World Bank, uh, overseen by this uh, dual-hatted organization, um, if we were to do that, then people might say, uh, other nations might say, well, you know, we're going to be hesitant to put our money. Um, in G7 banks, in American banks, or in Japanese banks, or in French banks, um, because it might be confiscated. Well, my advice to those nations who are considering that is don't invade your neighbor. Don't invade your neighbor. If you invade your neighbor, yeah, you, you could be vulnerable to having mm -hmm. your, your central bank reserves confiscated, frozen, seized, and, and, and used as reparation. So I think this is so obvious um, this 300 billion is so obvious um, what it should be used for um, that there is no question in my mind, but we should go forward on that. Okay, last question, and you've got a minute. So you ready? 
Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So what would a peace settlement to end the war look like? And is that still possible with, with Putin in the Kremlin? In one minute. <laughs> it is of course possible. It is of course possible. Um, and it will come. It will come um, when Putin in the Kremlin uh, realizes that he can't win. That is when the Ukrainians push the Russians out of their country. They push the Russians out of Donbass. They push the Russians all the way back into Russia. All the military forces, at least in Donbass, are pushed back in, back into Russia. And at that point, at that point, when he has clearly lost and he knows he cannot win on the battlefield, President Putin or his successor, whoever that may be, uh, will come to the Ukrainians and say, let's sit down and talk. That's how that's how this war will end. I'm muted. So on that very hopeful note, um, I just want to thank you, Ambassador Taylor, for spending your time here with us today and uh, let this war end by the end of this year, as you have hopefully predicted. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, Jennifer. Good, glad to be here. Thank you. OK, so next up, we have uh, Professor Hillary Apple. Uh, she is the Podlick Family Professor of Government and George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College. Professor Apple's published numerous books and articles, which I'm not going to detail here, uh, but a uh, real uh, incredible expert on, um, on this part of the world, on post-communist countries. And um, we're delighted to have you with us today. So, Professor Apple, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for being part of this ukraine -athon. So I have a short amount of time to talk about what this war means in terms of the global context with a special focus on the BRICS, but I only have a little bit of time, it turns out. And so I will be pretty quick uh, trying to give some information, but as you probably noticed in the last week, there have been uh, a lot of articles in major newspapers, outlets focusing on the global context of this war and even this really, impressive piece yesterday, big piece in the New York Times, trying to map out how different countries have responded to this war. Well, you know, a lot has been happening, you know, related to the anniversary in terms of media coverage, but also other developments from the BRIC countries, uh, either as part of the United Nations or even individually with China's proposed 12 point uh, peace, plan, peace plan that came out in the last 24 hours. But we know that yesterday the General Assembly um, approved a non-mining resolution that calls for Russia to end hostilities in Ukraine and demands the withdrawal of uh, its forces from Ukraine. But in fact, uh, all of the BRIC countries abstained. Now, this has been a pattern we've seen. They've abstained on the, the previous five uh, resolutions as well, except Brazil, which did support the condemnation in the immediate aftermath, the very first resolution that we saw um, speaking out against the war in Ukraine. But this has been a pattern we've seen in the BRICS, which is to abstain from these votes, not to vote against them, not to have um, a very strong show of support in the United Nations for Russia, but at the same time, using that as an opportunity to try to present themselves as neutral parties or potential arbiters, neutral arbiters in this conflict, rather than joining the West. So what we have seen one year later is that the West remains impressively unified in its um, support for Ukraine's defense of itself with a couple of cracks here and there. I think Hungary is a, a well-noted example that will come up repeatedly in discussions on Europe. But nonetheless, the, the West has remained unified despite uh, uh, soaring energy and food prices, despite some sacrifices revolving around the presence of refugees. And yet there's also been a persistence of neutrality or the lack of support of many countries around the world. Again, especially as we see in terms of the major countries that are part of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So they've been abstaining, they continue to do so. Um, but world leaders in particular, it's not that they, they support the uh, invasion of another country or the violation of sovereignty, as the New York Times article you know, makes very clear. But there is this appreciation for uh, Russia challenging uh, the West and challenging uh, a system in which the West dominates 
for a US-led unipolar world. So I think there's an appeal of this challenge to the West, and it's often uh, being presented almost as an anti-colonial moment, but in fact, it's not because the focus really is on the lack of sovereignty of Ukraine. And I think that is something in terms of the framing of this, this whole war would be very helpful for trying to gain additional uh, support. So we know that this has been um, an issue for different countries. I'm gonna just say a few words about each country in terms of uh, the BRICS where they stand right now. For Brazil, we've seen some evolution with the change of leadership in Brazil. So under Bolsonaro, as I mentioned, uh, there was the willingness to vote in favor of the resolution condemning Russia initially, but uh, he declined to condemn uh, Russia saying that it would remain neutral. And in fact, you know, there was a very interesting statement in terms of Bolsonaro saying that Ukraine should surrender to Russia. And he gave this example of Argentina. How did the war end uh, in the Argentina's war with the United uh, Kingdom over the Falkland Islands is, you know, he said, we regret it that uh, it was required. The truth is that these things hurt, but we must understand it. In other words, you know, it's painful for Ukraine to um, basically um, surrender, but this is how the war would end. Now, this is a leader that's been a little bit more, um, I guess I would say, uh, mixed in its response. But Lula has, during the campaign, been strongly pro-Russian. You know, he said Zelensky wanted this war, he said in the, ca the campaign. Otherwise, he would have negotiated more if he didn't want war. And I've heard this uh, question posed to me in interviews uh, from journalists outside the United States. So there's this idea that Zelensky wants this war and won't negotiate. And Brazil is taking this position under um, Lula. So, you know, the, he says the president of Ukraine is as responsible as Putin is. Um, so since he's been elected, he's been somewhat more restrained. But you have to recognize that Brazil is dependent upon Russia. It's dependent upon Russian um, investment for its energy sector, for fertilizers, for agricultural sector generally, and for food. So um, it's not that surprising in a way that Brazil continues to um, try to, to not fall out of favor with Russia. It, impo it imports 25% of its fertilizers from Russia, and it does. it is courting investment right now, specifically in its energy sector. And in, in imports have actually gone up quite a lot in the past year. Uh, just quickly moving on to India. India has also been a country that tries to remain uh, neutral. It tries to continue to present itself in this way, occasionally uh, uh, defying the West in certain important respects. Cer certainly it's not respecting the $60 cap on oil, but it is also increasing its import of oil, saying that you know we are going to import oil from the place where we can get the best uh, terms and our companies, we're not telling them to import oil from Russia. We're just letting them do what they need to do. We are not in the position to uh, make enemies in a world uh, where we need to advance our own economic uh, growth and uh, different kinds of other geopolitical considerations. Certainly, Modi, though, has made it very clear that he does not support the saber rattling that includes rhetoric about the use of nuclear weapons. And so this has been a helpful development, uh, maybe not particularly consequential, but nonetheless helpful in making it clear that he opposes this language that's been used by Putin. And something else that happened following Modi was, was hearing from President Xi in China making it clear that the saber rattling around nuclear weapons is not considered acceptable to these two countries as they continue to indirectly fund this war by buying up Russian exports in significant uh, amounts. So why is India taking this position? Well, it also uh, has important trade relations, in particular in the area of weapons. It is highly dependent upon Russian weapons. Um, 85% of its major weapons are Russian in origin, but also um, it has security concerns vis-a-vis -vis China and Pakistan. So in this sense, you know, having better relations with Russia might in some ways at least hope, you know, leading toward uh, maybe helping prevent Russia from deepening its ties too much with China and Pakistan uh, countries that it does have certain uh, strategic and border concerns uh, with. And also Russia has been a longtime supporter of India's claims, uh, territorial claims 
in Jammu and also Kashmir. So this is, in a sense, flows quite naturally. Again, just a word or two about South Africa, um, because my time is short today. But South Africa also takes the position that it's impartial, that it supports diplomacy. Uh, it continues to abstain from the beginning on these resolutions that are condemning uh, Russia or you know, calling for the withdrawal of troops. Um, South African president has blamed NATO and NATO enlargement for the war um, and resists any kind of direct condemnation of President Putin. And as you are probably seeing, uh, has decided to participate this very week in military exercises with Russia and China. But these are somewhat um, signals or symbolic because it includes about 350 South African soldiers who are training alongside the Russians and the Chinese uh, and the Russians in much greater numbers. Uh, but why is South Africa taking this position? Again, this does go back to this anti-colonial uh, uh, characterization of the position, which does see Russia as and, and the Soviet Union as having supported the um, African National Congress and South Africa in its efforts to rid itself of apartheid. So there is some sense of uh, historical ties that play into this. Finally, just a word or two on China. This is something that I've been writing about for uh, Ponars for a few years now. Uh, and there is some, some work on this, but China continues to try to have this position or, or the stated position of being a neutral arbiter. I would say its main support for Russia remains in the realm of rhetoric. Certainly its media is very supportive. It parrots the kinds of explanations that Russia has given for the war, which are connected to its own security considerations and also connected to NATO enlargement. So it does parrot those kinds of justifications. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, it has made clear that, that using strategic nuclear, sorry, um, tactical nuclear weapons or the threat to use tactical nuclear weapons is unacceptable to China. China did offer a peace plan in the last day or so, the last um, day and a half, and this peace plan does call for a ceasefire, but it also calls for the end of sanctions. Um, and it does uh, believe that the sanction regime has deepened the crisis. So um, there's more I could say about this, but I think I should leave it there with just a few minutes to respond to any questions about particular countries or you know, broader ideas about why this message uh, that the West would really benefit from, from you know, providing, which is this is a invasion of one country of another and the violation of the territorial integrity of a country in direct violation of the United Nations and international law has not caught on as much as this is a moment of challenging the West of, and, you know, endorsement of multipolarity and a moment of essentially uh, pushing back on countries that are associated directly with periods of uh, colonialism. Uh, so that was that was extremely illuminating. You covered such uh, breadth and depth there in such a short period of time. And I want the audience to know that uh, Professor Apple's presentation was cut short by the surprise appearance of Ambassador Taylor. And she was uh, kind enough to donate her time uh, to his platform. So thank you so much for that. Um, I just have a very brief question for you about the prospect that the relationship between China and Russia. Uh, you know, we've seen in recent days China's, you, you know, talk of, of, of a peace agreement, uh, peace proposal coming from China. I think with, with China, it's almost like we could, it's this relationship where you can see what you want to see from it. In some aspects, China has held back. It has not given Russia weapons. Um, I think Russia really expected much more from China. On the other hand, uh, you know, China... Uh, clearly has, has uh, aligned itself uh, with Russia in this particular endeavor, not, not uh, actively in, in sort of uh, any public participation, but I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, about where you see that relationship going, um, and do you see China as playing the spoiler here? Uh, if China makes a decisive effort to enter or provide weapons on the side of Russia, do you think that could tip the war? I think that would be very significant. And that's why the US in the last days have, has been warning very strongly that any intelligence showing this is very worrisome because one of the issues in terms of Russia's ability to continue to prosecute the war is its access to ammunition. Now, this is an issue for the West as well. We are you know, absolutely depleting our stockpiles of ammunition, but 
so is Russia, certainly. And if Russia could have greater reliance on direct support of um, munitions from China, this, this could make an important difference for how costly this war is and how able Russia is to continue uh, for some time. So that is really important. That's why the US is being explicit. It's a different approach, but very explicit in terms of saying its intelligence shows that this is something being considered. What I did show in uh, this Ponar's memo was trying to, to indicate through data that formal material support for Russia in terms of military or trade has been quite limited. Um, you know, it depends on the sectors, but for the most part, it really is related to areas like energy. Uh, but then again, that isn't a violation, in fact, of the sanctions, because not even Europe was able to rid itself immediately from its dependence on energy, even if we can be pretty heartened by how much independence has grown in recent months. So yes, that is significant. It's something to watch. The other thing just to take into consideration, is we don't know how much indirect support is going through other countries from China. There is some indication that it's coming through Central Asian countries. So we do need to pay attention to the flow of dual use goods, uh, semiconductors, but the munitions themselves, I think that's something that would be a, a new development if we see China decide to, to be more willing to take on the risk and materially support Russia's war effort in this way. Great, thank you so much. We hit two o'clock right on the spot. Well, two o'clock Eastern time, I think you're in California, so it's a bit earlier on your side. Just wanna thank you so much uh, for participating this afternoon or this morning on your side, wherever you are around the world. Um, uh, just thank you for that in incredible intervention. And once again, thanks for allowing, uh, you know, cutting your time short for uh, Ambassador Taylor. And at this point, I am handing the mic off to someone, Christina Hook. And Lauren McCarthy. Hello, Lauren. Uh, good to see you. Um, and thanks to our friends at Ponars uh, for organizing such an important event. Uh, thanks to all of you. And on that note, I'm signing off. Wonderful to see everybody here for ukraine -a -thon. And now the uh, mic has been passed to me to um, thank you, Jen, very much for your previous hosting. Nice to see you. Nice to see everybody here. Um, I'm so delighted to be hosting a session of the ukraine -a -thon for the second year in a row and to have such incredible people to host for. Um, so I want to start by introducing our first speaker, Christina Hook, who is Assistant Professor of Conflict Management at Kennesaw State University's School of Conflict Management, Peace Building and Development. And today, Christina will be talking to us um, about From Stalin to Putin, Understanding Past and Present Genocides in Ukraine. So without further ado, Christina, take it away. Thank you so much, Lauren. It is truly my pleasure to be here and um, kudos to our organizers for this great 24 hours. So just a bit of word about my background really sets up this topic pretty well. Um, by training, I'm a comparative genocide scholar. I've been in the field about 15 years. I started out in advocacy going back to Darfur, then I was a policy advisor working on cases like Syria and the Islamic State. And then I went back to academia where my disciplinary training is in anthropology. So um, that means that I moved to Ukraine um, in 2015 and began doing long-term field work there, living there multiple years since that first year of the armed conflict. And I bring that up because I, I went there to talk to um, people who were trying to shape Ukrainian public opinion, everything from education to commemoration to art, um, politics and everything in between, just about national identity. I wanted to speak with them about the Ukrainian Holodomor. At the time, I didn't know that much. And so I wanted to learn what Ukrainians thought about this chapter of their 1930s history and how they thought it might influence the country today. So I really thought that my conversation about this, this atrocious event, this event that about four and a half million Ukrainians 18 months um, in 1932, I really thought that any conversations of genocide that we might be having were going to be something in the past. Um, 
And I won't center my remarks on this, but this past year has, has really tragically had me writing on genocide in the present. So looking and understanding from my academic background about the Russia's current war um, and their attempt to erase Ukraine as a targeted genocide against the Ukrainian national community. Um, but that's not why I'd gone to Ukraine. I'd gone to talk about the past. And so this past year has also been this kind of um, you know, I think horrific undertones for some of us who know the history of the region, who know the history of Ukraine. Um, I was having a conversation with another colleague, and, you know, we were just looking at things earlier in the year, like the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, um, looking at the Russian military being on the presence of the Chernobyl plant earlier last year, and, and looking at, at somehow as if we'd fallen down the rabbit hole into the 1980s, or we had looked at you know, some of the targeting of, of Ukrainian regional and local leaders and felt like we'd fallen down this dark rabbit hole to the 1940s. And then again, of course, with the food um, security issues, with everything we've seen with, with Russia looting or blocking Ukrainian grain or just destroying it, that was really bringing back some of those dark undertones that the conversations that I had had with Ukrainians so I wanted to talk about that a little bit today. Um, so, you know, it was really, um, really a sort of a learning process for me when I went to Ukraine, asking Ukrainians about these events. It was also a learning process because for a long time, there weren't as many documents available on the Holodomor. They were there, but there were just these recent uh, waves of declassification of documents. And so it allowed us to understand the famine better. It allowed someone like me, who is not a historian, that I really, I really appreciate the work of historians. They do a lot that I'm reliant on. They, they do these incredible historiographies. But someone like me looks at documents and we look for, for things like genocidal intent. Um, and so as I began to understand the Holodomor, I was obviously also learning a lot about its social context. And there, that for me is why I think it's so important to talk about the Holodomor under Stalin, as well as what's happening today. So the Russian invasion of Ukraine it was sort of bringing back these memories of earlier attempts by the Kremlin to extinguish Ukrainian statehood aspirations and to crush the country. Um, it was just offering these kind of alarming parallels. As I got to learn about the Holodomor, there's obviously a focus on food, on grain, um, but for a genocide scholar like me, we pay a little bit less attention to the method of violence and more about the intent. And what, what I noticed when I was looking at the documents myself, when I was interviewing experts, when I was looking at the historiographies, is that it was really tracing back to this idea that Stalin was threatened by this prosperous, um, independent-minded Ukrainian national community at that point, not a state, but a national community. Um, when you look back at, at historians like George Lieber, they looked at how 30% of all of the rebellions, the peasant rebellions to collectivization were happening in the Soviet Union, about 30% in modern Ukraine. And so it was really this, um, this social process, this very, very harsh and murderous reaction to those aspirations um, for, for Ukrainian independence, for desires to have private property. And if you're like me and you've just been sort of reliving where we were a year ago, I've seen a lot of things where Ukrainians talk about, I am on my land, I have a right to defend this. And so that's not that different, actually. It's through the sort of veil of history, but it's not that different than what people were talking about during collectivization, their right to be on their land, to have their private property and things like that. Um, and so I think that it's really important. And I think, you know, you, you want to be careful. I probably have my historian colleagues on the call and you want to be careful with these sort of historical parallels. But, but when we're seeing the type of, of pattern violence today that also fits genocide, um, when I have my research that shows that the Holodomor was a targeted genocide, we want to also be willing to have those conversations and to say that that this should really shape um, both what we might expect Putin to do if he truly is operating from a genocidal logic, but also understand that there are these older patterns of violence that were targeting Ukrainians in the past, and um, and we've got to be we've got to be aware of that. We've got to to not fall into the trap of these kind of more simplistic arguments about this being only Putin's war, but really understand the importance of history, um, the importance of, of Ukraine being targeted in an eerily similar way in the past. 
Um, so with that, I'd love to use my time to, to engage in conversation with the group or to answer any questions. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn things over to you, Lauren. Well, I don't see any questions popping up quite yet in the chat, but I am happy to ask some. Um, I think this is a really fascinating project, and I appreciate the, the parallels that you're able to draw between um, the Holodomor and the current uh, Russian invasion. And something that really strikes me, and that I'm just curious to hear about your research, um, this is really only a few generations removed from uh, present-day Ukraine. And so I am interested about how uh, you, and I, I don't know how much interviewing and talking to folks that you've done since the war began, but at the time that you were doing your research, how did people see the history of the Holodomor? Did, how did it sort of shape their worldviews? Um, I'm really, as an anthropologist, I'm just super curious to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren, for that. So I have been talking with Ukrainian colleagues um, every day since then. I structured my research project to talk with four major groups of people in Ukraine. So people working in the political realm, mainly politicians, people working in the legal realm, uh, everything from legislators to lawyers, people working in civil society. And there I, I, I conceived of this very broadly. And then people working in academia. And, you know, what surprised me the most was I picked those four categories as a genocide scholar. I've been in three of those categories myself, activism, policy, and research. And we often fight a lot in those categories, just about our kind of operational working definition and our understanding of genocide. It's complicated. It's an emotional word. Um, but when I went to Ukraine in 2015 and I began to speak with these people, what really clued me in and what really drove my concern about the war escalating as it did last year um, was the fact that there was so much agreement around very, very different Ukrainians. And I think a lot of us know Ukraine. I always you know, say in my writings, I call it a lively divided political context, which it is. I love the political debates. I loved living in Kyiv for this, but there's lots of disagreement around things. And there's also generational gaps, including kind of a gap between the oldest generation who maybe spent significant part of their career in the, in the Soviet days, and then the young generation that was born um, who never experienced the Soviet Union. So in my interviewing, I interviewed eight year uh, gap. So early 20s to 90s. Um, so people who were impacted by the Holodomor down to those, you know, who had no experience with even the Soviet Union at all. And when I found this, this level of agreement just about people who actively thought about the Holodomor and how that I think gave them some insight into things to watch out for from Moscow, the seat of power next door, I was really surprised. Um, Lauren, I didn't prepare for this question, but I, I almost did in an indirect way because I did bring one quote. I wanted to read um, for the group just one short excerpt. This is the very first interview I ever did in Ukraine. I told you I started working there in 2015, and I did an interview at Ukraine's National Holodomor Genocide Museum in Kyiv, and this is the, the first thing that I was told in Ukraine back then. She's, she told me, this was the museum curator, and she told me, I am a child of independent Ukraine, so born after the Soviet Union. And then she said, quote, the Russian occupation of Crimea and the war in Eastern Ukraine were so unexpected for me. But when I remembered the history of the Holodomor, I understood that Ukrainians should have foreseen this. What is now happening in Donbass and Crimea is not the end of Russian encroachments towards Ukraine. Today, the Russian president denies the fact of the Holodomor as a genocide. Actually, he denies the existence of the Ukrainian nation. And then she went on to talk about how she felt that there was this, this threatening language coming from Moscow then that was um, saying that Ukraine didn't have its own unique heritage, history, culture. And of course she turned out to be right. And so um, I think sometimes the scholars were, were always interested in the ways that people disagree with each other. But what Ukraine really showed me was that there was a, a the sense of, of existential threat perception that was driving agreement between people that might be professional rivals in other places who might have very different personalities. I worked in 32 different regions in Ukraine. So I lived in Kyiv, but I did interviewing all around, getting to know Ukraine's sort of regional divides pretty well. And the fact that there was so much concern around this um, really drove my research and drove my fear and my concern that what might happen would happen. 
Thank you. It sounds like such amazing research. Um, so we do have a question that has just come in from the Q&A from Ron Bookbinder, um, which says, thank you for your excellent presentation. Do you think that Putin's current genocidal, in parentheses, war against Ukraine reinforces international acceptance of the Holodomor as a genocide? Mm, that's a great question. So, you know, for me, like, I'm a, I'm a scholar. I wish that all, that our topics could just sort of exist in the realm without politicking, but I did notice that there was a lot more willingness this year to listen um, to, to conversations about the Holodomor. I did notice that there were a lot more declarations by, at different governments, and you know, I think that, like as I said, we sort of wish that our work didn't exist in um, in a context of politics, but it always does, and it actually always has with the Holodomor as well. So one of the sources of primary source interviewing that's so important for this case was um, the, the commission that happened in the US, the James Mace Commission that happened with the US Congress under the administration of Ronald Reagan. And so this investigation and this long-term multi-year interviewing project with Holodomor survivors who had come to North America um, turned out to be really, really important for our research because a lot of those people just due to their age at the time were no longer with us by the time I began my work. And so of course it happened in a context of politics where um, you know, perhaps talking about communism and, and its ills and its evils was politically favorable in the 1980s U.S. context, it still was very, very important for very straight baseline um, understandings of this case. And so for me, I've, I've published peer-reviewed research in journals in my field, like Genocide Studies and Prevention, where I sort of just go through empirically through those records, and I put the Holodomor in conversation with genocide research, and I argue that it is a genocide now. Of course, like I, I welcome you know pushback and feedback on that, but, but I think that it fits the case. It fits the case that I've approached cases around the world throughout my career. And so for me, when I watched all of this recognition happening, it was bittersweet. I wish that it had happened much sooner, um, but just because it's happening in a context where other political dimensions are allowing this truth to be recognized doesn't mean that it's still not the truth. Um, so, so I was really pleased to see that. I, I think that a lot of us are having conversations too about um, Ukrainian voices and making sure that they're heard. Um, and these questions of, some of these warnings hurt big parts of lots of our work. So um, the whole humor for me is, is a part of that. Um, people were, were using that to, to talk to me about how they felt about the contemporary political and geopolitical environment with Russia. Great, thank you. Um, so I was actually hoping, uh, to draw a little bit on your, your position as a scholar of genocide, which is obviously the most depressing kind of scholar to be. Uh, but um, you spoke a lot about genocidal intent and how you were able to uncover that in the documents about the Holodomor. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about genocidal intent so that those of us who, who are not steeped in that particular world can really understand and sort of make make conclusions about what we see going on um, in the contemporary world, as well as thinking back to the Holodomor. Sure, it would be my pleasure. And I just wrote a recent policy memo for PONARS, which is available online. Um, and I've also written a little bit more about situating this case in international law for foreign affairs. So that's out there. Um, but really, you know, the field of, of genocide studies has a lot of debate, which is great. That's how we advance as a field. Um, and some of those debates have to do with the fact that the international law definition for scholarship leaves something to be desired. Um, so it says things like destruction in whole or in part. Well, you know, you've got to sort of figure out what to do with that. Um, and then it also has these different criterias. But over time, genocide scholars have kind of said that it needs to be more narrow or more broad. And it's led to all of these debates. And then it's also a very emotional word for people. You know, there's this history of it connected to the Holocaust. Um, connected to not just the, the systematic massacres of millions of European Jews and other people, but I think also this, this kind of, let's say, loss of innocence. So, for example, there's a lot of work that talks about this emotional connection to genocide because of the role of international media. Um, so cameras being in the Nuremberg trials and in the concentration camps and people really seeing in their living room happening. 
also I said this kind of like loss of, of innocence. I mean, that's a simplification, but what I'm talking about there was this kind of idea that that technology is not always a good thing because it was used to systematically murder millions of people in Europe and um, during World War II. So because of that, genocide can be this kind of emotional word. Um, it can also be a word, as I said, that has a lot of different academic interpretations. But, you know, there are kind of the heroes of my field who do all of these meta, meta of research in the field of genocide. Um, and they found things like, you know, one of them reviewed the seven major volumes that were published in 2007 and said, oh, even genocide scholars are using seven different definitions. So it is a really complex field. But the heroes that do meta review kind of gave us, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel because for over 10 years now, they've been kind of flagging for us that despite all of these disagreements, there are two key areas that genocide scholars tend to agree on, tend to look for. Um, and so those, those questions are who's targeted in, a, in an act of violence and for what purpose? And for here too, I always like to clarify that I care very, very much about cases that are genocide, and I care equally about cases that maybe don't fit that classification. But I think kind of distinguishing between them is, is really appropriate just for the purpose of treating them like a doctor, having that customized reaction, prevention, mitigation plan. Um, but when we're looking at violence that, that might be a genocide and that should be targeted um, for prevention as a genocide, we do look at who is targeted. So for a genocide, it's not just, for example, teenage boys. Teenage boys are targeted, you know, heinously in many wars around the world because they're viewed as, you know, upcoming combatants. In a genocide, you're looking at violence that targets broader than that. We call it unqualified selection. So you think men, women, children. Um, that one's a little bit easier. We still use proxy variables to kind of get at how perpetrators talk about their victims. But the sort of one that you really have to sit with and look at what perpetrators are saying is destruction. And so there, with a genocide, you're trying to tease out, are they trying to destroy a group or are they trying to repress, harm, intimidate, subjugate a group? That's a different type of violence. Again, to me, equally heinous, but just different. So for destruction, you, you look at things, um, and this is actually the, the sort of thing that I do. You look at um, how perpetrators talk about groups in the future. And so do perpetrators talk about that group with having um, existing in the world at all? Even if let's say they're talking about their victims as maybe they're slaves or they're using harmful and disrespectful language, but they're still talking about them existing. Or do they say things like, you know, this group, let's say in this case, if you're a former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, Ukraine won't exist on the map. Or this question of, we can no longer exist on the same planet as Ukraine. There's a lot of language that's going on. And that fits really close to look at is this future orientation. And then you also look at things like pursuit. Because genocide perpetrators tend to um, go to greater lengths, they take on more risk, they take on greater inconvenience to themselves, and they're often willing to pursue victims. So a person who is just seeking to batter, to harm, they might just, let's say, like throw a bomb in a crowded marketplace and run away so that they won't be caught. But a genocide perpetrator, that's not enough for them usually. They're usually pursuing victims. And so earlier in my career, I saw that with the way that the so-called Islamic State, that ISIS, um, was chasing the Yazidi people up a mountain. It's actually hard to do. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. They open themselves up for airstrikes, things like that. Um, and so that was really concerning when I began to see that Russia's behavior was talking about Ukraine not existing in the future and really had an, an in-depth emphasis on controlling the population through um, filtration camps, through stopping people from evacuating um, or preventing them from evacuating or if they were evacuating, going after them. That also reminded me of, of what we saw in the Holodomor. So some of those really significant for me because there's documentation that shows that um, that the Soviet soldiers, the, the authorities, would go to train stations and grab these fleeing peasants in the 1930s from train stations, bring them back to their villages and seal them. And they actually kept records of how many people they would take back. Um, and so when I saw that, it was not only this pattern that, that reminded me of the Holodomor, but it's something that I've seen in more modern cases like the Islamic State. 
So those are just a few examples. There's more than that. That's why I write a lot on it, just sort of get out that full case. But, but those are some of the things, the warning signs, things that were really, really concerning for me that I pay close attention to in both the Holodomor and in what's going on today. Great, thank you. That was really, really interesting. Um, we have a question from Jesse Driscoll, and he's wondering if you think your research might have yielded different results if you'd conducted it before 2013, so before the Maidan, before Crimea, and whether you know the point on consensus that you're making that everybody agrees on this might be a result of changes that have taken place generationally or a result of adaptations to the seizure of Crimea, um, and just reminding us that the parliament barely passed mm -hmm. a law proclaiming the Holodomor a genocide under uh, President Yushchenko, and that others, um, mm -hmm. Yanukovych in particular, had spoken up saying that um, that it was tragic but not a genocide in 2010. Mm -hmm. So curious right. to know how that that moment uh, in Ukrainian history may have altered the responses that you got. These are the best questions. Um, and I spoke with all of those people that you named and talked with them. So in my larger work, I actually use, I look at this narrative of the Holodomor from, from really the late 80s, but really paying attention to modern Ukraine, but kind of the people that I interviewed were, were still influential Soviet Ukrainians before Ukraine was independent. And I actually look at, I, my research revealed that there were three distinct periods. The one is absolutely, as you nailed it, really the change in the Holodomor narrative was because of the revolution of dignity, because of Crimea, because of the war in Donbass. Um, but before that, I, I look at what was happening around the Holodomor narrative in the 1990s, and then also in the 2000s, there was another break. And what I argue in my research is that the Holodomor, this kind of socio-political functions of the Holodomor and the way that people were talking about it, and including in the 2000s, exactly as you're saying, this narrative was really being, I think, um, it was kind of collecting all kinds of other social and political cues about debates that Ukraine was having about its national identity, about its political orientation. And so, yes, that's absolutely my research. The way it was talked about in the 90s was this kind of like in amorphous suffering that people remember that it was bad, but there weren't these questions of who was responsible. It was just, a, it was still kind of hard to talk about. People were still like a little, um, usually sometimes even afraid to talk about it. But when they did, it was no questions of, was it a genocide? There weren't really questions of who was responsible even, it was just suffering. And that really fits what, what Ukraine was experiencing as a nation in the 90s. And then um, as Jesse's great question alludes to, there begins to be these debates around it that map on in my larger research, I'm writing a book on it, but in my larger research, exactly the kind of debates that Ukraine as a, as a nation was having. We have one more question here, um, also from Ron. Mm -hmm. And the question is that whether you see any other genocides occurring today, for example, possibly China and the Uyghurs, mm -hmm. yeah. if you could just comment a little bit on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention it. So I want to, um, so my my expertise is in genocide, and then I, I was focusing on Ukraine. And so, you know, really, unfortunately, my, my expertise really, really overlaps in this case. Um, but I also, I also view what China is doing to the Uyghurs as genocide. I mentioned that briefly as sort of an, an aside in my Ponar's memo, but I talk about, you know, the role of the UN Security Council, where you have one actor that is committing genocide internally against a group within their country, by which I mean China, um, and another group that is committing genocide externally, Russia against Ukraine. But yeah, um, the framework that I suggest is actually in my memo. And as I said, I think that it's very, very, very important that we prevent not just genocide, but also forms of mass atrocities. And so when I suggest this framework, it's really also about preventing and mitigating genocide more effectively and other types of mass atrocities. You know, we should be focusing on those cases as well. And so the type of framework that I suggest, I hope it's helpful for other regional scholars, regional scholars in our region that we are all gathered here to discuss, but also around the world so that we can, we can take on all of these cases. Um, I think for me, one of the, the really hopeful signs last year, one of the things that really kept me going was some of the incredible solidarity we've seen with Ukrainians to people in Syria, to people in Iran. And so sort of on that note, I hope my research is also helpful for scholars that work on other global cases. Thank you. That's um, 
maybe we should leave it on a hopeful note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a genocide scholar, we, you know, we, um, find those, we find those notes of hope because we work in, we work in really hard cases, but I have to say, and like, um, I have to say that this is true for my research in Ukraine, you get to meet really, really brave people. Um, and so that's certainly how I feel about many of the people that I met in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, hopefully some of them are, are here with us right now. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for such an enlightening conversation. Um, I feel so lucky that I was able to ask so many questions as well to learn more about what you're working on. Um, so it is almost 2.30, and I just want to take this opportunity to remind everyone that part of the uh, goal of the ukraine is to encourage some of our audience members to donate, if you're able, to the Kiev School of Economics Humanitarian Aid Campaign for Ukraine, um, and we'll be popping that link in the chat um, in just a moment. Um, and with that, um, I just want to say a great thank you to Christina and that it is time to move on to our next presentation. So thank you so much. Um, our next presenter is Jesse Driscoll, who is the author of the book Ukraine's Unnamed War Before the Russian Invasion of 2022, which turned out to be much more prescient than <laughs> Um, than perhaps you would have intended when you started. Um, Jesse is an associate professor of political science and serves as the chair of the Global Leadership Institute um, at the University of California, San Diego. And so, Jesse, it is the floor is yours. Um, very excited to hear more about your book. It's fantastic. Can you hear me okay? Is my audio coming through? Yes. Um, can I share screen briefly? Is that is that allowed? Um, let me try to do this then. Are you getting, are you getting, getting my- We're getting your notes. You're getting my notes? Oh, that's no good. <laughs> let me see if I can do better than that. Um, Still getting- Yes, there go. yeah, there it is. Okay, so um, the first thing that I want to do, I start, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit sick. Uh, the first thing I want to do is acknowledge the presence on the Zoom call of, um, of Anne. Uh, Anne, can you unmute yourself briefly and just say hello? Um, yes, uh, hi, I'm Ganna Kubenikova, and uh, as I'm called, uh, I used to be uh, the coordinator for the first wave of uh, data collection that uh, Jesse ever made for this book, I guess. So welcome. I wanted to welcome you and I couldn't think of a better opportunity than this seminar to actually just um, introduce you to this community. And, um, and so that's what I'm actually gonna do with your permission. Um, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit for the next, the next five or 10 minutes. Um, and then I'll open up for questions on the book, but it's much less important to me that I answer questions about the book than that I um, I embarrass you. Um, that's and I'm I'm really happy that you could come. So it's nice to see you. Um, this is the first time you and I have actually seen each other since the war began, uh, for some reasons that I'm going to share with with the group. Um, depending, I mean, when I say the war, I mean February 24th, that version of the war, not the the longer war. Um, so I was checking my email in preparation for this. I met I met uh, Anne or Ghana, as she is affectionately known to me, um, in September of 2014 on my second trip to Ukraine. Uh, and I was really new to Ukraine at the time, and I was seeing things uh, through the lens of the cases that I knew well. I didn't speak Ukrainian, um, but I'd spent a lot of time in places where there was a frozen conflict settlement and the UN peacekeeping force or peacemaking force, whatever you want to call it, was essentially Russian led. And so I had written this book that was at the time, it wasn't even in print yet, but I knew it was coming out that was essentially looking at the problem of, okay, so what happens when the UN is Russia? Like what happens when the member of the P5 that is actually doing international law enforcement is the one member of the P5 that none of the other four trust. Like, what does it actually look like? 
And so I knew a lot about Georgia and I learned about Tajikistan, but I didn't know anything about Ukraine. And I was kind of trying to figure things out post Maidan. And um, over the course of the next couple of years, I learned a lot of things about Ukraine with a lot of help from Anne and from her team. So I want to be really specific about that help. Um, I wrote a paper with um, you know a, a number of different a number of different people, only one of whom is listed as the co-author of the paper, Zach Steiner Threckel. But the help that we got from Ukrainians in writing the paper um, involved all of the hard labor of reading through thousands of tweets and trying to sort whether, for instance, the words were being used ironically or not, which is absolutely thankless and the kind of thing that can't be done with machine learning algorithms, no matter how smart the computers are. You have, to actually, <laughs> you have to actually read hundreds of Russian trolls and decide whether they're humans or bots or whether they're using it ironically or non-ironically. And that requires human oversight. And she's one of the people who did it, but she also organized a bunch of other people to do it. She coded changes to Ukrainian party platforms, which allowed me to see how the party of regions as it broke apart could not rebrand itself fast enough to deal with what Poroshenko was doing. I never published a paper with that, with that but the data was very clear. Um, she then subsequently a year later managed a phone bank where we called up many members of the volunteer battalions and got them to actually talk on the phone with us about why they were fighting, who they were, what they wanted, what their insignias looked like, and a number of other things that I think otherwise would um, not exactly be lost to history, but they allowed me to catch up much faster than I otherwise could have on what the volunteer battalions were up to and just how misleading so much of what was being written in the English language space was about these volunteer battalions. So two things that I learned from this exercise was how many of the people we talked to on the phone preferred to speak Russian, even though we would some, you would give them the choice to speak. And a lot of them, um, you know, some of them would start speaking Ukrainian, but speak it with difficulty. And then they just switch back into Russian. And some of them would just say from the beginning, I don't, I'm a Ukrainian, but I speak Russian. Let's just do this in Russian. Um, so the idea that this was a real intra intra Russian fight was made clear to me more clear to me by that data than it otherwise would have been, and a bunch of other things were made clearer to me too by that data collection process. And um, around this time, Dominique Arell was looking at my work, and he and I started writing a serious book together. But I wouldn't have been able to get on Dominique's radar as a serious person at all if it wasn't for having um, ground truth that I did not have and I don't think I could have acquired without help from Ghana and um, and her team. So I I just wanted to say that really directly to you um, and I haven't had the chance to do it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to embarrass you with one story, and then I'm going to say something else, and then we can turn this over to questions. So um, I remember standing uh, in front of my apartment one day. This was a year later. I was there in 2015, uh, and uh, explaining that I had really expected that during the winter between 2014 and 2015, I expected the Russian military was going to, before the Ukraine had had a chance to reconstitute itself, was going to launch a much larger attack and probably turn off the gas and um, probably seize Kiev militarily. And that I, when I had been there in 2014, had I'd been walking around looking at the buildings and I'd had, um, uh, unfortunately in my head, I, I have these models from Abkhazia and these models from Dushanbe. And I'm looking at all these buildings and I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, this whole, I hope that when the Russians come that they spare the downtown because these buildings are so beautiful, it would be so horrible to see them full of bullet holes. And you laughed at me and said, God, that's, I never thought about that once, <laughs> you know, like you, you did. The, um, and it was such a wonderful moment. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you remember it at all, but it was such a, um, uh, such a human connection moment of, of realizing how off my, my model was compared to your baseline assumptions about what was going on. The other is um, last year when 
I emailed you during the war. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I spent most of the last year working um, uh, in the Department of Defense and specifically- You, you I was, hinted. <laughs> yeah, I was working you in the- hinted um, about that. Yeah. I was working on the joint staff. And a result of that is that I had a whole bunch of things that I had to sign that made it very clear that I was not supposed to get on email or on Zoom, or I, certainly I can't call up random people in Ukraine and tell them things like, um, uh, well, I can't, I, I just can't, I just can't do it at all. So when I was on the Ukraine-a-thon last year, I had to give this highly scripted, um, very, very milk toast. Uh, um, conversation where where I, I just had to be extremely careful what I said and didn't say. But I couldn't say anything at all. I couldn't reach out to you or other people that I saw myself in solidarity with because it would have been illegal. And, you know, COVID provided one set of excuses to, um, to not come to Ukraine. But, um, you know, the, the work I was doing last year prevented, you know, for another set of reasons, me reaching out and uh, I I wrote to you anyway because I wanted to make sure you were okay in a couple of in a couple of short reach outs, but I haven't been able to thank you. And as the book did go to print, um, we're not we we changed the subtitle. We 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 didn't know the Russian invasion of 2022 was going to was going to happen uh, when we submitted the manuscript initially, but um, that's that's just good marketing at Cambridge. We didn't change much, you know, because I think the book actually holds up pretty well. Uh, you know, what we submitted was we had to change some things at the in the conclusion, but the conclusion in the subtitle had to, you know, had to change. The book, for the most part, was I think pretty solid going in, and um, and I owe that to you, in large part, to you and your team. A lot of other people are going to be thanked in person at the Association for Nationalities annual meeting in New York, but I know you're probably not going to make it to that. So I wanted to use this opportunity to to say that directly to you. And I'm happy to talk about the book too, if you guys want to hear it, but um, I, I wanted to just give you the floor if you wanted to say anything. I'd like to express my embarrassment that not all of the guys, uh, there were eight of us, including me, could join this, uh, this meeting. Um, it was definitely fun to work with them and I totally uh, attribute all our grassroots beauty to to their work, to their daily dialing uh, volunteer battalions who who were so scared they didn't know how to how to say no to our questions sometimes. So yes, it was a, a hell of an interesting task to do. Um, it has broken my brain in a good way. So, but definitely. Um, broke my brain in terms of good teamwork, which I had uh, thanks to Alex, Julia, Alexander, Irina, Katerina, Olena, Christina. Um, so yeah, it was, um, these were three very sweet and knowledgeable uh, groups of uh, post grads who, who were experimental enough to join me in, in this uh, rather freely structured task. <laughs> oh yes, but uh, two years of uh, doing this uh, were definitely worth it. And I'm happy that we managed to like politically guide this story in a way, guide it to the, the answers this book gives today in 2003. A year after the start of the fourth phase of the war. Yeah. Thank you, Jesse, for the trust. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for this. Yeah. Um, one thing, one last thing I want to say. Um, of course. I was bought on this idea to work with you because I was really scared and so socially awkward to actually say yes straightforwardly. Um, I was attracted by the idea that you first went to people who could collect data, but not like conceptually frame it for you. I think you came with the idea that you don't want to have the expert opinions uh, um, influence uh, the data you want to collect. And this was, really, was rather interesting. It gave me the healthy dose of ambition to, to start and, you know, 
have a voice in this in this story in a way. So yeah. Yeah, if I Akazia helped to do this. Um, <laughs> thanks to Akazia. One of the things I learned the hard way in my early work in graduate school is that my human subjects tend to be much more interesting than academics that write about my human subjects. Uh, and so actually just listening to people as directly as I can I, is, is, the, is, is the way to get it, if you can. Um, now, of course, that can lead to a misleading kind of immersion if you don't have someone like Dominique standing over your shoulder at the end. I would have written an extremely different book if I had just taken um, the data that we collected together and, and rolled with it. But ultimately, here, I'll put this up. This is this is neat. Um, so the book answers these questions. Um, I can come back and like, or at least it asks these questions. And I don't know, you can agree or disagree about whether or not we provide compelling answers to them. But we, we, we try to, to go after these questions. And um, where's, where's, where's my slide? Here, I'll just stop. Um, there, I'm missing the slide I wanted to show, um, but, oh, here it is. There we go, that's the slide I wanted to show. So this is a slide, I've kept the credit up here um, for, uh, Yulia couldn't make it, um, but my graduate student at UCSD, um, a Ukrainian national um, living in California, I believe she's acquired American citizenship by now, but first thing I found out about her was that she was Ukrainian and she um, she had planned to just go back to Ukraine and, and join a volunteer battalion basically, or, or provide emergency medical. Basically she was gonna leave California to go back for the war. And her family convinced her that she should go to graduate school instead and try to learn how to um, how to help Ukraine from California. Um, and so she worked with me. And what we did together uh, is I taught her how to use magical computer languages and like, do the kind of things we can do at UCSD School of Global Policy and Strategy. And we found um, using um, Memory Book, Ukrainian civil society group that I learned about by spending time in Ukraine, um, they provide all of the um, the martyrs, uh, the people who died um, in the volunteer battalions fighting off uh, what they imagined to be, um, you know, a Russian invasion of their country. Uh, this is like how they would describe it. Um, that's how pretty much everyone on our interviews described it. Um, of course, Russians would use different language to describe what they were doing, but who cares, right? These people, as they died, imagined that they were fighting off a Russian invasion. So let's let's call it that. And uh, we have their birthplaces. And you can geocode them and put that in the numerator and then put in the denominator, the uh, overall rayon population. So you can, you can imagine this as like a heat map of all of the mourning Ukrainian parents who remember that their son died. They light a candle every year and remember their son who died um, uh, fighting off the Russian invasion. And what you can see is that it's not an east-west thing. You can just eyeball it. There's nothing econometric here. There's nothing up my sleeve. It's just, it. Just, the data just screams at you. It's the whole country. We put up the dotted line for Novorossiya so that you can see, um, uh, Vladimir Putin's theory was that people within Novorossiya would be, as soon as you just push a domino, the rest will fall, right? We'll, we'll take Crimea and then all of those people in Novorossiya, they'll be dying to fire their guns west. It's like, no. No, there were about as many people living in Novorossiya as anywhere else who were dying or born in Novorossiya anywhere as anywhere else who who were were dying literally to fire their guns east. And um, that's uh, again, I, I didn't know that until Yulia helped me see it. So you and Yulia and like the many Ukrainians who helped me write this book. Uh, you know, just the way that academic co-authorship works, it takes so long to get from, you know, the data collection through the referee process into print. And then at the end of it, it's just my name and Dominique, this French guy's name on the book. And like, you guys are sort of thanked in the beginning, but who 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 reads that stuff anyway? So 
to anybody listening out 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 there uh, is just like really wouldn't have happened without you. So that's that's it. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to happy to to answer them, or I could go back and provide answers to the questions I kind of threw up there before. But the data is more interesting, right? I mean, you're, the time is limited, and a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, we don't have any questions yet, um, but I'm willing to ask one until we get another one, or you can sure, answer sure. the questions that you had for yourself. I'd much rather <laughs> answer your question than than my prescripted nonsense. Um, I mean, this is obvious. This is probably the the broadest and most general question that could be asked. But I am really curious to hear you talk a little bit about what what lessons you took away from studying the war as it was in 2014 that helped you or can help us to better understand the war as it is in 2022. Um. So I think. That's a good question. Let me let me try to answer it with a little bit of of, uh, of an analytic lawyer's dodge. The big surprise to me in 2014, 2015 was how how strong the Ukrainian state and society were. And that's because I carry around, unfortunately, in my in my head and in my heart from looking hard at Tajikistan and Georgia, I carry around model a model of how societies break down. And um, I'm sorry to say that, that that was just part of how I was looking at the case in 2014, 2015. And by the fall of 2015, it was pretty clear to me that... Um, state failure was not happening in Ukraine, right? It just, that was the opposite of the truth. In fact, this state had gotten stronger and the state society linkages had, um, you know, borne fruit that you could begin to see. And this is prior to extensive US and British military training. You know, all of the things that happened for trench warfare that, that did subsequently happen, you know, on in terms of military capability. This was just state society linkage stuff that um, was not, was not so easily visible in say October November of 2014. It was visible by 2015. And so my long way around to answering your your question is um I, I'm real surprised that Russian military intelligence didn't update the way I did. Like I can see in retrospect how they would look and make the mistake that they made in 2014, which is to imagine, you know, or just be optimistic about it. Like, you know, say, listen, if we take Crimea, we will probably end up getting the whole North Shore of the Black Sea for free. So let's just take Crimea real cheap and see what happens, right? I mean, like, I'm not saying that that was necessarily the smartest move in the world. I'm certainly not saying it was legal or anything like that. I'm not excusing it. But from the perspective of military strategy, I can see why that could make sense at the time if you are, you know, ignorant about Ukraine. Okay, I was ignorant about Ukraine, and it's kind of what I was worried about. By 2015, I was no longer so ignorant about Ukraine. And certainly by 2022, um, I was pretty sure that Ukrainians were going to fight, you know, with nails and tongs, you know, they were going to fight really, really hard for every inch. And at that point, we had a lot of different evidence for that. So I was very surprised in 2022 when Putin's uh, strategy revealed itself to basically carry around a lot of 2014 assumptions. So I think I was misled because I assumed that when I updated my understanding and my assessment of the situation, the Russian military must be at least as well informed as I am, so they must have updated too. And I was wrong about that. Um, and we we'll spend a lot of time figuring, you know, academics like me will spend a lot of time pushing around why it was the case that that the Russian military was so misinformed about its own capabilities, but also Ukraine's uh, willingness to resist. Um, it teaches us something that it's taken them so long. And so this is this is the dark part of the, like once you get past just celebrating that, you know, oh, Russia slipped on a banana peel. 
I think the dark side of this is that if it takes Russia so long to learn anything or Russians at the top of their leadership so long to learn anything, it's difficult sometimes to treat them the way we like to treat our adversaries as rational actors that are learning as they go because they're learning so slowly. If they're learning at all, it's, it's hard to know who you're dealing with or it's not to say that Putin's not rational. I think he's very cunning and calculating, but I don't know if he's living in the same information space that we are living in. Earlier today, I heard Fiona Hill say something very wise, as she often does, and it amounted to that. It amounted to saying that we we don't know for certain um, whether the, the Russian people think that they are losing this war. Uh, and um, there are a lot of Russians who clearly don't think that they're losing this war. And how many people in Putin's leadership are among the many Russians who, who have that characteristic? We, we just don't know. I certainly don't know. So that's a tough one. That answer, was that a kind of an, an answer to the spirit of your question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do now have a couple of um, questions coming in. Um, uh, which gives you exactly six minutes to answer three questions. I'm going to do the collect the questions. Um, so the first question is, what does your analysis of Ukraine tell you about the future of Moldova and Russia and other regional flashpoints? What will Russia learn and what will neighboring states learn? Um, another question of why you don't think that Russia updated their understanding. Um, is it because Putin is so dominant in Russian politics? and um, this is sorry, this is a longer one The that you've argued that there was a civil war in Ukraine supported by Russian forces in 2019. And that approach has been heavily criticized for lack of evidence and concept stretching uh, by respected scholars, including from Ukraine. So did the 22 full scale invasion make you rethink the role of Russia in spurring insurgency? Or do you still conceptualize violence in Donetsk and Luhansk as civil war? Yeah, sure. Um, so the first one is the easiest, which is um, my analysis doesn't tell me very much about Moldova or Russia. I don't that that would be too much uh, arrogance and conceptual stretching. I, I I can tell I can tell you some stories, but that's not anything that I'm really competent to speak about. There are much better people to speak about Moldova and Ponars. In terms of why they didn't update their understanding, I'm speculating, but I think that Putin's domination is certainly one of the main causal variables. The centralization of power. Um, uh, specifically centralization of the different security services in his hands, I think makes it very difficult to, um, to contradict the boss. And this has been well studied in terms of uh, what we call the dictator's dilemma in political science. Uh, Caitlin Talmadge at Georgetown has a set of arguments that relate this specifically to military planning that I think should be read by anyone. Um, it doesn't specifically talk about the Russia case, but my hunch is that in a few years when we get a really good world politics article um, about the Russia case, uh, it will lean heavily on the kind of Talmadge framework. Um, I'm going to plug, plug her work there. But um, I don't have anything original to say beyond the sort of things that you read in the New York Times by Dara Massico and um, uh, uh, you know, the... the uh, Mike Kaufman. I mean, we're all on kind of the same page about this, which is this is a Russian military corruption uh, rot at the center type story uh, about intelligence failure. So um, that I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, now, the question about um, the conceptual framework of civil war, um, I, I, I want to be really clear about this, uh, or as, as clear as I can be. I, I really understand um, and have walked back the language of civil war uh, in the title of the book. I, I have listened to the criticism. I think it comes from a fair place. Um, the way that Russians use the language of civil war is to deny their involvement in the Ukrainian conflict, which is obviously false and offensive. And I, I understand that better than I did before. And I'm happy to use this forum to apologize if that, if that is helpful to people. Um, the way political scientists use the term, the way the community of researchers use the term is in order to make comparisons. And we say oftentimes, look, it, it doesn't matter if the United States is, knocks over the government that starts the civil war. We can at least study 
the processes that take place in Iraq or in Afghanistan as civil war processes. Even if it began with something that you could call an invasion by the United States, we then go on to call it a civil war. But what I just said is a lot of inside baseball that doesn't make it any less offensive to Ukrainians. So um, I, I, I will, um, I'll say that plainly. I, and, and we do at the beginning of the book. We, um, with that said, um, we don't find the evidence of Russia uh, manipulating everything on the ground in the DNR LNR. This is in March, April, May, June, July, to be all that strong. Uh, when we see the Russian invasion is obviously Ilovysk and Debelsive, which Russia is not trying very, very hard, hard to, to hide. But the evidence that we see, then we document in the book, involves obviously the Gherkin group. Uh, there are some telephone calls, and it's a demanding counterfactual to prove a negative. So I'm sure that a lot of people are not going to be satisfied with our account, but we think that giving agency to Russian elites and Russian communities, most of whom did not want any part of Putinism, um, puts the story in the right place, right? That at the end of the day, telling the story of these volunteer battalions who stopped the tip uh, towards what might have been a much larger civil war um, is, puts the emphasis on the right place. Russia thought it was going to be a Russian spring. Turns out it was a Ukrainian spring. Looking at it through the lens of contentious politics and intra-Ukrainian bargaining, I think, is the best way to get you there. So I know that's not going to satisfy everyone, but I hope that um, you, you read the book and judge the evidence for yourself. And if you find the evidence wanting, luckily, you're in good company, and there's lots of other words you can use. You can call it a hybrid war, or an invasion, or any number of other things. Um, and that's what I would say. Well, great. That takes us right to three o'clock. Thank you so much, Jesse. Thank you so much, Anne, for joining us. Um, it was a real pleasure to see credit, you know, given so publicly to all the people that we all know make our research happen. Um, so I applaud you, Jesse, for, for that move. Um, and Anne, wonderful to hear your perspectives. It's now my pleasure to turn over the hosting duties to Peter Rolberg. Um, so take it away, Peter. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's a great honor to participate in this ukraine -a -thon. I also want to say that um, this conflict has actually put many scholars, many colleagues of mine into a very difficult situation. I, for one, did not expect this war to happen at all and was taken by surprise uh, that, that it did actually uh, break out last year. Uh, what I'm particularly fascinated by now is the cultural processes, the cultural consequences that this war has for an emergence um, of a new cultural identity in Ukraine. We had a event at Iris last fall with Vol Volodymyr uh, Rafienko, uh, the Ukrainian writer who made a conscious decision to actually switch from uh, from Russian language in which he had written for all of his life to Ukrainian and not, not, no longer and never again uh, write a word in Russian, which really is um, a remarkable uh, symptom of the deep divides that have actually um, uh, taken place in this in these um, in these processes, in particular aggravated by this war. It is a great honor to introduce uh, Dean Alyssa Aris uh, as our next speaker. She has been Dean of the Elliott School of National Affairs since 2021, after a distinguished career in the public uh, uh, realm uh, and also in academia. She was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia from 2010 to 2013. She's one of the foremost authorities in this country on India. She's written a book, among other publications, Our Time Has Come, um, uh, which was uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2018, India's Rise on the World Stage. And she was a fellow, a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations for India, Pakistan, and South Asia from 2013 to 2021. Dean Eris, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. And, and I just wanted to be here to, to thank everyone for joining us today for Ukrainathon 2023. And it's such an honor to see all the participants and to be joined by many Ukrainians who, as, as Peter mentioned, through their scholarship, artwork, activism, and leadership are really a testament to Ukraine's resilience. Um, we're marking one year now of Russia's war in Ukraine, and I think it's surely at this juncture worth underscoring the inspirational commitment of Ukrainians to their nation. 
Um, let me just say a couple words about the Elliott School and our work first um, pu on public engagement as well as on Ukraine. We actually have a mission level commitment to public engagement. You know, the third part of our school's mission is to engage the public and the policy community in the United States and around the world, thereby fostering international dialogue and shaping policy solutions. So with the ukraine -thon, our scholars are doing just that, engaging the public and fostering international dialogue in the hopes of shaping policy solutions. So I wanted to just take a moment here to highlight some of the developments regarding our school and our work on Ukraine. As many of you likely know, our Petrach program on Ukraine, founded almost 30 years ago by William Petrach, in the spirit of promoting a greater understanding of Ukraine in the United States, has had a rush of activity over the course of the past year. Last spring, our school received very generous support from a member of our board of advisors, Jenna Siegel, joined by her husband, Paul, to sponsor 15 Ukrainian fellows each year over the next five years, fellows who have been affected by Russia's war in Ukraine. So this fellowship program is being conducted in partnership with Ukrainian Global University and the Kiev School of Economics. Those are partnerships that we're looking forward to developing in the coming years. Uh, altogether, it, which includes our annual cohort of the Petrach Fellows, we have the honor of hosting uh, no less than 20 scholars affected by Ukrainian scholars or scholars affected by the war in Ukraine across the 2022-2023 academic year alone. Now, some of these fellows have been able to join us here at the Elliott School in person, where they have greatly enriched our academic discourse and elevated our Ukrainian studies programming. But the majority are based in Ukraine. Uh, where they're continuing to make important academic contributions in dynamic and often dangerous conditions. These fellows are conducting deeply relevant research on contemporary Ukraine. They're covering issues like wartime utilities maintenance, the effects of the war on global food security, on resilience to information warfare, digital education, Ukraine-U.S. relations, and much more. We believe strongly that their perspectives and insight are uh, really of the utmost importance to understanding current events as they unfold and to the discourse around ongoing reconstruction efforts. Our faculty, our Elliott School faculty are also providing leadership in the field of Ukrainian studies. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the fact that Dr. Henry Hale, who you just heard from earlier, has published his newest book, uh, The Zelensky Effect with Olga Onish. And to promote this wealth of expertise, the Elliott School hosts numerous events on contemporary Ukraine, both through the Petrock program and through Ponar's Eurasia that you are all uh, familiar with today. In 2023 alone, the events that we have convened have drawn hundreds of attendees from the United States as well as from abroad. The last thing I would note is that about our students, our students are spearheading efforts to support and build greater understanding of Ukraine here on campus. George Washington University's newly incorporated Ukrainian American student organization, you'll hear from them later in this program, is actively working to engage our student body in supporting Ukraine and promoting Ukrainian culture and learning here on campus and in Washington, DC. So you can see we have a lot of activities related to Ukraine and the region, from our faculty to our fellows, to our students and to our alumni. Uh, we are home to a strong and growing community committed to enhancing the field of Ukrainian studies uh, and above all, to a free and an independent Ukraine. Peter, back Thank to you. you. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Ares. Uh, as I was preparing for this event, I listened to your remarks from the last Ukraineathon, which you also honored with your remarks uh, 11 months ago. And uh, since we have a minute, I just want to mention here, I was intrigued by your um, observation that this war actually increases the danger of a nuclear clash. Uh, that really could have uh, even more severe consequences for world politics. And I was wondering if you if you want to say a couple of words about that, uh, you know, about uh, what happened in the meantime and this particular aspect, which is um, uh, a very specific one. Well, that's something that scholars of, of uh, nuclear stability have been focused on since yeah. the war broke out. The fact that um, it has been unclear to what level Russia may be willing to escalate. I think many of our colleagues here um, have, have noted that this war would drag on. Marlene had said about a year ago uh, that it was hard to see how this war would come to an end. 
So I think um, this continues to be a situation of great concern, not only for what could escalate in and between Russia and Ukraine itself, uh, but for what it might mean and what it might suggest, the other issue that has unfolded now in recent weeks is the degree of support that China may be providing to Russia. That's been uh, a question that's been in the news this week. I'm sure everybody's been watching very closely, uh, particularly with the visit of uh, China's foreign minister uh, to Russia. Will China begin to provide um, uh, actual arms uh, to Russia? What will this mean? Will it escalate? Uh, even further, I, this this is not a stable situation, and this is what has uh, everyone certainly following um, following questions of geopolitics and global order worried about the broader impact. I apologize. This was really not prepared, so I, it was really out of, um, out of out of the blue that I asked you that. But as I said, since I had listened to your remarks from eleven months ago, I was wondering whether your analysis, uh, you know, had had undergone any modifications and so on. And indeed, I, I think. Um, your your observations are spot on. So thank you again for honoring the Ukrainathon with your remarks, with your presence. And um, I'm now going to turn to uh, Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, uh, the former ambassador of the United States to Ukraine. And uh, Ambassador Yovanovitch had a distinguished career in the Foreign Service. She was, among other things, the ambassador of the United States to Kyrgyzstan and to Armenia. And uh, and these remarks. I believe have been recorded. So uh, please, uh, uh, please play these play these remarks. Uh, we have no sound here. Hello to all my friends at uh, GW. Thank you for joining us uh, for the Ukrainathon and this fundraiser for the Kiev School of Economics and Humanitarian Aid Fund. Such an important cause to help uh, Ukrainians with food, with medication, with other supplies. Um, I hope that you'll be very generous. I'm standing here in, uh, in the center of Kyiv in front of the wall of heroes where just a couple of days ago, um, President Biden and President Zelensky were honoring those who have sacrificed their lives for, Kyiv, uh, for Ukraine's freedom, for our freedom. Uh, it's important to remember um, how completely mobilized Ukraine is, not only soldiers, but Ukrainian society, where um, the Ukrainians have demonstrated their great resilience. This is something that many of us have known over the years and have admired in Ukraine, but I think the whole world has, has seen it in spades uh, since, um, since the total uh, war began in uh, February, uh, uh, February 24th of last year. Uh, where, uh, you know, babushki are um, putting together Molotov cocktails, where ordinary citizens are driving to the front uh, with uh, souped up uh, vehicles. People are cooking in soup kitchens to provide food for the elderly and others in need. I mean, this is a society that is completely mobilized, completely resilient against the Russian threat. And it is something that we admire. And I think it is something that we, as citizens of the United States, as citizens of the world, need to support as much as we can. We need to provide Ukraine as much as we can, as soon as we can, so that Ukraine, Ukraine can win this fight. Ukrainians are fighting for our freedom as well as their own. And um, on, on this day uh, and tomorrow, we remember those sacrifices, we remember that resilience, and um, we salute our Ukrainian friends. Thanks to Ambassador Yovanovitch for her uh, willingness to participate here and contribute these very interesting, authentic remarks from Kiev. Also want to reiterate her words about donations to the fundraising efforts of the Kiev School of Economics. So uh, please, if you have a chance, if you can uh, help us help the Ukrainathon uh, to actually uh, support these, uh, these efforts. Our next speaker is Eugene Rumer. Um, he's a former national intelligence officer for Russia and Eurasia at the US National Intelligence Council. He's now a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and director of Carnegie's Russia and Eurasia program 
Um, uh, Dr. Rumer has actually been teaching at GW also, among other um, uh, pedagogical uh, efforts in his career. And um, I don't see him right now, but um, Dr. Rumer, are, are, you, are you there? Can you hear me? Hi, we're waiting for Dr. Rumer to arrive. In the meantime, we'll play a short video highlighting some of the okay. local activism right. that we see in Ukraine. Okay, thank you. Intellect of the Nation Charitable Fund launched in the summer of 2022 a project called Aero Assistance. My name is Andy. I'm the leader of this project. We started out by organizing two drone days where we collected teams of inventors who work with drones. We were able to combine the efforts of various teams of drone builders to create a high-tech intelligent drone. The drone can fly 10 kilometers and deliver a humanitarian payload of up to 9 kilograms. This allows us to deliver food and life-saving medicines in conflict zones where it is dangerous or even impossible for vehicles to travel. If we had had such drones during the siege of Mariupol, we could have saved hundreds of lives. Our first humanitarian drone is already helping to save lives in the conflict zone. Today, our mission is to raise additional funds from donors to increase the number of life-saving drones that we can deploy. Peter, Peter, you're muted. Uh, I said, we are still waiting for Eugene Rumor, is that correct? Uh, yes, we are. Um, give us one second and we can do up another uh, short video while we're waiting. Uh, well, what I could do instead is actually say a few words about the Petrach program that uh, Dean Aris had mentioned here. And um, maybe that will bridge the time gap even better, please go ahead. Okay, so so I just want to say this uh, because I knew Colonel Petrach, uh, William Petrach, uh, way back from the 1990s. Uh, his life was really a remarkable life um, in that he, as a young man, uh, had been both in German Nazi capacity and uh, uh, captiv captivity and also in, um, in Soviet captivity. And so this, in a way, illustrates the tragic um, uh, 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 events that Ukraine uh, had to undergo during those years, during the 1940s, during the war, but also before and after the war. And he managed to actually escape uh, to Canada after the war and, um, and uh, build a career for himself as both a professor and an investor. And um, uh, at the end of his life, uh, when he was all by himself, he didn't have children, uh, his wife had passed, uh, he was looking for a place to actually leave um, his legacy, um, his money, um, and he went to various places and also came to GW, to IRIS, uh, and our then director, Jim Millar, um, offered to host uh, kind of a William Petra endowment, and, and this is what happened by the late 1990s. And uh, we used, I think, this money um, very uh, wisely and, and, and very carefully to promote uh, a better understanding and, and more knowledge um, of Ukraine at a time when it was not in the news yet or not much in the news. So in the early 2000s, um, 
events on Ukraine really did not attract all that many people. And we had um, in, at IRIS events on Ukrainian agriculture, on uh, the economy in general, and so on. Um, and so I think what we did uh, when it was not yet spectacular, when it was not yet, as I said, a, um, uh, an important news event, uh, we, we had really a, a series of, of terrific uh, scholarly events and a uh, buildup of expertise on Ukraine um, at that time. Um, uh, William Petrach actually was a very generous man. He was very interested in sharing his uh, life experiences uh, the way uh, he had actually experienced um, both uh, Nazi Germany and uh, Soviet communism and his gratitude uh, in, to be able to live uh, in freedom in these last decades of his life. And he wanted to actually enable Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainian uh, scholars, young scholars in particular, to come to the United States. This was one of the foremost goals of his, um, of his donation, of his gift a very generous gift to our institute. And again, we tried our best to actually fulfill uh, his will um, in this re respect. So that is the background um, on the uh, Petra uh, program uh, on Ukraine, uh, which enabled us, for example, to um, hire uh, a Ukraine specialist, an American Ukraine specialist who taught you for an entire year. Um, or to hold conferences on Ukraine and many other things. So that was the beginning, I would say, of a very intensive engagement with Ukrainian topics, Ukrainian themes at the Institute for European Russian Eurasian uh, Studies. Last thing I want to say is that uh, just as a person, um, as I said, uh, William Petrov was a very open-minded man. Um, he was in his late 70s when I, when I met him, and he did not hold any uh, resentment, any any feelings, any negative feelings toward um, uh, any kind of ethnic group, any nation. Uh, his life had taught him actually to be open-minded and uh, uh, judge individuals as individuals, and and that was also very impressive. Uh, he had a great sense of humor, and I said, I'm I'm, I'm honored, and and I was honored to actually uh, get to know. Uh, this man who has done so much for um, the uh, Ukraine research uh, in the Elliott School, uh, as outlined by Dean Eris. So that's what I wanted to say, just because the name William Petrov may not be familiar to everybody. Um, and uh, that's the one who, who gave us funds and whose uh, name has been given to our uh, Ukraine program, uh, now headed by Professor Henry Hale. Uh, Sarah, if, if uh, Dr. Rumer still isn't here, maybe then we should go ahead with the film. Yes, thank you so much, Peter, for that really detailed and, and wonderful explanation. Um, we okay. still don't see Dr. Rumer, so I hope all is well and perhaps he'll be able to join us in a few minutes. Uh, but for now, we'll actually turn things over to Polina Sinovets um, of Odessa Mechnikov National University in Ukraine and also the Odessa Nonproliferation Center. And she'll be talking about the legacy of denuclearization and nuclear rhetoric and how it relates to the conflict. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I would like to share some uh, ideas about the uh, role of nuclear deterrence and its uh, evolution, uh, which was shown by um, Russia's and the United States strategy during the Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, so first of all, as uh, probably it looks um, obvious, uh, deterrence demonstrated that it's still uh, quite a useful strategy, at least uh, uh, the utility of drones was brightly demonstrated by Russia starting the war in Ukraine on the 24th of February last uh, year, when uh, Putin started the brutal war uh, on Ukraine, and then accompanied with the speech uh, uh, demanding everyone to stay away from this conflict, otherwise he was threatening with the unprecedented consequences, uh, which was rightfully interpreted as the um, attempt to deter and to threaten with nuclear weapons in case if everyone interferes in this conflict. In this regard, uh, of course, it was uh, quite obvious that deterrence worked. 
and uh, during the first months and days and months the united states uh, was completely deterred uh from not only from the military interference in ukraine but also from the other things such as uh, providing ukraine with an all-fly zone uh because there were some projects from the european partners such as poland to provide ukraine with mig bombers however this uh, deal was um cancelled by the United States. Um, there were also some projects, uh, but um, the main, um, I would say that the first months of the war for the United States came under the slogan not to uh, permit this conflict to escalate onto the level of the Third World War. Um, and also, of course, it was um, uh, quite Mm, obvious uh, that at some point uh, Russia's deterrence started to show its uh, limitations uh, because uh, the longer the war uh, started the more we could see the support uh, first of all with the arms transfers uh, which was performed by the United States and uh, by European allies to Ukraine and um, uh, of course, Russia was also threatening with some unprecedented consequences, but nobody trusted in this. First of all, probably because the, those threats turned to be not really credible and nobody believed that Russia was eager to be involved in the Third World War just because of the arms transfers to Ukraine. However, here we would uh, like to you know, say that there was one but. Uh, because in May of uh, 2022, Putin declared that he's... Uh, um, that any kind of uh, supply of the long-range weapons to Ukraine, the weapons which would able to hit Russian territory, um, would cause the escalation of this war and uh, also hit the decision-making centers. Uh, uh, it was probably seriously interpreted by the West, and as a result, Ukraine hasn't gained any kind of long-range missiles or bombers, at least for now. So we can say that uh, the coercive threats of Russia had some kind of relative success um, and uh, the relativeness or the relativity of that success was measured by the credibility of Russia's threats in this conflict. Uh, also, one more limitation which nuclear deterrence uh, demonstrated in the Russia's actions was the fact that Ukraine was uh, really not deterred by any possibilities of uh, Russian uh, nuclear weapons use against it. Of course, there were no, uh, of course, no um, threats of uh, direct nuclear use over Ukraine were vocalized uh, by Russian officials. However, this threat of uh, possibility to use whatever means possible uh, was uh, has always been in the air. However, it didn't uh, prevent Ukraine uh, neither from um, uh, some kind of um, accidents and uh, um, explosions on the Crimea bridge, which was before um, defined by President Medvedev as oh, President, I'm sorry, by the um, um, uh, deputy of the head of the Security Council of Russia, Medvedev, as the red line. Uh, neither further counteroffensive steps uh, by liberating south of Ukraine and Kherson, and also counteroffensive operations in Donbas. So actually, it was um, brightly shown by Ukraine that uh, nuclear deterrence is not working against non-nuclear states. Uh, there were some uh, findings and theories uh, before. And uh, you, the Ukrainian example showed that um, nothing changed since then and that non-nuclear states uh, can is not deterred by nuclear weapons. And not only probably uh, because that threat was not truly credible and not really rational of uh, using nuclear weapons against Ukraine, but also because Russian threats uh, were so many times repeated that they have uh, lost their credibility. And also uh, because of the fact that um, indeed um, Ukraine has had really nothing to lose except losing even more or losing itself so in this regard uh, deterrence threats were um, of course um, not really relevant for ukraine um at the same time um it's interesting to say that um in the um, middle of uh, this year um russia mm, russia's deterrence threat they became stronger, I mean, not deterrent, but even coercive threats, because uh, Russia just tried to show this deep involvement and no possibility of return. 
uh, from uh, this war without uh, certain gains and victories. Uh, in September of this year, President Putin declared that he's going to uh, annex um, uh, the uh, invaded regions of Ukraine, the Kherson Oblast, uh, the Zaporizhia Oblast, uh, and the Donbas. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, he has shown that he he's not he was not able to come back uh to the uh, situation to the status quo to the situation before the 24th of february uh and also that exploitation of the factor that russia can use whatever means whatever possible to defend the uh now their territory and also the fact that those um claims uh, got under the provisions of russian nuclear uh, foundations on nuclear deterrence uh, being considered as the Russian territory, it has led uh, the United States to certain actions, which I would uh, also uh, present and interpret as the deterrent threats. First of all, um, uh, the State Secretary Blinken uh, declared that uh, uh, Moscow was already signalized a couple of times uh, that no uh, nuclear weapons use against Ukraine or would be left unpunished and that uh, the punishment can be uh, implied in the conventional operation uh, against Russia. And of course, uh, everyone in Moscow understood that any conventional operation against Russia would be uh, would be able to become a beginning of uh, nuclear escalation because uh, the two nuclear superpowers are involved. And of course, um, it was a very uh, anxious sign, plus uh, the uh, speech of President Biden uh, when he said that the main thing is to avoid the nuclear Armageddon somehow underlined this uh, message. So uh, afterwards, we can observe uh, the number of escalatory uh, declarations uh, from uh, the uh, Moscow officials, starting from President Putin, who said that Russia has never been uh, thinking of attacking Ukraine with nuclear weapons and uh, ending up with uh, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, the Minister Lavrov, who said that uh, there has never been a plan and uh, Russia is not using nuclear weapons as the weapon of war, and it's only the Western rhetoric and well, Russia is doing only good things, defending Donbass conventionally. Um, so, um, at the end, um, the terms demonstrated its um, gains and uh, at the same time it's uh, weaknesses as for the gains i would say that uh, probably it's uh, the fact that uh, um, actually uh, nuclear deterrence provided russia with the so-called power projection tools and the fact that it could uh, or as uh, french say uh, aggressive sanctuarization uh, so it actually could, uh, you know, enabled uh, offensive uh, uh, actions, uh, the territory of Ukraine without being punished, and also gave very bad example to Russia, North Korea, Iran, and those states who cherish nuclear ambitions, uh, showing that you can do whatever with your neighborhood if you are enabled with nuclear weapons. On the other hand, of course, uh, Mm, the uh, deterrence demonstrated number of limitations, which I'm afraid would not stop the states cherishing that aggressive ambitions. However, it showed that um, being equipped with nuclear deterrence, you can hardly um, conquer the world, and even you can hardly conquer your neighbor, which is much smaller than you are, and uh, considered to be much weaker if you don't have other tools, uh, such as uh, even uh, the good equipped and the trained conventional army. Um, and then Russia is trying to uh, present this conflict, um, this war, mostly not as Russian war against Ukraine, but also uh, but as a proxy war of Russia and the West at the territory of Ukraine. And um, the nuclear tool has also been uh, exploited from the different angles. Um, the latest angle is uh, the yesterday's presentation uh, or like um, statement of the President Putin to the General Assembly, which he's making every year. And uh, uh, the uh, main important uh, contribution of which was the fact that Russia has declared its suspension of the New START Treaty.
the end, uh, deterrence is presented as the test of resolve between Russia and the United States. And the biggest danger here is um, the election uh, in the United States, the presidential elections, uh, the end of this year, which may change the administration. Uh, to the Republican one, at least there is some uh, possibility, and uh, which would uh, probably weaken the support of the United States to Ukraine. And in this regard, um, Russian uh, persistence in um, trying to stand on its positions and to go further in the war in Ukraine may play the in favor of Russia. Uh, because if the result of the United States, which is now brightly demonstrated by the Democratic administration, would weaken, uh, the Russian resolve would still be on and uh, would still uh, pressure on Ukraine and pressure on the West, uh, which at, at the end may result in the defeat of Ukraine uh, because of the diminishing of the Western support. Um, yeah, thank you. Maybe I can end here. All right, thank you very much. I'll hand it back to you, Peter, to say your goodbyes and, and give us to the to the next moderator. Yeah, thank you so much, Polina, for uh, helping out here. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, we did not have uh, Dr. Eugene Rumer as our guest as planned. And the last thing I want to say, I'm really impressed by this Ukraine-a-thon uh, uh, by its breadth of, uh, of fields. Uh, we have security, we have economics, we have culture, we have regional politics. This is really terrific and goes far beyond what anybody who's studying uh, Ukraine just from the mainstream media uh, would find. So I think that's that's really a reason to be proud of, of, this, um, of this event. And now I pass the baton to Jesse Driscoll. Is that correct? Correct. Um, is my yes. audio is my audio working? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks to all of you who have chosen to attend. Uh, my name is Jesse Driscoll, University of California, San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy. Um, I want to take a brief moment to, if you're just tuning in now, plug the Kiev School of Economics um, should be easy to find links to the donation site. I can post one in the link in just a moment uh, in the chat. But uh, just yesterday, uh, I was at Northwestern and Timofey described in great detail all of the specific work that they're planning to put donations to, including uh, building as quickly as possible bomb shelters for uh, children in elementary and junior high schools uh, who have already had education disruptive because of COVID and um, the war is just going to continue. So in an effort to not have a lost generation, um, you need to have a place for children to continue going to school when there are air raids. Seems like a pretty good cause to me and a pretty concrete one. If you're looking for someone out there who wants to donate on the one year anniversary and is not sure how, that is a good anecdote that you can use to motivate a gift. So with that, um, uh, it's my great honor to introduce Katerina Raban. Uh, and Katerina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Um, I have uh, how many, like 15, uh, 20 minutes, right? You've got 25 minutes. You can use it however you would like. Okay. Uh, I'll try to uh, leave some uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, decommunization, um, decolonization, desovitization, and the Russification of uh, Ukrainian public memory during the wartime. Um, and all these terms, uh, I mean, they, uh, they uh, for the last 10, 15 years, they mostly overlap. Um, decolonization is the broadest term. Uh, and um, decommunization is, is the most popular term in Ukraine. Um, uh, but uh, for many people, uh, they say that the more precise term would be disovietization um, uh, in terms of like gaining uh, both political, cultural, um, and economic um, independence from Russia. And 
Um, Derisification uh, is the uh, recent term uh, that uh, has become popular with, with the war. And basically, uh, the, it's the same political core uh, in each of these terms. Um, so the idea is to how to overthrow the oppressor, how to become sovereign. Uh, it's a process that started in uh, 1991, uh, actually even earlier uh, with the glasnost and perestroika. Um, and uh, it has been crucial and essential um, goal that defined the entire uh, political life in, in Ukraine, how to achieve this full independence. Um, and fighting the symbols of domination uh, and uh, uh, destruction of monuments, uh, uh, so the, uh, like a destruction of the uh, symbols of the uh, old regime is like a main symbolic event of each revolution. Uh, and uh, um, it gives this uh, um, sense to the word revolution. Uh, and it expresses the difference uh, between the old and the new. And you need a very powerful visual metaphor. And this kind of like very powerful visual metaphors uh, are this uh, destruction of Lenin's monument um, during the uh, second Maidan, during the uh, revolution of dignity. And uh, uh, it was a powerful symbol uh, already for um, before um, images became so powerful. It was already in, in, uh, in 1917, the destruction of the monument to Alexander III uh, was also iconic and we see it in the Eisenstein's uh, October film. So this uh, iconoclasm, um, it reflects this kind of uh, magical thinking about the power of revolution. Um, that's the power to change everything in one moment. And the destruction is kind of like a destruction of an icon. Um, it's because the icon it has some, some power over people. And today uh, I will uh, we'll be talking about the, um, uh, the, the second Maidan, the Orange Revolution, um, and the war itself as a continuation of this revolution. Uh, because it's a battle against the oppressor who wants to uh, eliminate the revolutionary changes. So um, Maidan in uh, 2013, uh, uh, 2015, uh, during this time, the idea to demolish uh, Lenin statue, uh, and not only in Kiev, but demolish uh, Lenin statues all around Ukraine, uh, has become very much discussed uh, because, it, uh, and there was a constant reference to 1991. Um, and there, uh, because it was considered that it was not a real revolution in 1991, uh, the revolution was suppressed uh, because um, all the Lenin's monuments, most, not all, but a lot of them um, were preserved. So there was one more chance, the second chance to fulfill the promises of 1991 and to achieve the real independence. And uh, on December 8, uh, uh, there was a peaceful rally, but there were more radical people uh, who planned the toppling for many years. And um, um, they finally did what they wanted. And uh, what happened at, at that moment in Kyiv, in Kyiv, it was a, a revolutionary political event with very powerful emotional fear. Uh, and the crowd, a large group of people, uh, at that moment became a revolutionary subject. Uh, Far-right activists claimed responsibility, but I think um, that they just wanted to exaggerate their role. Um, the role of their party, they wanted to have more political influence than they had at that time, uh, and they wanted to present themselves as political leaders, uh, and it was, but it was contradictory to the idea of the Maidan, um, because Maidan, uh, the idea was that Maidan did not have any political leaders. Maidan was a um, collective subject, um, multitudes. And most of the people on the Maidan, they rejected the uh, idea that they're, they have political leaders. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time, but uh, uh, I will send uh, a link to this uh, very short uh, documentary. Uh, it's just seven, eight minutes long. Um, I'll send it in the chat. Uh, that uh, I think is the best uh, 
um, is, is the best uh, uh, in terms of like uh, demonstrating the spirit that was at, at that moment uh, um, of demolishing Lenin. I'm just gonna skip it. Uh, so what happened? Um, so after the extreme violence on Maidan, um, uh, a lot of uh, um, statues of Lenin were demolished uh, all around Ukraine in, in big cities uh, and in small towns and villages. So the late February um, was the peak of what's called Lenin apart from the fall of Lenin's. Uh, and the war uh, in the Donbas, uh, where Russia first uh, created and then military backed separatist movement, uh, this movement uh, followed the narrative of fighting fascists, uh, so those who were on Maidan. And it presented uh, uh, themselves as grandchildren who continue what their grandfathers did. So they were fighting fascism again. Uh, again. And uh, uh, Lenin mon uh, monuments were used as the symbols to oppose the Maidan revolution. Uh, and they were the symbols of Russian uh, counter-revolutionary war against Ukraine. And on the bottom, you can see uh, Lenin in Donetsk occupied Russia. And uh, on top is uh, uh, finally uh, in September uh, 2015, uh, Lenin was toppled in Kharkiv. Uh, sorry. Um, Another important uh, point about the war and the uh, toppling of Lenin is that, um, uh, and I, in 2014, I was in the US and I was mostly um, uh, following the war from here, uh, the, the Maidan and the, the uh, war from here. Um, and uh, I, noticed, I noticed that um, uh, Maidan and the war were described in the, uh, uh, in the popular press and uh, also in uh, academia here, mm, mostly um, through this um, um, historical, uh, it was described as the Ukrainian crisis, first of all, not the Ukrainian-Russian war. And it, uh, Ukraine was described as polarized, uh, divided, pro-Western versus pro-Russian. Um, it was explained by history, um, that there was like uh, Western Ukraine, uh, national, uh, nationalist part of Ukraine, and there was pro-Russian, Eastern uh, Ukraine, was, uh, uh, even New York Times was writing something like ethnic, Rus uh, ethnic Russians uh, uh, were the majority of people who lived in, in the Donbass. Um, so I think uh, that this words like nationalist, uh, far right, they dominated the description of Maidan, First of all, because of uh, toplings of Lenin and because of uh, uh, memory, uh, because of this, uh, um, because of this, uh, uh, what was earlier uh, glorification of Bandera, and and uh, they created this kind of um, vision of Ukraine um, as uh, yeah, as, as very polarized and nationalist. Um, and it also reflected and influenced the reaction of Western governments to the war in uh, 2014, um, because it was considered that it's like a uh, Ukrainian crisis, it's not the war uh, of Russia against Ukraine. Um, in 2014-2015, the um, uh, communization uh, continued as a reaction to the war. And Lenin statues continued to fall, um, and uh, uh, and by the end of, uh, uh, but actually they uh, continued to fall uh, until the end of uh, 2019, uh, when all of them were demolished. What was installed uh, instead of Lenin? Uh, it's um, it's an interesting case because usually it was uh, just an empty pedestal, um, also in Kiev. Um, um, and it reflected uh, that uh, this kind of uncertainty, uncertainty, first of all, because of the war and of because of such dramatic changes, um, society uh, needs time to rethink uh, the public memory and whom people wanted to commemorate. Um, in some cases, there was a cross installed or Ukrainian flag 
or um, you can see on the bottom, um, it's a, a monument in Poltava, a monument to the heavenly hundred, to those who died uh, on Maidan. Um, and it was not an official uh, initiative, but uh, uh, just some people, um, uh, they, and in, also in many other places, people uh, started to turn empty pedestals into some uh, uh, monument to, to the heavenly hundred or to other uh, heroes of the, of the war. Um, another important step in this direction um, of uh, uh, decolonization and decommunization were the memory loss um, that cemented what people started to do earlier. And uh, um, among, there are four laws, but the, um, the third one that um, established uh, um, that uh, uh, this interwar uh, fighters for Ukrainian independence um, uh, organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army, those who were um, uh, fighting for independent Ukraine um, during the beginning of the Second World War, and they uh, collaborated with the Nazi Germany, and they were fighting uh, against the Red Army, uh, and also they are notoriously known for um, uh, the, uh, for the killings of Poles and Jews, so they were uh, turned into, so they were made into heroes of Ukraine, and uh, also the uh, uh, law number four uh, was, um, is the most well known and most criticized, um, because it defined the um, communist totalitarian regime uh, or, that started uh, communist totalitarian regime in Ukraine, um, as uh, the entire Soviet period. So it was like from 1917 until 1991. Uh, there was no differentiation between like Stalinism and the uh, late Soviet period. Uh, and it defined this enti the entire Soviet period as criminal by its nature. Um, the communist regime and the Nazi regime were the same. And there were uh, a lot of debates and there were many critics of the communization. Uh, I myself was very uh, uneasy and uh, I felt very uneasy about this, um, uh, uh, this loss, uh, but um, I think it's uh, the most important fact that there, there was no actually political mobilization against these changes. Um, and I mentioned this to support my argument uh, against uh, uh, describing Ukraine as, as divided. Um, they, uh, one of the, the uh, here on the top, um, there is this um, mosaic uh, from, from Lviv, and actually it shows how the, uh, the communization worked, and um, it also shows one of these controversies uh, um, about the communization, so um, first of all, regarding the um, monumental art, uh, the Ukrainian uh, mosaics, uh, because the, 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 according to the law, you cannot um, um, uh, you, you you need to destroy the pieces of art that uh, uh, include Soviet symbols like Soviet flags, like hammer and sickle. Um, uh, but uh, you can see how uh, like uh, only parts of, of the uh, of these mosaics were destroyed, while the rest uh, were like basically preserved. Um, I also felt very, um, um, I also was very critical to the, uh, to this decommunization um, as the, um, at the time it looked like uh, uh, a huge uh, uh, part of um, uh, Ukrainian cultural heritage, I mean, this mosaics could be destroyed, but um, uh, I'm happy that it was not the case and uh, uh, there was kind of like a small uh, movement to, uh, to preserve them. Um, so uh, after the uh, full-scale invasion started, uh, fighting Russia uh, was not limited only to battlefields, and uh, it became fully clear that uh, the Russian army is just an avant-garde force of Russian culture. And Ukrainian society since last February has been very intensively uh, rethinking uh, its relationship with Russian Russian culture. And here you can see um, uh, 
uh, the monuments of, of the imperial past. You can see um, the monument to Catherine the Great in Odessa, which was uh, finally uh, removed after very long debates uh, and uh, uh, in uh, last December. And uh, uh, on the bottom, on the left, you can see the statue of Peter the Great in Poltava, who was also a great colonizer of Ukraine, he was an occupier uh, of Ukraine. Um, uh, and uh, finally, uh, his monuments is going to be removed. Uh, um, another example uh, of um, of this, like uh, the Russification, but which is still in progress, is also from Poltava, and this is the um, monument to the glory. You can see this uh, imperial double-headed eagle. Uh, but the city is not going to. Uh, uh, it's dedicated, yes, to the uh, Battle of Poltava um, uh, when uh, uh, Peter the Great uh, defeated the Swedish army and Ukrainian Cossacks. Uh, but the city is not going to remove it, and uh, that's how the uh, people uh, changed it a bit. So you can see Ukrainian flag and uh, uh, the, this uh, uh, red and black flag. Um, I think the most uh, famous part of uh, the Russification is the uh, removal of uh, Pushkin statues. Um, and uh, it's called uh, now Pushkinopad. Uh, and uh, um, uh, on the left, you can see uh, a picture from Kramatorsk in the Donetsk region, a city that is heavily constantly bombed by the Russians. And on the right, you can see a Pushkin statue in Kyiv, in Kyiv and uh, it is still there and it has not been removed. And uh, I hope it will be removed soon because um, uh, at least uh, Ukrainians, uh, um, most of Ukrainians uh, are uh, supporting the idea of removing Pushkin statues be uh, because he uh, was a poet of the empire. He praised the military might uh, of the Russian Imperial Army, um, and he praised how um, how the um, the elimination of those who didn't want to be a part of the Russian Empire, um, and um, um, there is this uh, famous uh, uh, phrase, famous sentence um, that is uh, quite. Uh, uh, outrageous for Ukrainians. Um, it's a statement that the enemy is Putin, not Pushkin. Um, it's uh, by a uh, German uh, PEN uh, Writers Association. Uh, and it's, uh, I guess, the largest misunderstanding of what the war is and misunderstanding uh, of who the enemy is. Uh, it's based on the idea that the Russian culture has nothing to do with the war. Um, but um, uh, the fact that Russians deny uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and uh, uh, celebrating the genocide of Ukrainians with the present uh, status of the Russian culture with its origins in uh, colonial past and dreams um, about the future greatness. Um, um, so I'm gonna... Uh, jump to some conclusions. We're going to have to wrap up in um, five minutes or so. So if you... Okay. okay. Uh, so let's let uh, the conclusions be here. Uh, everybody can read them and I'm ready for questions. Sorry, I just didn't realize that, uh, how short it is uh, to have 20 minutes. That's completely fine. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box, so I guess I'll lead things off. Um, I I know the decommunization laws that you were talking about, and I'm fascinated by your thesis that um, you, you use the fact that there weren't protests against them, even though you were personally uncomfortable. The fact that there was no real protest and pushback is evidence of a unity uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, can you just comment for yourself on what made you uncomfortable? Not so uncomfortable that you would protest or change your vote or anything, but can you remember why it made you uncomfortable at the time? Because um, yeah. I thought that was an interesting thing to say before I get to the second part of my question, if nobody asks a different one. 
Um, yes, thank you. And uh, also, I want to stress that um, it's not that there the were no, no uh, it's important that there were no protests uh, at that time. And it's also important that um, uh, now uh, uh, we can see that uh, there is really uh, no pro uh, Russian and pro Western uh, Ukrainians. I mean, it doesn't uh, like we really now see that that. Um, Despite this, like hot debates about public memory, Ukraine as uh, is as strong as united as it could be in, in the face of the of the war and in the face of uh, uh, fighting this uh, enemy. Uh, I was uncomfortable um, because, first of all, I was considering it as you know, kind of like um, uh, hijack, hi hijacking the uh, Maidan by the far right activists you know like uh, and uh, the the historian who became the head of the institute of the uh, national uh, uh, remembrance uh, i was skeptical about uh, his views of the past uh, i was uh, skeptical also about the idea that um, the state wants to prosecute people who are, um, do not agree with this uh, version of, of the past uh, I was also uncomfortable uh, with, uh, of course, with the, how the law defined uh, um, uh, the role of uh, uh, interwar nationalists uh, without mentioning uh, uh, many important facts of uh, in what way they were fighting uh, uh, for Ukrainian independence. Um, I was, uh, yeah, of course, I was. Uh, very uneasy with the uh, uncritical uh, nature of this law. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say I really appreciated the the conviction that you used to press the thesis, and I completely agree with it. That after Crimea is removed violently, and then you have the core believers of the um, Party of Regions project that opt out or are taken out or whatever they're not they're also not represented what is left behind is certainly more cohesively unified in um cultural terms and political terms and everything else so i mean i think your thesis is very well supported by the data that i've seen but i know less about cultural history and monuments than you do obviously today's war is going to supercharge all of it but it seems pretty clear from your presentation it was visible before but um, maybe before you go, you could include a link to the paper that you were referencing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, to the, so that people can film. read it. Mm -hmm. um, no, that would the, be really helpful. Yeah, it was a film. Um... And while you're putting that up, I think we need to trans uh, uh, move on to the next presentation. But thank you very much. Um, and next up. Keeping us on, keeping us on track, we have Emily Channel Justice, the director of the Tenerti Contemporary Ukraine Program at the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University, Curie. So, Emily, um, can you give us a sound check? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. On the first try, this is this is this is great. We're professionals um, at this point. Uh, so the format is uh, you have essentially half an hour that you can use however you'd like. And um, with as much time for Q&A as you desire, I'm going to just hand the mic over to you after the obligatory quick plug for the Kiev School of Economics, uh, to which you can donate directly with the link that's about to be placed in the chat box. Please take it away, Emily. Thanks so much, Jesse, and thanks for everybody who is contributing their knowledge today. Uh, it was really nice to see so many familiar names, um, and, and thanks to Katya for that really interesting discussion um, that came just before me. Um, and it, it's I think it's a nice segue because the so I'm focusing largely on uh, displacement, forced displacement in the war. But I am going to bring a lot of this discussion back to the idea of self-organization. Um, so that's something that in my previous research with political activists, um, I have traced, uh, well, certainly it has a very self-organization, which, you know, this is an idea that 
Um, if something needs to be done uh, and you're somebody who can do that thing, then you should simply do it. There's no need to wait for state institutions or outside forces to do it for you. That trend is something that can be traced much longer throughout Ukrainian history, and it's present in a lot of different protest movements throughout history. But I really dig into it in my previous work during the Euromaidan protests that are obviously, you know, part of the central part of the, the cultural production of history that Katya was just talking about. Um, so I'm glad to connect some of those threads. Um, I'm going to just share um, one image. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking mostly about um, displacement and um, how the response to forced displacement has been um, has been in, uh, sorry, in the uh, since February 24th of last year. Um, and the reason that I want to show this particular map is because this is so this is from the, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Um, and this is um, a map, this is data that I've been using for the past year to talk about displacement. Um, what you're looking at right now is a map of, of internal displacement within Ukraine. So the, the darker the purple on the map, the more internally displaced people are in that particular place. So I think the key, the key figures that we wanna look at here are um, on the left-hand side of the, of the map. So the official number of registered refugees that are across Europe at this point is 8.1 million people. Um, and as you can see, this, uh, this map also will indicate uh, the number of people who have gone to a particular place. Um, as somebody who's studied displacement um, for the past several years, we know that these numbers are partial. It's really difficult to count displacement uh, just to because in, the numbers change a lot with a lot of regularity depending on what's happening. Um, and the, really the, the way that the UN is counting these numbers here is by counting the number of border crossings. Um, as we know for the past at least six months, if not before that, so many refugees who were registered in Poland have returned to Ukraine and have crossed the border multiple times. Um, so it's really difficult to assess for sure the number of refugees that there are now. This, um, this data also estimates 5.4 million people as being internally displaced. Again, I think this is a really low number, actually. I think the number is probably quite a lot higher. But again, we've seen a lot of movement kind of over and over. Um, the thing I think that, that I wanted to show the map for that I think is most interesting is that, as you can see, the darkest purple part of Ukraine, the number, the place where there are the most internally displaced people is actually still the Eastern part of the country. Uh, so the estimate for the number of IDPs who are still in Eastern Ukraine is nearly 2 million people. Uh, and you can see if we scroll over that it's closer to 1 million in the center parts of Ukraine, and also close to 1 million in the Western parts of Ukraine. So another factor to think about when we're talking about displacement is that a lot of the people um, who are displaced from Eastern Ukraine are still staying quite close to where they're coming from. Uh, that's something that happened since 2014. These regions also had uh, large numbers of displaced people between 2014 and 2019. They were concentrated in the, in the safer parts of the Eastern regions. Cities like Kharkiv, Mariupol, Bakhmut, these were cities that had been, uh, they had played host to, to hundreds of thousands of displaced people from Donetsk and Luhansk, the parts that were occupied by Russian forces. Um, and of course, now those cities are again under attack. And so we see a lot of, a lot of people moving to places that are now slightly safer, like Dnipro, Zaporizhia, um, as well as obviously in addition to going to places like Kiev, to going to places in further Western Ukraine. Um, so what, the, the reason that I'm kind of starting with a lot of numbers is because I think it's really important that despite the fact that the initial presentation of displacement from this war was very much about this singular flow of Ukrainians going West, in reality, displacement is really fluid. Um, people move all the time, especially because of how open the borders to most of Ukraine's neighbors were since February 24th, it has made it pretty easy to go back and forth. I say easy as a relative term. I mean, obviously there's a lot that goes into people's choices about where they wanna be. Um, but you, you can see from this map that Warsaw is really quite close to um, 
to the Ukrainian border. So there has been a lot of movement back and forth over the past year, and there's been a lot of movement within Ukraine over the past year. Uh, and just to, to address the, the red spots that are across Ukraine are, are where there have been attacks or hostilities of some kind. Um, so I can drop the link to this map in the chat. Like I said, you know, this um, the numbers featured here certainly are contestable, but I think they give us a good general idea. Um, the last thing that I wanna mention Right now, the, this map shows this number of refugees from Ukraine that have gone to Russia as nearly 3 million people. Um, I have never quite found the answer to the question of whether or not this number is indicating people who elected as refugees to go to Russia, or if it also includes the number of people who have been forcibly deported from the occupied territories to Russia. Um, right now, estimates are between one and two million people who have Ukrainians from the from the parts of, of Ukraine that were occupied by Russia have been forcibly deported to Russia. Um, obviously, I would not use the term refugee to describe people who have been forcibly deported. So this may be an indication uh, where this this particular map is is not telling us exactly uh is they're, they're using the term refugee kind of generally just just something to keep in mind um but i i certainly want to talk a little bit about the forced um the forced deportation of, of ukrainians to russia probably most of you saw the recent report from yale university that identified at least six thousand ukrainian children being held in custody centers across russia that are also being used with, for really um in my view, nefarious kinds of propaganda about uh, that that feeds the Russian narrative of of saving, as they want to call it, Ukraine. Um, and that's something that certainly I, I think is getting a lot of attention now. Um, and that I think probably also that number of six thousand is a low estimate. And the researchers who contributed to that Yale report also um, have have assessed that six thousand is probably a low number. But they used open source data um, to to uh, to get that that certain number of 6,000, right? But there's probably a lot more, um, a lot more children that can be identified as having been forcibly taken to Russia. So um, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the response to displacement because um, it was really, I think a really remarkable example and, and probably really unexpected in a lot of ways, this general positive response to Ukrainians who ended up in Europe. So first of all, when we're talking about internal displacement, we saw a lot of people self-organized to respond to meet the immediate needs of people who were displaced across Ukraine. So this was really similar to what we saw from 2014 to 20, really to 2021, but especially in the first years following the Russian invasion in 2014, um, the Ukrainian government was still largely transitional uh, not exactly prepared for this large influx of internal displacement. So a lot of the responses that we saw from 2014 and on were self-organized. They were by people who were simply living in the places that received a lot of displaced people. They were not programs that were run by the Ukrainian government, at least not until much later. And in some cases, those programs never really came to, to fruition. Um, so what we saw after February 24th of last year was a resurgence of that type of self-organized response. So people who you know, were coming to, to meet people at train stations, make sure they had food, water, basic necessities, put them up in housing temporarily, um, all, all the kinds of responses that we saw in 2014, we saw again in 2022 and on the much larger scale. And what I, I found to be especially interesting was that this was also the response that we saw in Ukraine's neighbors when Ukrainians started to leave the country. Um, and I, I have spent time since the war began in Poland um, and I, I've read mostly about Poland. So that's what I'll talk about the most, but I know that these types of initiatives have, have happened also in Romania and Moldova. Um, so I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna exclude the recognition of, of the incredible response across, across Europe, but especially in Ukraine's immediate neighbors. Um, so in Poland, when the war began, the Polish government lifted 
uh, restrictions in terms of border crossing. So previous to the war, you were required to get, for example, a COVID negative COVID test to cross the border. Um, you had to get special permission for your pets to leave the country, really sort of basic things like that, that the Polish government lifted those restrictions to make it easier for people to leave the country and go to Poland. Um, and what I heard from a lot of people in Poland who were some of those who were working um, to respond to this, this mass influx of refugees was that at the border, in the immediate aftermath of the war, large international aid organizations were not present to help Ukrainian refugees, but rather it was local organizations and in particular women's organizations from rural communities that were the first people on the ground to help Ukrainians, you know, who had some of whom had been waiting at the border for 36 hours, who had been packed on a train for 24 hours, um, some of whom came across by foot very easily. Everybody had a different experience, um, but there was somebody to meet them at the border and to help them get to their next destination in a lot of cases. As you can imagine, you know, this is a, an incredibly stressful experience. A lot of people had never, you know, been outside of Ukraine. Um, didn't have any connections in Poland. And, and so it was really having just regular people uh, who were there to meet them and help out, I think was very reassuring from, from the Ukrainians who I spoke to in Warsaw. I was, it was incredible to them to see that, that just regular people wanted to help. Um, and so what I think makes this particular situation so interesting is exactly that combination of state decisions, especially by the Polish government and ordinary people's responses that kind of combine to make Poland this, at the time, at least very friendly and welcoming place for Ukrainian refugees. I, I know we talked a lot throughout the past year that eventually, you know, the Polish welcome would wear out, people would get tired of helping people from Ukraine for so long. Um, but what I think we've seen instead is that as Ukrainian refugees' needs have shifted, so has the Polish response. So while the cash benefits for refugees, um, the cash benefits making it easier for them to find housing, transportation, that sort of thing, many of those have lifted, but the benefits for things like the right to work legally in Poland, the right for children to go to school legally in Poland, those have stayed with this idea that even if, you know, even if Ukrainians may want to go home as soon as possible, the Polish government has kind of found a way to make it relatively easy, and I don't want to say easy as if I'm, you know, saying it's easy to be a refugee, right, but it's it's a little easier than um, going to a place where you have no support network, right, and where, where in the, I mean, in the U.S., uh, you know, Ukrainians who are here as, as refugees don't have the right to work, for example, they have to apply for that in addition to coming here on a sponsorship program. So the way that the Polish government set it up, I think, facilitated um, a transition for people, but also kind of preserve the fluid, fluidity if people wanted to return home. Um, and that, again, is something that is really unprecedented in large, large scale kind of refugee situations. Uh, the other really key thing was that the Polish government decided not to set up camps at the border for, re for refugees to stay in. Um, as a lot of, of research on refugee camps shows, these camps are designed to be temporary, but almost never are. And so you end up with refugees who are, you know, kind of placed outside of the rest of society. Uh, and the Polish decisions to allow Ukrainians to work and go to school has kind of allowed them to integrate in a different way than what we've seen in a lot of other refugee situations. I, I think it's really early to make any kind of definitive academic assessment of that decision. Um, but I, I, based on my conversations with Ukrainians in Warsaw, um, it, it helps them, I think, see themselves, you know, within Polish society as, and not as outside of Polish society, which I do think kind of helps on the, uh, in terms of, of their, um, if not full integration into, into Poland, because a lot of the people that I met in Warsaw have already gone back to Ukraine, um, but just sort of made them feel a little bit more welcome than I think otherwise. Um, and I, I think that's also a commentary, um, again, something else that a lot of anthropologists have been talking about is, is, is how aid works as a whole. This whole, um, the whole refugee response and um, just the, to some extent, effectiveness of self-organized responses and distribution has really required us to rethink 
how aid works in a lot of ways. Um, and that goes from, you know, we've seen, I, I mean, maybe it's, I'm biased because of this is something I pay attention to, but this is the first time I've seen so many people recognize the limitations of, for instance, the International Red Cross. Perhaps that's, that's partly because the International Red Cross did not suspend its collaboration with Russia. And so it was sort of, um, it, it was obvious that there was, there was criticism there. Um, but, you know, one thing we know about big organizations like that is that they have a lot of overhead you might donate to them, but most of your donation does not actually go to the people who are in need. Whereas the networks that have been created around aid in Ukraine are much more localized and we, we know that they have a lot less overhead, um, distribution is better, they meet more particular needs in more particular ways. Um, again, you know, I don't know if this is something that has become more widely recognized because of such access to social media and because so many people on Twitter are talking about it. But, but for me, I thought it was really remarkable that this has been um, recognized in, in Ukraine as being you know, local networks, local self-organized um, initiatives have been more effective than large aid networks, probably because those, those aid networks were um, you know, absent from the, from the first few days. Um, I, um, I think, like I said, you know, going forward, um, this is something, you know, there's a lot of long-term questions this brings up. Um, certainly we've seen, so certainly in the, in the first, uh, even six months of war, you know, we saw the vast majority of Ukrainians remain in countries that were closer to Ukraine, I think with the hope that they would be able to safely return home soon. Um, now we're starting to see well, and, and I would say probably for the past six months, people who are making more long-term decisions, so lots more applications to the to the u for u program, which is the Ukrainian refugee program in the United States. Um, that program, I think, was a little slow to start in, in some ways and is, is really now seeing uh, people who are starting to resettle here. You can imagine that people who get visas to resettle in the US are probably you know, less inclined to go back to Ukraine immediately as well. Um, so I think, you know, the longer the war goes on, the more that changes people's calculation for how long they want to be away, where they want to be away. Um, you know, it changes the, the relationships people have with others. There's uh, a lot of a lot of people initially, um, you know, tend to go to places where they already have some connection, they might know somebody else. So we would see like, that was one of the reasons so many Ukrainians were in Poland was because there were already so many Ukrainians in Poland. So it sort of feeds itself. Um, but then the long-term impacts on, on Poland are, are another really big question. And, and I do think it's still a relevant question of whether or not um, countries like Poland end up tiring of supporting refugees for so long. Although uh, obviously, you know, the Polish, the Polish government's stance on, on aid for Ukraine is, is really leading Europe at this point. So um, I'm hopeful and, and optimistic that, that that support kind of continues. Um, but again, you know, I think um, there's obviously every country has a different uh, program in terms of welcoming Ukrainians. This makes it really difficult to navigate the bureaucracy for people in a lot of countries. Um, you know, like I said, the US program is totally different than other programs around Europe and, and it's totally different than other programs for refugees and asylum seekers from any other country in the world. Um, so I know I have a few students who have done some research on the u for u program and I would really encourage people who are interested in this topic to, to look more into that one because I think um, it's a totally different example of, of how to address a mass influx of refugees um, and whether it's you know the most effective one or not again remains to be seen although uh, I'll just conclude and, and leave time for questions I'll just conclude by saying I hope very much that uh, you know the war ends in the in the coming months and rebuilding Ukraine is also a process of getting people back to their homes so that um, they don't have to be refugees any longer. Yeah, uh, of course, from your lips to God's ears. But, um, you know, if you're a refugee in, in the situation who's beginning to make these more long term trade offs that you described, you know, you you have to plan for you know different contingencies, best to worst case all along the spectrum. So I don't see any questions. I'll take the prerogative of asking asking the first um, and I'll break it down into kind of like two different parts. The first is just 
speaking practically, if you, um, when this, don't use your podcast time to do it, you know, you only have like nine minutes left, but when we're done here, could you post a couple of links to um, donate to for people who are looking to assist the families of people who have fled? Um, because that strikes me as something that you probably have um, more granular information on. Um, and I think it's a question that I get often about how can I actually give? And I know that for today, the answer is please give to KSE, but for, um, you know, for posterity, for all of us, I mean, I think that would be a really helpful public good. Um, the other I mean, part of it, I know that it requires speculation about sociology in the long term, but, um, you know, something that um, I, I believe it was Daria Yashkira has been doing research on um, integration of these refugees into societies mentioned, which struck me as very wise. And I, I just like to kind of just hear you free rip and comment on it is that mm -hmm. there's actually a um, uh, there's a, there's a there's a there's a practical trade off between the short term sympathy that you feel for people who are victims and the complexity that comes once you actually treat them as real human subjects in the long term and something other than victims. Right. So the the easy answer of these are suffering people that need help is very consistent with the story that you've given so far where you have you know localized women's networks who see women in need and they open their doors because what else would you do but in the long term you know these are women who are highly educated competitors on the labor market and probably the marriage market too they come with children the children are going they're at exactly the right age where the children are actually going to learn the language in elementary school and um these are good reasons to not go home um, and so it requires speculation and you have focused overwhelmingly on Poland, which you know the most about, which is, which is reasonable, but, um, you know, can you, can you, can you find anything in my, um, you know, appropriation of Daria's comment to, to comment mm -hmm. on, because you obviously think about these things. It's not really about treating them as refugees. It's treating them about as potential assimilation, like subjects in Poland, in the frontline states. In the United States, to some degree, but we're so big demographically, you wouldn't feel our impact here. You would really feel it in Czech, Czech Republic. You would really feel it in, you know, countries with a smaller population denominator. So that's, that's the spirit important. of the question. Yeah, um, I mean, it just I I've been talking to some people lately about Moldova, which is you know much smaller and receives so many refugees that it's yeah, population. No, Mold Mold Moldova is almost in its own category because it's so small. It's like the reductio yeah. ad absurdum of all of this. But yeah. you know, for Poland, for Poland, I think it presents a really interesting question for Poland because Poland did already host a lot of Ukrainians working in in, for example, the IT sector and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So to some extent, and I do think that the Polish, um, I don't know if I want to say specifically government, but there is a there is a tendency to tr to want to present this as a potential good thing for for Poland, right? Because Poland has also seen a lot of out migration. I mean, it's yeah. all it's all a hierarchy, right? Of, of yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to some extent, I mean, highly educated people who are multilingual, you know, probably have some fluency in in Russian, Ukrainian, English, and and potentially Polish. Uh, I mean, that's potentially good for the Polish economy. Um, you know, I did do, have. Do, do Polish politicians articulate that argument like the way that you just did, or is that still Academics know, wishful thinking. Uh, it might still be academics wishful thinking. Um, you know, I have just as a kind of balance to that. I do have, I have heard some stories that um, women that I've spoken to who are, you know, educated in, as teachers or something, because of Poland's laws about how teachers can be hired, they can't work in a Polish school. So one woman I, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with in Warsaw was going to have to get a job in a, in a factory. And she was like, I've taught computer science for 20 years. How am I supposed to work in a factory? Um, and it was really demoralizing for her to, to think about this kind of huge demotion. Um, and so I think that's a concern for a lot of Ukrainians is that they really, I mean, they they won't necessarily be able to get a job in their field, again, unless Poland changes some of their laws pretty dramatically. Now, you know, my, my opinion there was, well, there's so many new Ukrainian kids coming into Polish schools, shouldn't they find a way to integrate Ukrainian teachers to help Ukrainian kids who are coming to school? But that's a, I mean, 
think about the long-term implication. I mean, that's a lot of people. At the time, like over the summer, we were looking at some 300,000 Ukrainian kids who might be going to school in, in Warsaw for the next few years. Um, is that the Polish government's responsibility to take on an educational reform like that? I think, you know, the, the waves of thinking about integration, um, they last much longer than the immediate needs that can right. be addressed a little more as emergencies, right? Which, which they are, um, you know, Poland wants to continue to show support, but, but the questions of need change so much and they become much more, I think, difficult over the long term. Um, you know, the other example I think that would be especially interesting to look at and that I do personally hope to, to do re more research on is the Baltics. Um, again, super small countries that have had really, really supportive responses to Ukraine, uh, both at the civic and the, and the government levels. They've seen a lot of refugees, um, but they don't have the linguistic proximity that Poland does. It's much more difficult you know, for a Ukrainian to, to learn Estonian and work in Estonia, right? Um, especially with an increasing anti-Russian sentiment in those countries that have large Russian speaking populations. So uh, these are questions that, that I'm pointing out now because I think these are some of the things that these, these European allies are gonna have to deal with in, in this quest to do integration better than yeah. we've seen in previous mass refugee situations. I mean, uh, certainly that, I mean, when, even if you, even if you divide 8 million by half to account for back and forth migration, this is still um, unprecedented in a lot of ways. Um, exactly. So we're in uncharted waters. Um, and, and people still do tend to, more people tend to, tend to stay closer to home. So, you know, we're not going to see 4 million Ukrainians trying to come to the US. That's just, that's just, I don't think something that's going to happen. So um, it, the burden is still going to fall a lot in. Within yeah, nor, nor, nor Portugal, nor the UK. No, it's right. going to be the ARC, uh, the Bucharest 9. Um, in any case, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, you, you get the last word for the last minute if you have anything else you wanted to close with. Super. Well, in that case, I will say um, I will drop a couple of links, as you suggested. But um, if you visit uh, huri.harvard.edu, we have a lot of resources there um, that you can sort of pick and choose what type of, uh, of initiative you, you'd like to support. Um, certainly, we do include um, or at least in the past have advocated for Kiev School of Economics, which is a which is a great place to focus your energy on. Um, but we have divided out a lot of the other kinds of organizations that are helping. So if you are looking to support an organization doing more uh, specific kinds of work, you can find it there, as well as great information about Ukraine. Well, as always, thanks for all you do at Curie. And you. Um, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks, I hope, in person. Yes, absolutely. Right. Thanks so much for your questions. Take care. Bye. Um, so moving right along, uh, next up, we have, I believe, if she's arrived, um, Karina. Um, Karina, are you here? Yes, I'm here trying to open the video. Okay, stop. Excellent, hello. So um, next up, we have Karina um, uh, Korostelina. Karostelina, yes. Please pronounce your name, I apologize. It's fine, Karina Karostelina, yes. <laughs> Excellent, um, well, Thank you very much for joining us. Um, our, uh, it's it's only it's not just me. It's just me. It's you and and and, well, and, and, and Gerard. Yeah. Well, cool. Ger Gerard, I obviously know. I'm less worried about mispronouncing his name. Um, uh, nice, nice to see you both. The way that we have been doing run of show is that you have the full thirty minutes to divide however you would like for your presentation between comments and questions. And I'm going to retreat into the background. Uh, and look forward to hearing whatever it is you have to present. Okay, thank you. So, Gerald, do you uh, can we share? Yeah, okay. uh, you hear that or see that? Okay, thank you, Jesse. Uh, and uh, I'm I have your book. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I heard you talk uh, earlier today. Um, so this is a uh, joint research uh, and Karen is the lead on this uh, research, which uh, began as a rapid grant from the US National Science Foundation. Um, I'm just going to talk uh, for 
10 minutes and then uh, Karina is going to talk for 10 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes for uh, questions, Jesse. I think that's how we would like to proceed. Um, I am going to go extremely quickly. Um, folks that know the book Near Abroad know that uh, the, the type of research that uh, political geographers like myself do is to really look at the uh, geopolitics as something which involves multiple scales, multiple actors, and see it in a very, very thick way. But there's also generalized patterns here to be uh, to be analyzed. Um, and uh, in this particular case, what we're looking at is the uh, breaking of the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Um, s distinctive from the uh, ways in which the um, Soviet Union collapsed and led to breakage of the territorial template, territorial integrity of Georgia, Moldova, um, and uh, um, and also uh, the, the particular ways in which it uh, unfolded um you know within the soviet within russia itself with with chechnya um but this is ukraine is is really very distinctive in that there was a very active hand uh, of uh, russia in a, a cultivating a, a separatism and a, <laughs> local actors in a crimea i don't need to tell you that and then uh, subsequently, the current uh, invasion uh, leading to a, a massive uh, increase in the ambition to try to break, uh, take more parts of Ukraine uh, and repeating the formula all the time. I'm showing you these slides to get across that this is a way in which the regime is legitimizing itself and creating spectacles for its population. Uh, so there's a, a massive uh, degree of de regime legitimacy uh, as part of this. What our research is uh, focused on, um, and Karen is coming out of conflict resolution, is really on the tragic dilemmas that this creates for the Ukrainian people, people who are on the front line of uh, this uh, very bold and vicious uh, attack. Uh, and we're looking at the cost of war and versus the cost of peace and what things are acceptable and unacceptable. One of the concepts that uh, we use is the idea of sacred values. And those are things that are seen to be uh, not negotiable, that they, these are so central to one's identity that a kind of normal um, trade-offs and uh, ideas that this can be traded, that this can be uh, exchanged, uh, that that is off the table. Um, but within sacred values, there is a hierarchy. There are certain things that are more important than others. So we want to kind of probe that a little bit. What I was interested in was the uh, issue of uh, this sort of classic theme in uh, conflict studies, the land for peace. And the hypothesis, working hypothesis, was that the prospect of any kind of land for peace uh, formula in Ukraine would be unacceptable to the vast majority of the population for a number of different reasons. The territorial integrity norms, so that's part of international law, but of course, Ukrainians understanding that uh, and believing in a just world knowing that this is uh, something which is illegal and uh, uh, is, is outrageous given the uh, norms that have uh, held. Also territorial in, in divisibility, and this is somewhat distinct in that it's associated with a sense of being Ukrainian, a ci state civic identity. That This is our country, this is our homeland, and they kind of socialized into that from a, a, an early age. This is Ukraine, and therefore breaking that is uh, something which is breaking uh, uh, the, the country. Uh, and then the last one, territory is a sacred value. It wrapped up with the indivisibility, but the sense that this is our homeland, our uh, our land. Uh, and so this is therefore fundamental to who we are. Well, so that's the uh, hypothesized disposition of people. How does war uh, experience change that? How does perceived international support uh, change the dilemmas 
of war, which is that uh, this uh, you're facing invasion. The research is based upon face-to-face -face interviews conducted by the Kiev International Institute of Sociology uh, in July of this year, uh, uh, 1,800 uh, in total, a uh, mix between IDPs and local residents. And you can see the breakdown here. Uh, and these are some of the uh, characteristics of the sample. One thing I'll just point out is that the language used mostly at home, you see 58.2% Russian. So this is a majority Russian speaking population. If you add in the mix of Ukrainian and Russian, then that's up to about uh, almost 75% of the people that we were uh, interviewing here. Um, sacred values can, an open question, what's most sacred? Protecting families. Uh, life is, is, is seen as the most sacred value here. And so the dilemma, the tragic dilemma of the war is when you put a commitment to an undivided, indivisible national territory up against this here. And as you can see, there is this distinct difference. Uh, is this, this is almost overwhelming. This is a little less. Uh, and then you put those two things together. You front load the idea of prompt, the idea of sacrifice. Uh, and because of the sacrifice, more important than ever, that Ukraine never concede any territory. And you have strong agreement. Uh, uh, on plus 75%, but you have somewhat a uh, dissent from that. Um, but then you frame it somewhat differently where you say that the war is, you know, essentially uh, compromising our nation and its demographic future because of the tragic ways in which so many people are being killed. And then you have much more variation. The y-axis here is at 50%. So you can see the strongly agree here uh, is very, very, uh, uh, is, it outweighs the, uh, the disagree here. Um, then we ask uh, territory versus geopolitics, territory or geopolitics versus life and well-being. Diversity of views on that. Uh, so that's the dilemma. That's part of the uh, the wrestling over things that don't have clear uh, and obvious answers. And we wanted to try to get uh, at that because uh, there is unanimity on certain issues, but these are the dilemmas, the tragic dilemmas of war that we're hoping to approach with this particular research. Um, this is a, a very important a finding here where we asked, What's more important, to save Ukrainian soldiers and civilian lives or to continue to fight to free the Ukrainian territories? And as you can see, there's a, a, a diversity of opinions. Uh, this is a painful dilemma uh, for people. Uh, peace and what is a, a, would be absolutely unacceptable. As you can see, there is, when you break it down into, you mentioned name check a territory, Donbass, Crimea. So how is that unacceptable? Well, Crimea becomes recognized as part of the Russian Federation, 58%, a majority, but not overwhelmingly, not 75, uh, 100%. Uh, see that as absolutely unacceptable. Uh, Donbass, it's even higher in terms of its unacceptability. Um, now, this is a, an important issue here. What does the support that Ukrainians get from, you know, that there's a literature on external uh, partner patron support and the degree to which that changes attitudes um, so we asked, what's more important, that Ukraine seeks advanced weapons to defeat Russia or Ukraine seeks advanced weapons to force Russia to negotiate? Essentially, what we have in this question is a spectrum from victory to negotiation and the degree to which people understand that. And as you can see, the, uh, the vast majority of people, not the vast majority, but 60 percent plus, uh, see it as defeating Russia. That's the goal, defeating Russia uh, rather than forcing uh, Russia to negotiate. So that has all sorts of moral implications. Uh, and I will stop there and turn it over to Karina. You're muted, Karina.
Okay. Uh, good. There we go. So I will continue with uh, exploring more complexity in understanding how war impact Ukraine with specifics on identity and social boundary. As Gerald already told, our major task in this particular research was to go beyond simplistic questions of like at scale, yes or no, and present how people really think in terms of dilemmas which they experience and negotiate everyday losses and everyday uh, traumas with um, their strong support for their country. So uh, we wanted to answer also the question, does war really make population homogeneous? And we really saw this homogenization narrative that everyone now feels the same, everyone um, feels the same. So when we suppose ask people if they identify strongly with the Ukrainian nation, we, we saw overwhelming support for that. However, then we ask people if they identify as European. Again, remember we've done this research in Eastern Ukraine. You see various answers. While majority agree with it, still there are a group of population with disagree. Um, then we ask also a question about identification with Russian culture and language. And you see while there are, again, very strong agreement that people disagree with it, uh, still some people agree with their connection to Russian culture and Russian language. At the same time, if you remember this particular slide, they still um, uh, really um, can strong, strongly express the Ukrainian uh, identity as a national identity. Uh, finally, we actually were interested to see if Soviet identity is still there. Of course, you could not ask if people have a Soviet identity. So we ask questions about leaving, United, uh, leaving USSR and uh, monuments to Lenin. And we still see some remaining, of course, we check for age. Majority of these people are among the older population. You see also here, monument must be demolished. Uh, strongly disagree, still there are people who have this connection to the past, Soviet past. How, perception of the Russia, we measured three major variables. We measured social boundary, uh, we measured uh, uh, moral boundary and symbolic boundary. Difference between them, social boundary is basically boundary between uh, real groups established in uh, narratives uh, like nations. And while we see very strong uh, connection between the nation, what we see is that norms of differentiation are stronger than real perception of the difference. And when we ask about symbolic boundary, about the similarity of cultures and differences, we found pretty interesting distribution. A lot of people still feel connected to culture while feeling very strong difference from Russia as a country. The most interesting result was establishment of a new moral boundary, which is showing that belief, strong, strong belief and normative production of difference uh, based on morality, that Ukrainians feel they are more moral, the spiritual is stronger than uh, Russian population. And the second uh, very important point, which I want to stress, another one of our major research question and hypothesis was how war experience shape attitude toward peace and war. I don't have time to go in the literature review, but just to stress there are no consistency in the literature. How exposure, is, if exposure to violence do impact perception of peace and war, and some research shall know. And there are research which show yes, show completely different direction. So it was very important for us to see how exposure to war actually support, uh, creates the support. This slide you already saw, what I will stress on this slide, if we ask people to save, to wait a dilemma of saving lives or freeing territory, you see that IDPs, which is a stronger number, much more important for them is to save them. You see this very significant difference between IDPs and local population. If we look at the next slide, 
and we ask, is it imperative to seek this fire to stop Russia from killing uh, Ukrainian young men? Again, we see a very strong agreement among IDP. So IDP express stronger belief for seeking ceasefire and support for that. So when we run uh, the um, regression analysis, we found that actually different type of laws impact differently support for peace and war. And this might be the resolution for the puzzle already existing in the literature, which give very inconsistent results because it was just exposure to war, which was measured or to violence by living in the region. But when we specifically ask people about their loss of property, about the, uh, that they had to leave from, to other region, did they lose friend, coworker, neighbor, and loss of family member? We found that loss of property and being an IDP actually lead people to select in these dilemmas, we presented four dilemmas. They prefer prevent relocation, advanced negotiation, um, I, being an IDP uh, lead to pre preference to save life and prevent relocation, while laws of friend and coworker actually produce completely opposite effects. These people have a stronger tendency to support free territories, continue war, defeat Russia. Uh, for loss of the family, for the uh, loss of family member, we uh, did not get statistical results because we had fortunately only 18 people among our 1,800 1, respondents, but tendency there is a, not statistically significant, but tendency to support war. Why? And based on the literature, we identify several mediators, and based on this, we conducted the again uh, analysis, path analysis, and we found that it's actually stress which increase increase support for peace among. Uh, people who lost property and were relocated, while economic threat decrease uh, their support for this, but stress actually wins. Stress was the one of the strongest mediators, while for people who lost a friend or coworker, we see that threat to nation, but the most importantly hate was the strongest mediator for their support for the war. Nevertheless, we see that peace is a, uh, uh, priority for people after the war. They want to see Ukraine as a peaceful state. So we are actually ready to uh, produce recommendations based again on um, this war, uh, uh, again, given as a dilemma for people, if negotiation is there, what is more important for you? As you see that financial compensation much more important than formal apology. However, if we compare uh, reparation for war crimes and full cooperation with international tribunal investigation that we see that people really prefer cooperation and um, addressing human rights violation um, and uh, war crimes. And finally, then we compare territorial integrity of Ukraine and economic institutions, again, for people much more important, and Gerald already spoke about, this is where sacred value of territory really shine. And finally, we also ask how this peace negotiation can be processed and who can endorse them. So we run the um, experimental design within our survey where three randomly assigned groups were given no endorsement treatment. We just asked them, how do you support negotiation with Russia? Another group was told that it's, if Zelensky endorsed, would you support? And another one was asked, if endorsement by European Union and US leaders. And you see it messenger does matter. So if we uh, compare endorsement by Zelensky, no endorsement, Zelensky does increase support for uh, ceasefire if he will be endorsing it. However, if we speak about the leadership of European Union and US leadership, then uh, actually it's decrease because they really, as again, as a, a theory of normative production um, in group and out group uh, support, then we see that uh, European Union and US leadership is functioning as an out group in this particular support. 
Um, thank you, and we will uh, be ready to, of course, we have much more results, but we will be happy to answer your question. I'm blown away by the depth and impressiveness of this sociological research under very difficult conditions. So bravo to both of you. Um, I, I have a, a self-serving question. I want to use my moderator's prerogative to slip in. Um, how are you operationalizing the concept of hate? Because I, I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, Roger Peterson and his work, which has an influence on my work, defines hate fairly clinically and specifically, which is the belief that your enemy is defective, which means they can't be reasoned with, but also extremely threatening. Um, but I, you know, I, I can easily imagine that, um, you know, you guys have a different definition of hate or a different operationalization of hate. So I'd really like to know what that is, since it was so important to differentiating your outcome variable. And then so we, I have something yeah, else too, but let's do hate first. Yeah, yeah. So we actually measured eight different emotions. Cool. Uh, so we measured them by scale from one to ten. How much do you feel? We didn't give them definition, but how much do you feel hate? But again, f f hate exactly. Hate is usually complete uh, denial of uh, it's it's correlate strongly with moral boundary, complete denial of humanity and. Uh, also correlate very strongly with threats because we measured nine types of threats. Okay, so, Ex yeah. excellent. So, yeah. All right, no, this is asked and answered. That's completely fine. Um, question from <laughs> the audience before I hog the mic more um, from Alexandra Cudell. Uh, did you check for um, IDP interacted with loss of a, of a friend? Um, so the attitude towards freeing territories, was that a, a test? We, we did, yes. Yes, so it was a very, very, uh, yes, for us. First of all, we really have to tell you we had a huge issue and I really have to compliment our graduate assistant, uh, Mike Spigart, who was working with us. Uh, we had a huge issue with missing data. It's for people who work in uh, social psychological uh, surveys in war zones. Missing data is a major challenge. Yes. So thanks to our great consultant, we were able to find the most, the completely new approach of clusterization of this data. So we were able to bring, uh, it's, it took us several months, but we were able actually to find very, uh, modern, very, very current approach to the missing data, which helped us to also, we also had to check for all these interactions between different variables. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat box, so I'm just going to keep mm. going. Um, I love the experiment at the end. Uh, my in interpretation naively would be that your subject pool actually trusts Zelensky to strike a good deal uh, because he's a great war leader and he has Ukrainian interests at heart and Europeans and outsiders would be totally willing to sell out Ukraine in a heartbeat. How does that sound to you as a sweeping psychological claim about 1800 respondents? Yeah, we had the same discussion, right? It was not, not surprising for us at all. So we did ask uh, Jesse, um, about uh, the degree to which um, the great powers use Ukraine in their games. Uh, and you ask that, you ask that directly. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. And that's majority sentiment, believe that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, I mean, we've asked that question, uh, you, you know, myself, John Lachlan and, and uh, others, uh, Christian Bakke uh, in Moldova and in yeah, I was gonna say, you've You've asked that question for a decade. In, yeah. Yeah, in, so, on, 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 on this population, yeah. Yeah, so so in that sense, um, it is uh, in keeping with what we've seen elsewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an important uh, finding. I, and that yeah, experiment is, is quite uh, significant in its- uh, I concur. <laughs> it's, it's actually- That's a terribly another... important finding for conflict resolution. Yeah, it's actually was very interesting. Another experiment experiment with uh, Gerald, right? With uh, Stalin, with Putin. With Putin, with yeah. Two. Yeah. So what we did there is, and this is more has to do with memory. I, I could put it up. I actually, we haven't written it up. It's really 
quite remarkable. But we took a, a, a quote from uh, Putin's um, war speech, actually, about uh, uh, the sacredness of uh, the fight during World War II. And we asked people whether they agreed or disagreed with that, uh, just clean. And then we said, Putin said this, you know, and do you agree with her or disagree with it? And it's just remarkable the how toxic, once you put in Putin as the endorser, how sentiment is just uh, diametrically opposed. Um, so there is a flip side to the Zelensky endorsement, which is the Putin toxic yeah. uh, effect. It's not. It, yeah, I can see that, that, that they, they might even counterbalance. Who knows? Um, but it's both of those are still wonderful findings in terms of you know responsible sociology. I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to ask one more since I've got you guys here. Um, I was while while you were talking about um Gerald the 90 uh, the um uh, percentage of of respondents who chose to speak russian i was cueing in on the percentage of russian uh, of respondents that self identified as ukrainian i noticed that only 5% self identified as russian can you guys talk to me at all about like how the characteristics of that 5% are different um i i, I would be interested in in a non-finding there um, or as much as a finding, but I'm not sure if you even analyzed it that way, if they're such an outlier that they're not interesting. Like the no, anyone I mean, who's in your sample who is self-defining as ethnic Russian, how are they different from the 95% that are self-identifying as Ukrainian? We, it's a good question. We didn't go there yet. Okay. So we had so, I mean, you know what data is, which we good so extremely interesting because we're also looking into threats right we're also a lot of threats different types we're looking into the normative production of the boundary and normative production of threat how norm function and there is another experiment which actually shows that norms are more important than attitudes so it's really an un unbelievable amount of data we're just digging into it and all your questions and suggestions are so welcome Oh, no, I, look, I, you, there's clearly multiple papers, uh, probably a whole book that could be written with this data. I only ask because Dominique Arell and I have queued in in the last couple of years on your ability to, if you're a Russian speaker, essentially adopt the identity of being Russian as a political statement. Um, uh, and mm -hmm. that would be, uh, you know, that would have been my working hypothesis before February 24th, 2022, but there's something quite different in your sample than in our traditional understanding informed by previous time. So it's just a, it was just an information seeking question. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot if you didn't know. It. It's so yeah, cool what you guys are doing. I think it's I, a dynamic <laughs> and dynamics of identity. We clearly see uh, this, uh, uh, and when we ask three types of, we didn't only ask the salience of Ukrainian identity, but only we gave them three options ethnic, multicultural, civic, and everyone, like much majority of people selected civic means. Everyone says so civic, citizenship, yeah. yes, rather than ethnicity or people avoiding using ethnicity and language as a marker because it's, of course, demonized in the whole process of war. And it's always a little bit weird to ask about a sub minority of the sample anyway, it leads to misleading generalizations that are probably not useful. But with that, thank you very much both of you for taking the time. Um, I think now uh, I want to take one more plug if you're out there uh, to please donate to the Kiev School of Economics. And with that, uh, I it is time for me to pass the mic to the next moderator, who is, of course, Dr. Gerald Toll. So okay. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Take it away. Um, for for moderating and taking it um, uh, forward. Um, I, I just want to say one last thing, and that is in the spirit of what Jesse said earlier today, I mean, uh, that research is made possible by the hard work of the people who are working for uh, uh, Keys. And so we are very, very grateful to them. This is a research that uh, is. Uh, um, is very much dependent upon uh, what they have done uh, for us and their ability to uh, to do this research under extremely difficult conditions. Um, okay, so we Thank are. Uh, yeah. And we just started the interviews, so more, more attractions are coming. Oh, 
Great. Okay, so we are moving along. So uh, our next uh, speaker is Uliana uh, Movchan, who is from uh, the Karazin uh, Kharkiv National University. Hi, Uliana. Uh, and uh, the title of her presentation is Ukraine's Institutional Rebuilding. So uh, half an hour, however you want to uh, divide it up, uh, Uliana. Mm. Thank you, Gerard, uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to talk uh, today uh, here. Uh, so, as uh, Gerard uh, mentioned, my topic about uh, <clears throat> institutional rebuilding, uh, like in Ukraine. And um, firstly, I would like to point out, uh, like, why it's uh, important to talk about the institutional reform in Ukraine. So. Firstly, the democratic regime is the prerequisite to become a member of the European Union. So uh, another one is uh, international aid that uh, would be granted to Ukraine for rebuilding and uh, for implementation of reform. And this international aid uh, could be redistributed through informal lines because of the specific of political regime in Ukraine. So we I uh, need to avoid that. Uh, and uh, also it's important to think uh, like how to reintegrate uh, the Ukrainian territories uh, that have been occupied since uh, 2014. Uh, so when we are talking about a political system in Ukraine since independence, so we can see that uh, some um, like political uh, system uh, underwent some changes, uh, but uh, there are no like some um, effective combination of institution and which uh, could contribute to democrat democratic consolidation in Ukraine. And uh, then we are talking about the political regime in Ukraine. It uh, can be defined as a now patrimonial democracy uh, in which rent seeking continues to be a key engine of political competition. And uh, in Ukraine, uh, now patrimonialism created a weak state, which uh, captured by clans, uh, and the regime change always goes uh, not through some electoral procedures, uh, but through the Maidan and the struggle of uh, political networks. And uh, during the Maidan, there will a weakening as we are talking about the Maidan 2004 or collapse, if we are talking about Euro Maidan 2013 uh, central authority and, um, and there were some autonomy of regional networks. And uh, also it was uh, Ukrainian elite themselves, uh, which like in order to mobilize voters, uh, increased the polarization within Ukrainian society and uh, it uh, divided the electorate according to us against them pattern, and uh, it did not allow creating cross-cutting or overlapping interests and identities. And uh, ethnicity as uh, an invention of politicians who play on the fear of their communities to secure their political support. So we can call this tactic weaponizing ethnicity. And uh, such political rhetoric uh, can poison relations between people of different communities. And uh, uh, also uh, this um, exclude national unity, actually, that uh, also this uh, national uh, building and national consolidation is also one of the prerequisites of uh, democracy consolidation. Uh, so in the Ukrainian context, this uh, us against uh, them pattern uh, corresponds to the Maidan against the anti-Maidan pattern. And uh, Maidan cleavage uh, is characterized by the intention to be a member of NATO and uh, the European Union, uh, so broadly supporting Ukrainian language and culture. And if we are talking about anti-Maidan cleavage, uh, so it's uh, like distinguished uh, by the desire to have political, economic and uh, cultural union with Russia and putting forward the Russian language as the second official language in Ukraine and they also autonomy of southeast region and the regional clans uh, used the uh, Maidan and anti-Maidan cleavages to mobilize their voters and uh, therefore they equalized uh, Ukrainian society 
And um, all the time, also in Ukraine, we saw a situation in which uh, there was a balance of the main political segments uh, or some slight predominance, one of them. So, and uh, just like parliamentary election, uh, the last one in uh, uh, 2019 uh, is an exception. So there were some several main political segments, and none of which was a different majority or different, different minority. And the national political players, uh, they uh, under this balance of power, they were unable to create stable coalition in parliament, and uh, they just implement uh, the principle of classic uh, democracies government versus opposition. So it's also not possible because there is no like stable majority as well. But uh, like uh, if we are talking about uh, classical like majoritarian democracy, like British one, so there is some rotation of majority and minority in government. And uh, in Ukraine, then was just like some balance of political segments. Uh, their government on such a basis uh, actually loses the possibility of uh, effective functioning. And besides, uh, the principle winner-take-all cannot work because of the existence of plurality of oligarchy groups and uh, where victory like was impossible. Uh, so, uh, like, um, to conclude about the whole regime in Ukraine, uh, this uh, neopatrimonial regime could function in two different phases. So first one is uh, authoritarian bureaucratic. Uh, it's like uh, in such kind of uh, phase, uh, like president controls the majority in the assembly and the prime minister is uh, from his or her party. So they just, uh, which means uh, they have this potential to monopolize the power and uh, the fiscal vertical. Yeah, and uh, the second phase is competitive democratic. Uh, so this is the division of pattern client networks between two centers. Uh, uh, so like uh, president and uh, prime minister. Mm, and uh, this uh, also phase characterized the weakness of presidential party resources. Uh, and uh, prime ministers uh, like who co-opted from non-presidential party holding or some uh, maybe alternative pattern client networks. Uh, so um, I consider these residents of Kuchma and Yanukovych as an example of uh, authoritarian bureaucratic phase, and Yushchenko and Poroshenko as an example of competitive democratic phase. And uh, like anti this like now patrimonialism. Uh, those who like don't enter or don't show loyalty you know, to this like main uh, power vertical are excluded from their networks and from their like access to the power as well. And uh, like uh, even in this uh, competitive uh, like uh, uh, democratic phase, uh, even there is some competition yes between two different pattern client networks. Uh, in, it's also it's the same like fight with winner take all principle. So we need to think about some inclusive policy making option. And actually, this option offered by power sharing model of democracy. And um, because such model creates institutional conditions that ensure compromises. Uh, that's why I examine uh, power sharing institution, which optimal to Ukraine. So um, I proceed from the position that the crucial feature of power sharing democracy is the inclusion of communities. And actually this like uh, inclusion uh, started broadly promoted after World Development Report in 2011 and uh, the New Deal of Engagement in Fragile States uh, also in the same year, 2011. So inclusion uh, is uh, considered in two different aspects. One is uh, horizontal inclusiveness. Uh, this is between elites. Uh, so this like uh, participation of key stakeholders uh, who can implement reforms and uh, who represent like some significant constituencies. 
Another one is vertical inclusiveness. Uh, this is the state society relationship. Uh, so here, like some large segments of population have access uh, and influence on decision making. Uh, so and with some particular emphasizes uh, on the like formally uh, social, like societal uh, sector that has uh, before limited uh, access uh, to power. So when we are talking about uh, vertical inclusiveness, uh, the decentralization can be attributed to that aspect, and uh, the decentralization reform is being carried out in Ukraine nowadays, uh, and it uh, this uh, uh, vertical like inclusiveness quite well, uh, but uh, the reform itself experienced some problem and some limitation actually because of the uh, this uh, type of uh, regime uh, that is in Ukraine, like neo patrimonial one. Uh, so why like in uh, neo patrimonial states uh, there is this uh, clientelism and patronage dominate. Uh, many new reform just built uh, into this uh, logic of informal relations. And uh, reform of decentralization is no exception. Uh, it can take place in favor of national neopatrimonialism. Uh, so state uh, like um, does not develop uh, the country as a whole and uh, just source the narrow interest of the elite. And the subnational government just end up falling into the same trap of local elite capture. And uh, power capture occurs to then elite controls, shape or manipulate dishes, decision making. And institutions uh, so just ends in personal gains, uh, like uh, at the expense of non-elites or local communities. And the decentralization creates new opportunities, like position and resources for patronage, uh, so with help, uh, like this helps ruling elites and um, just reward who was uh, loyal to them uh, or uh, like on local basis uh, through the like across the country. Uh, so many countries on the way to democratization carried out this type of decentralization reform uh, because the main idea, like just power transition from center to low level of government, uh, like to uh, just increase the fiscal capacity of local government. Uh, but uh, in uh, some like this uh, neo-patrimonial uh, re regime, uh, this uh, like uh, decentralization reform, uh, even if the main goal is uh, democratic consolidation, it's just um, like uh, simply made these like, local politician, politicians as political brokers uh, who were just mobilizing a network of local workers in exchange for financial payment and the uh, patronage position. Uh, so um, that's why like uh, the reason why decentralization may lead to state capture you know, by local elites lies in the specific future of local governments. And uh, it's because few checks and balances, uh, like less pluralistic local authorities, and few different media at the local level. Uh, so um, in this case, patronage is becoming a state future of government. Uh, so as uh, like uh, for Ukraine, it's also we see the same sides. Uh, actually, like the topic of decentralization uh, in Ukraine uh, has arisen since the proclamation of independence. Uh, but in the end, uh, with the adoption of Constitution of Ukraine and the uh, law of, um, uh, of, on local self-government, uh, everything came down to centralization of power. And uh, these laws made a foundation that uh, there are real problems at both the basic and the secondary level of uh, self-government. So at the basic level, and um, first of all, uh, there were the lack of adequate resources for local self-government, like financial and material base, and some uncertainty of the territorial basis of local self-government. And as well, uh, this level, 
like on the secondary level, there were no executive bodies of uh, um, like regional and uh, district uh, uh, like local government uh, lo local governments. Uh, so uh, in fact, uh, it was some uh, kind of uh, dual system. Uh, there were like uh, centrally appointment uh, heads of state administration, uh, which actually forms the composition, uh, composition of this state administration and local authorities elect, like, elected by the communities. And uh, this all led to difficulties in the separation of power between the executive and local government. And in practice, uh, local councils uh, had little power. And uh, due to the lack of local budgets, uh, they bargained with district administration and delegating part of their power to them. So, uh, because later, like this um, district administration, they were financed from the state budget and uh, had uh, the possibility of performing this function. And uh, this situation only strengthened centralization which in turn like help to facilitate access to resources, especially like the state budget. And, of, uh, and also like uh, to add to that, uh, president uh, informally charge uh, them with mobilizing the population in election and the official who, don't, uh, who did not win uh, some sufficient uh, voters on local level, they just uh, let go. So uh, they're like a future of Ukrainian model of local government organization um, is that like local executive bodies uh, created and uh, operated uh, not for a purpose of performing control, yes, and supervising some function. This like regarding the legality of local self-government activities, but uh, just assume the main scope of power, like to imagine relevant territory. And uh, public power in this level um, is realized uh, like not through a system of political and economic dual power. So the, it was just centrally appointed half of state administration and local authorities selected by communities. And uh, these difficulties in distinguishing the power like, between this body just strengthened the now patrimonial relationship and uh, informal dependence of local governments from the center. But uh, like reform of the civilization, what we have now weakening actually this vertical of president uh, because um, like some fiscal and institutional independence of local community uh, from exist before this regional and district administration Actually, it, this uh, also increased some local government's capacity and sustainability. Uh, nevertheless, we uh, see some limits of decentralization reform, uh, which become visible after local election in 2020. So first one is the problem with the reform is uh, it's like uh, not determine actually the limits of terms of heads uh, of the local councils uh, and uh, it allows them to strengthen their positions and create all the conditions for being re-elected. And the formation of uh, these amalgamated territorial communities also did not bring changes to the composition of local authorities and actually heads began to be re-elected using patronage. And another shortcoming is that no opposition within the local government on the community level and majority inside the local councils is all the same political forces as the head of councils. And another shortcoming is when like after the reform, the executive is appointment uh, uh, by the local government. Um, so in the result, like two branches of power belong to one political party. And uh, the uh, patrimonial nature of power contributes to turning like local communities uh, actually into some fiefdoms. And uh, such uh, an independence of local regimes, uh, as I mentioned before, weakening this uh, patrimonial vertical. And that's why Zelensky just trying to restore control 
of a local elite. Uh, so last conflict with mayor of Ukraine, like this city, like we can mention like cases from Dnipro or Chernigiv, uh, actually show how a president, like using uh, the administrative influence, attempt to centralize power. And that's why like decentralization uh, from the one side has become an obstacle to being to building the single vertical of power like headed by president. But from this on, another side, there is some risk of uh, local elite capture that actually uh, remains. And uh, like some important improvements to this uh, decentralization reform I imply from this like last uh, phase of the reform that was disrupted because of war. This was uh, introduction of principle of uh, subsidiarity. And also the reform uh, presupposes the introduction of post of prefect, who is actually appointed and, uh, and dismissed by the president. And um, prefect power uh, like will include the right to contrasign documents uh, that the local uh, government will make. And uh, also uh, this uh, post of bracket uh, could actually uh, some have uh, like different consequences of political system, uh, but uh, actually it uh, could uh, help like uh, to uh, contrabalance and don't create a local like elite cartel on local basis. And um, but uh, actually, it's really need to mention, like, uh, to avoid all this, uh, uh, what, ha what might happen on local level, it would be, like, uh, accountability of local governments held by different civic organization. And actually, uh, it would be helpful to prevent the creation of, uh, like, uh, and to prevent uh, this uh, local elite capture. As about horizontal inclusion, inclusiveness, it's uh, all about power sharing coalitions. Uh, so power sharing is uh, some vital part of uh, power sharing democracy, and it can be described as accommodation and the compromises between elite. Uh, so and uh, power sharing mechanism guarantee that uh, like uh, all significant segments have at least minimal representation in the government. And uh, in case of Ukraine, it can be analog in the context of neopatrimonialism. So when the cost of patronage, like uh, or even being excluded, is much higher than entering coalition, so elite uh, could agree like uh, to have this uh, big portion coalition. And uh, also we need to think about new political forces uh, that uh, may arise from military and the civic sector uh, so we could imagine what kind of anticipate fighting for power yes could be as this winner take all principle remains in ukraine politics so that's why uh, like such power sharing coalition looks promising as everyone could get share share in power but uh, actually also there is some like uh, uh, in context of uh, neo-patrimonial regime, uh, this uh, creation of elite uh, cartel uh, like uh, remain, and uh, I like this uh, method uh, that and uh, experience of Northern, uh, Northern Ireland. There is some like don't methods uh, is used to appoint executive, and uh, don't methods uh, is the method that the redistribution of seats. In executive takes place according like to how many seats the party got in parliament and not uh, according to identity yes and actually this uh, uh, also uh, uh, appropriate to some formalization of rule because uh, one of the principles of neopatrimonialism is like that uh, the informal institutes uh, institution dominate uh, or the, the formal one and uh, to create this like a big oversight coalition helps to uh, like uh, to exclude the uh, creation of some elite cartel and also it uh, brings some competition because uh, everyone just compete on proportional uh, basis uh, and uh, i think uh, like uh, to conclude that uh, these power sharing coalitions actually soon like looks like optimal institutions of power sharing democracy and the decentralization reform 
just with strong civic society also could provide a contability and the audit of local governments. And also I see as a promising way uh, to democracy in Ukraine. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Liana. Um, we have uh, just a limited amount of time, four minutes, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we have two questions and the topic you're addressing is is really, really huge. Uh, so the first question here is from uh, Ben de uh, Dominicus. How might the experience of nationalist mobilization for war and self-defense affect the prevailing attitude and behaviors in terms of a Liberian ideal of the rule of law state? Uh, can it accentuate the transformation away from patrimonial habitual attitudes? You, you do seem to be quite pessimistic on that front, uh, that these are deeply embedded in the... Uh, so yeah, did yeah. mention, uh, yes, th this is a massive transformational event. And the, the, the uh, military and the logistical, the infrastructure to support the war effort is a new force and will presumably endure. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about how that is likely to change? Actually, I mean, um, is this, um, we observe like uh, now, yes, the regime in Ukraine, I mean, in terms of uh, formality and uh, informality, actually, uh, I recently read some article uh, about uh, this, uh, like now patrimonial regimes, like in other country, and uh, it, like in terms of war, and uh, sometimes then the like state institution actually failed. This informal politics, yes, uh, could help, you know, just uh, for some resilient and uh, actually force fight. So uh, I mean, and. Uh, as we see now, uh, the like nature of regime in Ukraine has not changed much. Yes, uh, and uh, it's actually difficult. I mean, you know, just uh, I mean, avoid this uh, not not creation of a quiet network. So uh, only what we can do, uh, and there's like evolution evolution process, is just try to formalize this um, informal relationship. And I see that like uh, using this uh, power sharing coalition could help uh, to formalize these relations. I mean, what, uh, as uh, I mentioned uh, also in my speech that uh, um, about these uh, dividing lines, yes, inside Ukraine. I mean, uh, we all uh, say about like Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking population, like uh, NATO against uh, uh, to be with, uh, in, with Russian Union. So it was some kind of uh, manipulation, yes, by Ukrainian elite of uh, like Ukrainians as well. And that's why they see, um, I mean, then uh, elite just uh, does not manipulate that. Uh, so we see how like uh, unity inside Ukrainians, yes. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, neopatrimonial nature in Ukraine uh, still remain. And uh, also, uh, I mean, this uh, power sharing uh, model of democracy uh, actually were brought uh, from this literature of this building from divided society, I mean, uh, how like uh, this uh, significant segment uh, bring together. But in Ukrainian context, uh, then there are like different autonomy of regional clans, uh, different pattern client networks. Uh, so actually this uh, um, model of democracy also could be helpful. I mean, because the, our goal like is uh, democratic consolidation. And uh, I mean, I see that by, by that model, we could bring that to Ukraine. Okay, all right. Um, uh, let's leave it uh, there because we have to move on. I wanna thank okay. uh, you, uh, Uliana, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Thanks to thank also uh, on the chat, Alexandra Gudel for providing a comprehensive uh, other answer to Ben's question. Um, the case of Northern Ireland, uh, you know, which is in the literature and conflict resolution, the power executive hasn't met there for a long time, so it's, it's sort of broken down. There, it is a model of power sharing. Yeah. Uh, you know, Lebanon is a model of power sharing too. And there, I think there are 
but positive as well as negative, there's also negative lessons to be learned, I think, uh, mm -hmm. from those two particular cases. Okay, so we're moving on. Uh, thank you. Um, but thank you. Um, 